Chapter Seventeen of Sir Nigel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Clive Catterall. Sir Nigel, by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Chapter Seventeen, The Spaniards on the Sea. Day had not yet dawned when Nigel was in the chamber of Chandos, preparing him for his departure, and listening to the last cheery words of advice and direction from his noble master. That same morning, before the sun was halfway up the heaven, the king's great nephew Philippa, bearing within it the most of those present at his banquet the night before, set its huge sail, adorned with the lions and the lilies, and turned its brazen beak for England. Behind it went five smaller cogs, crammed with squires, archers, and men-at-arms. Nigel and his companions lined the ramparts of the castle, and waved their caps as the bluff, burly vessels, with drums beating and trumpets clanging, a hundred knightly pennons streaming from their decks, and the red cross of England over all, rolled slowly out to the open sea. Then, when they had watched them until they were hull down, they turned, with hearts heavy at being left behind, to make ready for their own more distant venture. It took them four days of hard work ere their preparations were complete, for many were the needs of a small force sailing to a strange country. Three ships had been left to them, the cog Thomas of Romney, the Grasse Dieu of Hythe, and the Basilisk of Southampton, into each of which one hundred men were stowed, besides the thirty seamen who formed the crew. In the hold were forty horses, amongst them Pommers, much wearied by his long idleness, and homesick for the slopes of Surrey, where his great limbs might find the work he craved. Then the food and the water, the bow-staves and the sheaves of arrows, the horseshoes, the nails, the hammers, the knives, the axes, the ropes, the vats of hay, the green fodder, and a score of other things were packed aboard. Always by the side of the ships stood the stern young knight Sir Robert, checking, testing, watching and controlling, saying little, for he was a man of few words, but with his eyes, his hands, and if need be his heavy dog-whip, wherever they were wanted. The seamen of the basilisk, being from a free port, had the old feud against the men of the sink-ports, who were looked upon by the other mariners of England as being unduly favoured by the king. A ship of the west country could scarce meet with one from the narrow seas without blood flowing. Hence sprang sudden broils on the quayside, when, with yell and blow, the Thomases and Grasdieus, St. Leonard on their lips and murder in their hearts, would fall upon the basilisks. Then, amid the whirl of cudgels and the clash of knives, would spring the tiger figure of the young leader, lashing mercilessly to right and left, like a tamer among his wolves, until he had beaten them, howling back to their work. Upon the morning of the fourth day all was ready, and the ropes being cast off, the three little ships were warped down the harbour by their own pinnaces, until they were swallowed up in the swirling folds of a channel mist. Though small in numbers, it was no mean force which Edward had dispatched to succour the hard-pressed English garrisons in Brittany. There was scarce a man among them who was not an old soldier, and their leaders were men of note in council and in war. Knolls flew his flag of the Black Raven aboard the Basilisk. With him were Nigel and his own squire John Hawthorne. Of his hundred men, forty were Yorkshire Dalesmen, and forty were men of Lincoln, all noted archers, with old Watt of Carlisle, a grizzled veteran of border warfare, to lead them. Already Aylward, by his skill and strength, had won his way to an under-officership among them, and shared with Long Ned Whittington, a huge North Countryman, the reputation of coming next to famous Watt Carlisle in all that makes an archer. The men-at-arms, too, were war-hardened soldiers, with Black Simon of Norwich, the same who had sailed from Winchelsea, to lead them. With his heart filled with hatred for the French, who had slain all who were dear to him, he followed like a bloodhound over land and sea, to any spot where he might glut his vengeance. Such also were the men who sailed in the other ships, Cheshire men from the Welsh borders in the Cog Thomas, and Cumberland men, used to Scottish warfare in the Grasse Dieu. Sir James Astley, hung his shield of cinquefoil ermine over the quarter of the Thomas. Lord Thomas Percy, a cadet of Alnwick, famous already for the high spirit of that house, 
which for ages was the bar upon the landward gate of England, showed his blue lion rampant as leader of the Grasse Dieu. Such was the goodly company, St. Marlowe bound, who warped from Calais Harbour to plunge into the thick reek of a channel mist. A slight breeze blew from the eastward, and the high-ended, round-bodied craft rolled slowly down the channel. The mist rose a little at times, so that they had sight of each other dipping and rising upon a sleek, oily sea, but again it would sink down, settling over the top, shrouding the great yard, and finally frothing over the deck, until even the water alongside had vanished from their view, and they were afloat on a little raft in an ocean of vapour. A thin, cold rain was falling, and the archers were crowded under the shelter of the overhanging poop and forecastle, where some spent the hours at dice, some in sleep, and many in trimming their arrows or polishing their weapons. At the farther end, seated on a barrel at a throne of honour, with trays and boxes of feathers around him, was Bartholomew the Bowyer and Fletcher, a fat, bald-headed man, whose task it was to see that every man's tackle was as it should be, and who had the privilege of selling such extras as they might need. A group of archers, with their staves and quivers, filed before him with complaints or requests, while half a dozen of the seniors gathered at his back, and listened with grinning faces to his comments and rebukes. "'Canst not string it?' he was saying to a young bowman. "'Then surely the string is over short, or the stave over long. "'It could not by chance be the fault of thine own baby arms, "'more fit to draw on thy hosen than dress a war-bow. "'Thou lazy lurton, thus is it strung!' He seized the stave by the centre in his right hand, leaned the end on the inside of his right foot, and then, pulling the upper knock down with his left hand, slid the eye of the string easily into place. Now, I pray thee to unstring it again, handing it to the bowman. The youth, with an effort, did so, but he was too slow in disengaging his fingers, and the string, sliding down with a snap from the upper knock, caught and pinched them sorely against the stave. A roar of laughter, like the clap of a wave, swept down the deck as the luckless bowman danced and wrung his hand. "'Serve thee well right, thou reedless fool!' growled the old bowyer. "'So fine a bow is wasted in such hands. "'How now, Samkin? I can teach you little of your trade, I trow. "'Here is a bow dressed as it should be, but it would, as you say, be the better for a white band to mark the true knocking-point in the centre of this red wrapping of silk. "'Leave it.' and I will tend to it anon. And you what? A fresh head on yonder steel? Lord, that a man should carry four trades under one hat, and be bowyer, fletcher, stringer, and headmaker. Four men's work for old Bartholomew, and one man's pay. Nay, say no more about that, growled an old wizened bowman, with a brown parchment skin and little beady eyes. It is better in these days to mend a bow than to bend one. You, who never looked a Frenchman in the face, are pricked off for ninepence a day, and I, who have fought five stricken fields, can earn but fourpence. It is in my mind, John of Tuxford, that you have looked in the face of more pots of mead than Frenchmen, said the old bowyer. I am swinking from dawn to night, while you are guzzling in an ale steak. Uh, how now, youngster? Overbowed. Put your bow in the tiller. It draws at sixty pounds. Not a pennyweight too much for a man of your inches. Lay more body to it, lad, and it will come to you. If your bow be not stiff, how can he hope for a twenty-score flight? Feathers? Aye. Plenty and of the best. Here. Peacock at a groat each. Surely a dandy archer like you, Tom Beverley, with gold earrings in your ears, would have no feather but peacocks. So the shaft fly straight, I care not of the feather, said the bowman a tall young Yorkshireman, counting out pennies on the palm of his horny hand. Grey goose feathers are but a farthing. These on the left are a half penny, for they are of the wild goose, and the second feather of a fenny goose is worth more than the pinion of a tame one. These in the brass tray are dropped feathers, and a dropped feather is better than a plucked one. Buy a score of these, lad, and cut them saddle-backed or swine-backed, the one for a dead shaft and the other for a smooth flyer and no man in the company will swing a better fletched quiver over his shoulder. It chanced that the opinion of the bowyer on this and other points differed from that of Long Ned of Whittington, a surly straw-bearded Yorkshireman, who had listened with a sneering face to this counsel. Now he broke in suddenly upon the bowyer's talk. "'You would do better to sell bows and to try to teach others how to use them,' he said. "'For indeed, Bartholomew, that head of thine has no more sense within it than it has hairs without.' 
"'If you had drawn string for as many months as I have years, "'you would know that a straight-cut feather flies smoother than a swine-backed, "'and pity it is that these young bowmen have none to teach them better.' "'This attack upon his professional knowledge touched the old bowyer on the raw. "'His fat face became suffused with blood, "'and his eyes glared with fury as he turned upon the archer. "'You seven-foot barrel of lies!' he cried. "'All hallows be my aid, and I will teach you to open your slabbing mouth against me.' "'Pluck forth your sword and stand out on yonder deck, "'that we may see who is the man of us twain. "'May I never twirl a shaft over my thumbnail "'if I do not put Bartholomew's mark upon your thick head.' "'A score of rough voices joined at once in the quarrel, "'some upholding the bowyer, "'and others taking the part of the north countryman. "'A red-headed dalesman snatched up a sword, "'but was felled by a blow from the fist of his neighbour. "'Instantly, with a buzz like a swarm of angry hornets, "'the bowmen were on the deck, but ere a blow was struck, Knowles was amongst them, with granite face and eyes of fire. "'Stand apart, I say. I will warrant you enough fighting to cool your blood ere you see England once more. Loring, Hawthorne, cut any man down who raises his hand. "'Have you what to say, you fox-haired rascal?' He thrust his face within two inches of that of the red man who had first seized his sword. The fellow shrank back, cowed from the fierce eyes. "'Now stint your noise, all of you, and stretch your long ears. Trumpeter, Blow once more. A bugle call had been sounded every quarter of an hour so as to keep in touch with the other two vessels who were invisible in the fog. Now the high, clear note rang out once more, the call of a fierce sea creature to its mates, but no answer came back from the thick wall which pent them in. Again and again they called, and again and again, with bated breath, they waited for an answer. Where is the shipman? asked Knowles. "'What is your name, fellow? Do you dare call yourself Master Mariner?' "'My name is Nat Dennis, fair sir,' said the grey-bearded old seaman. "'It is thirty years since first I showed my cartel and blue trumpet for a crew at the water-gate of Southampton. "'If any man may call himself Master Mariner, it is surely I. "'Where are our two ships?' "'Nay, sir, who can say in this fog? "'Fellow, it was your place to hold them together. "'I have but the eyes God gave me, fair sir, and they cannot see through a cloud.' Had it been fair, I, who am a soldier, could have kept them in company. Since it was foul, we look to you, who are called a mariner, to do so. You have not done it. You have lost two of my ships ere the venture is begun. Nay, fair sir, I pray you to consider— Enough words, said Knowles sternly. Words will not give me back my two hundred men. Unless I find them before I come to St. Marlo, I swear by St. Wilfred of Ripon that it will be an evil day for you. Enough. Go forth and do what you may. For five hours, with a light breeze behind them, they lurched through the heavy fog, the cold rain still matting their beards and shining on their faces. Sometimes they could see a circle of tossing water for a bowshot or so in each direction, and then the wreaths would crawl in upon them once more and bank them thickly round. They had long ceased to blow the trumpet for their missing comrades, but had hopes, when clear weather came, to find them still in sight. By the shipman's reckoning, they were now about midway between the two shores. Nigel was leaning against the bulwarks, his thoughts away in the dingle at Cosford and out on the heather-clad slopes of Hindhead, when something struck his ear. It was a thin, clear clang of metal, peeling out high above the dull murmur of the sea, the creak of the boom and the flap of the sail. He listened, and again it was borne to his ear. Hark, my lord, he said to Sir Robert, is there not a sound in the fog? They both listened together with sidelong heads. Then it rang clearly forth once more, but this time in another direction. It had been on the bow. Now it was on the quarter. Again it sounded, and again. Now it had moved to the other bow. Now back to the quarter again. Now it was near, and now so far that it was but a faint tinkle on the ear. By this time, every man on board, seamen, archers, and men-at-arms, were crowding the sides of the vessel. All round them there were noises in the darkness, and yet the wall of fog lay wet against their very faces. And the noises were such as were strange to their ears, always the same high musical clashing. The old shipman shook his head and crossed himself. "'In thirty years upon the waters I have never heard the like,' said he. "'The devil is ever loose in the fog.' Well is he named the Prince of Darkness. A wave of panic passed over the vessel, 
and these rough and hardy men, who feared no mortal foe, shook with terror at the shadows of their own minds. They stared into the cloud with blanched faces and fixed eyes, as though each instant some fearsome shape might break in upon them. And as they stared, there came a gust of wind. For a moment the fog-bank rose, and a circle of ocean lay before them. It was covered with vessels. On all sides they lay thick upon its surface. They were huge carracks, high-ended and portly, with red sides and bulwarks carved and crusted with gold. Each had one great sail set, and was driving down channel on the same course as the basilisk. Their decks were thick with men, and from their high poops came the weird clashing which filled the air. For one moment they lay there, this wondrous fleet surging slowly forward, framed in grey vapour. The next the clouds closed in, and they had vanished from view. There was a long hush, and then a buzz of excited voices. "'The Spaniards!' cried a dozen bowmen and sailors. "'I should have known it,' said the shipman. "'I call to mind on the Biscay coast how they clash their cymbals "'after the fashion of the heathen moor with whom they fight. "'But what would you have me do, fair sir? "'If the fog rises, we are all dead men.' "'There were thirty ships at the least,' said Knowles, with a moody brow. "'If we have seen them, I trow that they have also seen us. "'They will lay us aboard.' Nay, fair sir, it is in my mind that our ship is lighter and faster than theirs. If the fog hold another hour, we should be through them. Stand to your arms, yelled Knowles. Stand to your arms. They are on us. The basilisk had indeed been spied from the Spanish admiral's ship before the fog closed down. With so light a breeze and such a fog, he could not hope to find her under sail. But by an evil chance, not a bowshot from the great Spanish carrack, was a low galley thin and swift, with oars which could speed her against wind or tide. She also had seen the basilisk, and it was to her that the Spanish leader shouted his orders. For a few minutes she hunted through the fog, and then sprang out of it like a lean, stealthy beast upon its prey. It was the sight of the long, dark shadow gliding after them which had brought that wild shout of alarm from the lips of the English knight. In another instant the starboard oars of the galley had been shipped, the sides of the two vessels grated together, and a stream of swarthy red-capped Spaniards were swarming up the sides of the basilisk and dropped with yells of triumph upon her deck. For a moment it seemed as if the vessel was captured without a blow being struck, for the men of the English ship had run wildly in all directions to look for their arms. Scores of archers might be seen under the shadow of the forecastle and the poop, bending their bowstaves to string them with the cords from their waterproof cases. Others were scrambling over saddles and barrels and cases in wild search of their quivers. Each, as he came upon his arrows, pulled out a few to lend to his less fortunate comrades. In mad haste the men-at-arms also were feeling and grasping in the dark corners, picking up steel caps which would not fit them, hurling them down on the deck, and snatching eagerly at any swords or spears that came their way. The centre of the ship was held by the Spaniards, and having slain all who stood before them, they were pressing up to either end, before they were made to understand that it was no fat sheep, but a most fierce old wolf which they had taken by the ears. If the lesson was late, it was the more thorough. Attacked on both sides and hopelessly outnumbered, the Spaniards, who had never doubted that this little craft was a merchant ship, were cut off to the last man. It was no fight, but a butchery. In vain the survivors ran screaming prayers to the saints, and threw themselves down into the galley alongside. It also had been riddled with arrows from the poop of the basilisk and both the crew on the deck and the galley slaves in the outriggers at either side lay dead in rows under the overwhelming shower from above. From stem to rudder every foot of her was furrowed with arrows. It was but a floating coffin, piled with dead and dying men, which wallowed in the waves behind them as the basilisk lurched onward and left her in the fog. In their first rush onto the basilisk the Spaniards had seized six of the crew and four unarmed archers. Their throats had been cut and their bodies tossed overboard. Now the Spaniards, who littered the deck, wounded and dead, were thrust over the side in the same fashion. One ran down into the hold and had to be hunted and killed, squealing under the blows like a rat in the darkness. Within half an hour no sign was left of this grim meeting in the fog, save for the crimson splashes upon bulwark and decks. The archers, flushed and merry, were unstringing their bows once more for in spite of the water-glue the damp air took the strength from the cords. 
Some were hunting about for arrows which might have stuck in board, and some tying up small injuries received in a scuffle. But an anxious shadow still lingered upon the face of Sir Robert, and he peered fixedly about him through the fog. "'Go among the archers, Hawthorne,' he said to his squire. "'Charge them on their lives to make no sound. "'You also, Loring, go to the afterguard and say the same to them. "'We are lost if one of these great ships should spy us.' For an hour, with bated breath, they stole through the fleet, still hearing the cymbals clashing all round them, for in this way the Spaniards held themselves together. Once the wild music came from above their very prow, and so warned them to change their course. Once also a huge vessel loomed from an instant upon their quarter, but they turned two points away from her, and she blurred and vanished. Soon the cymbals were but a distant tinkling, and at last they died gradually away. "'It is none too soon,' said the old shipman, pointing to a yellowish tint in the haze above them. "'See yonder, it is the sun which wins through. It will be here anon. Ah, said I not so?' A sickly sun, no larger and far dimmer than the moon, had indeed shown its face, with cloud-wreaths smoking across it. As they looked up, it waxed larger and brighter before their eyes. A yellow halo spread around it. One ray broke through, and then a funnel of gold light poured down upon them, widening swiftly at the base. A minute later they were sailing on a clear blue sea, with an azure cloud-flecked sky above their heads, and such a scene beneath it as each of them would carry in his memory, while memory remained. They were in mid-channel. The white and green coasts of Picardy and of Kent lay clear upon either side of them. The wide channel stretched in front, deepening from the light blue beneath their prow to purple on the far skyline. Behind them was that thick bank of cloud from which they had just burst. It lay like a grey wall from east to west, and through it were breaking the high shadowy forms of the ships of Spain. Four of them had already emerged, their red bodies, gilded sides and painted sails shining gloriously in the evening sun. Every instant a fresh golden spot grew out of the fog, which blazed like a star for an instant, and then surged forward, to show itself as the brazen beak of the great red vessel which bore it. Looking back, the whole bank of cloud was broken by the widespread line of noble ships which were bursting through it. The basilisk lay a mile or more in front of them, and two miles clear of their wing. Five miles further off, in the direction of the French coast, two other small ships were running down the channel. A cry of joy from Robert Knowles and a hearty prayer of gratitude to the saints from the old shipmen hailed them as their missing comrades, the Cog Thomas and the Grasse Dieu. But fair as was the view of their lost friends and wondrous the appearance of the Spanish ships, it was not on those that the eyes of the men of the basilisk were chiefly bent. A greater sight lay before them, a sight which brought them clustering to the forecastle with eager eyes and pointing fingers. The English fleet was coming forth from the Winchelsea coast. Already before the fog lifted, a fast galleass had brought the news down channel that the Spanish were on the sea, and the King's fleet was under way. Now their long array of sails, gay with the coats and colours of the towns which had furnished them, lay bright against the Kentish coast from Dungeness Point to Rye. Nine and twenty ships were there from Southampton, Shoreham, Winchelsea, Hastings, Rye, Hythe, Romney, Folkestone, Deal, Dover, and Sandwich. With their great sails slewed round to catch the wind, they ran out, whilst the Spanish, like the gallant foes that they have ever been, turned their heads landward to meet them. With flaunting banners and painted sails, blaring trumpets and clashing cymbals, the two glittering feats, dipping and rising on the long channel swell, drew slowly together. King Edward had been lying all day in his great ship, the Philippa, a mile out from the Camber Sands, waiting for the coming of the Spaniards. Above the huge sail which bore the royal arms flew the Red Cross of England. Along the bulwarks were shown the shields of forty knights, the flower of English chivalry, and as many pennons floated from the deck. The high ends of the ship glittered with the weapons of the men-at-arms, and the waist was crammed with archers. From time to time a crash of nakers and a blare of trumpets burst from the royal ship, and was answered by her great neighbours, the lion, on which the Black Prince flew his flag, the Christopher, with the Earl of Suffolk, 
the Salle du Roi of Robert de Namur, and the Grasse Marie of Sir Thomas Holland. Further off lay the White Swan, bearing the arms of Mowbray, the Palmer of Deal, flying the black head of Audley, and the Kentish Man under the Lord Beauchamp. The rest lay anchored but ready at the mouth of the Winchelsea Creek. The King sat upon a keg in the forepart of his ship, with little John of Richmond, who was no more than a schoolboy, perched upon his knee. Edward was clad in the black velvet jacket, which was his favourite garb, and wore a small brown beaver hat with a white plume at the side. A rich cloak of fur turned up with miniver drooped from his shoulders. Behind him were a score of his knights, brilliant in silks and sarsenets, some seated on an upturned boat and some swinging their legs from the bulwark. In front stood John Chandos in a party-coloured jupon, one foot raised upon the anchor stock picking at the strings of his guitar, and singing a song which he had learned at Marienburg when he last helped the Teutonic knights against the heathen. The king, his knights, and even the archers in the waist below them, laughed at the merry lilt, and joined lustily in the chorus, while the men of the neighbouring ships leaned over the side to hearken to the deep chant rolling over the waters. But there came a sudden interruption to the song. A sharp, harsh shout came down from the lookout stationed in the circular top at the end of the mast. "'I spy a sail! Two sails!' he cried. John Bunce, the king's shipman, shaded his eyes and stared at the long fog-bank which shrouded the northern channel. Chandos, with his fingers over the strings of his guitar, the king, the knights, all gazed in the same direction. Two small dark shapes had burst forth, and then, after some minutes, a third. "'Surely they are the Spaniards,' said the king. "'Nay, sire,' the seaman answered. The Spaniards are greater ships, and are painted red. I know not what these may be. But I could hazard a guess, cried Chandos. Surely they are the three ships with my own men on their way to Brittany. Ah, you have hit it, John, said the king. But look, I pray you, what in the name of the Virgin is that? Four brilliant stars of flashing light had shone out from different points of the cloud-bank. The next instant, as many tall ships had swooped forth into the sunshine. A fierce shout rang from the king's ship, and was taken up all down the line, until the whole coast from Dungeness to Winchelsea echoed the warlike greeting. The king sprang up with a joyous face. "'The game is afoot, my friends,' said he. "'Dress, John, dress, Walter. Quick, all of you. Squires, bring the harness. Let each tend to himself, for the time is short.' A strange sight it was to see these forty noble knights tearing off their clothes and littering the deck with velvets and satins, whilst the squire of each, as busy as an ostler before a race, stooped and pulled and strained and riveted, fastening the bassinets, the leg-pieces, the front and back plates, until the silken courtier had become a man of steel. When their work was finished, there stood a stern group of warriors where the light dandies had sung and jested round Sir John's guitar. Below, in orderly silence, the archers were mustering under their officers and taking their allotted stations. A dozen had swarmed up to their hazardous post in the little tower in the tops. "'Bring wine, Nicholas,' cried the king. "'Gentlemen, ere you close your visors, I pray you to take a last rouse with me. You will be dry enough, I promise you, before your lips are free once more.' "'To what shall we drink, John?' "'To the men of Spain,' said Chandos, his sharp face peering like a gaunt bird through the gap in his helmet. May their hearts be stout, and their spirits high this day. Well said, John, cried the king. The knights laughed joyously as they drank. Now, fair sirs, let each to his post. I am warden here on the forecastle. Do you, John, take charge of the afterguard? Walter, James, William, Fitzalan, Goldsborough, Reginald, you will stay with me. John, you may pick whom you will, and the others will bide with the archers. Now bear straight at the centre, Master Shipman. Ere yonder sun sets, we will bring a red ship back as a gift to our ladies, or never look upon a lady's face again. The art of sailing into a wind had not yet been invented, nor was there any fore and aft canvas, save for small headsails, with which a vessel could be turned. Hence the English feet had to take a long slant down channel to meet their enemies. But as the Spaniards, coming before the wind, were equally anxious to engage, there was the less delay. With stately pomp and dignity, the two great fleets approached. It chanced that one fine carrack had outstripped its consorts, and came sweeping along, all red and gold with a fringe of twinkling steel, a good half-mile before the fleet. Edward looked at her with a kindling eye, for indeed she was a noble sight, with the blue water creaming under her gilded prow. 
"'This is a most worthy and debonair vessel, Master Bunce,' said he to the shipman beside him. "'I would fain have a tilt with her. I pray you to hold us straight, that we may bear her down.' "'If I hold her straight, then one or other must sink, and it may be both,' the seaman answered. "'I doubt not that with the help of Our Lady we shall do our part,' said the king. "'Hold her straight, Master Shipman, as I have told you.' Now the two vessels were within arrow-flight, and the bolts from the crossbowmen pattered upon the English ship. These short, thick devil's darts were everywhere humming like great wasps through the air, crashing against the bulwarks, beating upon the deck, ringing loudly on the armour of the knights, or with a soft, muffled thud, sinking to the socket in a victim. The bowmen along either side of the Philippa had stood motionless, waiting for their orders, but now there was a sharp shout from their leader, and every string twanged together. The air was full of their harping, together with the swish of the arrows, the long-drawn keening of the bowmen, and the short, deep bark of the under-officers. "'Steady! Steady! Loose steady! Shoot wholly together! Twelve score paces! Ten score! Now eight! Shoot wholly together!' Their gruff shouts broke through the high, shrill cry, like the deep roar of a wave through the howl of the wind. As the two great ships hurtled together, the Spaniard turned away a few points, so that the blow should be a glancing one. Nonetheless, it was terrific. A dozen men in the tops of the carrack were balancing a huge stone, with the intention of dropping it over on the English deck. With a scream of horror, they saw the mast cracking beneath them. Over it went, slowly at first, then faster, until, with a crash, it came down on its side, sending them flying like stones from a sling far out into the sea. A swathe of crushed bodies lay across the deck where the mast had fallen. But the English ship had not escaped unscathed. Her mast held, it is true, but the mighty shock not only stretched every man flat upon the deck, but had shaken a score of those who lined her sides into the sea. One bowman was hurled from the top, and his body fell with a dreadful crash at the very side of the prostrate king upon the forecastle. Many were thrown down with broken arms and legs from the high castles at either end into the waist of the ship. Worst of all, the seams had been opened by the crash, and the water was gushing in at a dozen places. But these were men of experience and of discipline, men who had already fought together by sea and by land, so that each knew his place and his duty. Those who could staggered to their feet, and helped up a score or more of knights who were rolling and clashing in the scuppers, unable to rise for the weight of their armour. The bowmen formed up as before. The seamen ran to the gaping seams with oakum and with tar, in ten minutes order had been restored, and the Philippa, though shaken and weakened, was ready for battle once more. The king was glaring round him like a wounded boar. "'Grapple my ship with that!' he cried, pointing to the crippled Spaniard, for I would have possession of her. But already the breeze had carried them past it, and a dozen Spanish ships were bearing down full upon them. "'We cannot win back to her, lest we show our flank to these others,' said the shipman. "'Let her go her way,' cried the knights. "'You shall have better than her.' "'By St. George, you speak the truth,' said the king for she is ours when we have time to take her. These also seem very worthy ships which are drawing up to us, and I pray you, Master Shipman, that you will have a tilt with the nearest. A great carrack was within a bowshot of them and crossing their bows. Bunce looked up at his mast, and he saw that already it was shaken and drooping. Another blow, and it would be over the side, and his ship a helpless log upon the water. He jammed his helm round, therefore, and ran his ship alongside the Spaniard, throwing out his hooks and iron chains as he did so. They, no less eager, grappled the Philippa both fore and aft, and the two vessels, linked tightly together, surged slowly over the long blue rollers. Over their bulwarks hung a cloud of men locked together in a desperate struggle, sometimes surging forward onto the deck of the Spaniard, sometimes recoiling back onto the king's ship, reeling this way and that, with the swords flickering like silver flames above them, while the long-drawn cry of rage and agony swelled up like a wolf's howl to the calm blue heaven above them. But now ship after ship of the English had come up, each throwing its iron over the nearest Spaniard and striving to board her high red sides. Twenty ships were drifting in furious single combat after the manner of the Philippa, until the whole surface of the sea was covered with a succession of these desperate duels. The dismasted carrack, which the king's ship had left behind it, had been carried by the Earl of Suffolk's Christopher, and the water was dotted with the heads of her crew. An English ship had been sunk by a huge stone discharged from an engine, and her men also were struggling in the waves, none having leisure to lend them a hand. A second English ship was caught between two of the Spanish vessels, and overwhelmed by a rush of boarders, so that not a man of her was left alive. 
On the other hand, Mowbray and Audley had each taken the carracks which were opposed to them, and the battle in the centre, after swaying this way and that, was turning now in favour of the islanders. The Black Prince, with the Lion, the Grasse Marie, and four other ships, had swept round to turn the Spanish flank. But the movement was seen, and the Spaniards had ten ships with which to meet it, one of them their great carrack, the Santiago de Compostela. To this ship the Prince had attached his little cog, and strove desperately to board her. But her side was so high and the defence so desperate that his men could never get beyond her bulwarks, but were hurled down again and again, with a clang and clash to the deck beneath. Her side bristled with crossbowmen, who shot straight down onto the packed waist of the lion, so that the dead lay there in heaps. But the most dangerous of all was a swarthy black-bearded giant in the tops, who crouched so that none could see him, but rising every now and then, with a huge lump of iron between his hands, hurled it down with such force that nothing would stop it. Again and again these ponderous bolts crashed through the deck, and hurtled down into the bottom of the ship, starting the planks and shattering all that came in their way. The prince, clad in that dark armour which gave him his name, was directing the attack from the poop, when the shipman rushed wildly up to him with fear on his face. Sire, he cried, the ship may not stand against these blows. A few more will sink her. Already the water floods in board. The prince looked up, and as he did so the shaggy beard showed once more, and two brawny arms swept downward. A great slug, whizzing down, beat a gaping hole in the deck, and fell rending and writhing into the hold below. The master mariner tore his grizzled hair. "'Another leak!' he cried. "'I pray to St. Leonard to bear us up this day. Twenty of my shipmen are bailing with buckets, but the water rises on them fast. The vessel may not float another hour.' The prince had snatched a crossbow from one of his attendants, and levelled it at the Spaniard's tops. At the very instant when the seaman stood erect with a fresh bar in his hands, the bolt took him full in the face, and his body fell forward over the parapet, hanging there, head downward. A howl of exultation burst from the English at the sight, answered by a wild roar of anger from the Spaniards. A seaman had run from the lion's hold and whispered in the ear of the shipman. He turned an ashen face upon the prince. "'It is even as I say, sire. The ship is sinking beneath our feet,' he cried. "'The more need that we should gain another,' said he. "'Sir Henry Stokes, Sir Thomas Stoughton, William, John of Clifton, here lies our road. Advance my banner, Thomas de Mohun. On, and the day is ours.' By a desperate scramble, a dozen men, the prince at their head, gained a footing on the edge of the Spaniard's deck. Some slashed furiously to clear a space, others hung over, clutching the rail with one hand and pulling up their comrades from below. Every instant that they could hold their own, their strength increased, till twenty had become thirty, and thirty forty, when of a sudden the newcomers, still reaching forth to their comrades below, saw the deck beneath them reel and vanish in a swirling sheet of foam. The prince's ship had foundered. A yell went up from the Spaniards as they turned furiously upon the small band who had reached their deck. Already the prince and his men had carried the poop, and from that high station they beat back their swarming enemies. But crossbow darts pelted and thudded among their ranks, till a third of their number were stretched upon the planks. Lined across the deck, they could hardly keep an unbroken front to the leaping, surging crowd who pressed upon them. Another rush, or another after that, must assuredly break them for these dark men of Spain, hardened by an endless struggle with the Moors, were fierce and stubborn fighters. But hark to this sudden roar upon the farther side of them. St. George! St. George! And knolls to the rescue! A small craft had run alongside, and sixty men had swarmed on the deck of the Santiago. Caught between two fires, the Spaniards wavered and broke. The fight became a massacre. Down from the poop sprang the prince's men. Up from the waist rushed the newcomers. There were five dreadful minutes of blows and screams and prayers, with struggling figures clinging to the bulwarks and sullen splashes into the water below. Then it was over, and a crowd of weary, overstrained men leaned panting upon their weapons, or lay breathless and exhausted upon the deck of the captured carrack. The prince had pulled up his visor and lowered his beaver. He smiled proudly as he gazed around him and wiped his streaming face. "'Where is the shipman?' he asked. "'Let him lead us against another ship.' "'Nay, sire, the shipman and all his men have sunk in the lion,' said Thomas de Mohun, a young knight of the West Country who carried the standard. "'We have lost our ship and the half of our following. I fear that we can fight no more.' "'It matters the less, since the day is already ours,' said the prince, looking over the sea. "'My noble father's royal banner flies upon yonder Spaniard. 
Mowbray, Audley, Suffolk, Beauchamp, Namur, Tracy, Stafford Arundel, each has his flag over a scarlet carrack, even as mine floats over this. See, yonder squadron is already far beyond our reach. But surely we owe thanks to you who came at so perilous a moment to our aid. Your face I have seen, and your coat armor also, young sir, though I cannot lay my tongue to your name. Let me know that I may thank you. He had turned to Nigel, who stood flushed and joyous at the head of the borders from the basilisk. I am but a squire, sire, and can claim no thanks, for there is nothing that I have done. Here is our leader. The prince's eyes fell upon the shield charged with the black raven and the stern young face of him who bore it. Sir Robert Knowles, said he, I had thought you were on your way to Brittany. I was so, sire, when I had the fortune to see this battle as I passed. The prince laughed. It would indeed be too much to ask, Robert, that you should keep on your course when much honour was to be gained so close to you. But now I pray you that you will come back with us to Winchelsea, for well I know that my father would fain thank you for what you have done this day. But Robert Knowles shook his head. I have your father's command, sire, and without his order I may not go against it. Our people are hard-pressed in Brittany, and it is not for me to linger on the way. I pray you, sire, if you must needs mention me to the king, crave his pardon that I should have broken my journey thus. You are right, Robert. God speed you on your way, and I would that I were sailing under your banner, for I see clearly that you will take your people where they may worshipfully win worship. Perchance I also may be in Brittany before the year is past. The prince turned to the task of gathering his weary people together, and the basilisks passed over the side once more and dropped down onto their own little ship. They poled her off from the captured Spaniard, and set their sail with their prow for the south. Far ahead of them were their two consorts, beating towards them in the hope of giving help, while down channel were a score of Spanish ships, with a few of the English vessels hanging upon their skirts. The sun lay low on the water, and its level beams glowed upon the scarlet and gold of fourteen great carracks, each flying the cross of St. George, and towering high above the cluster of English ships, which, with brave waving of flags and blaring of music, were moving slowly toward the Kentish coast. End of chapter 17Chapter 18 of Sir Nigel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Clive Catterall. Sir Nigel by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Chapter 18 How Black Simon Claimed a Forfeit from the King of Sark. For a day and a half the small fleet made good progress, but on the second morning, after sighting Camp de la Hague, there came a brisk land wind which blew them out to sea. It grew into a squall with rain and fog, so that they were two more days beating back. Next morning they found themselves in a dangerous rock-studded sea, with a small island upon their starboard quarter. It was girdled with high granite cliffs of a reddish hue and slopes of bright green grassland lay above them. A second, smaller island lay beside it. Dennis the shipman shook his head as he looked. "'That is Brechou,' said he, "'and the larger one is the island of Sark. "'If ever I be cast away, "'I pray the saints that I may not be upon yonder coast.' Knowles gazed across at it. "'You say well, Master Shipman,' said he. "'It does appear to be a rocky and perilous spot.' "'Nay, it is the rocky hearts of those who dwell upon it that I had in my mind, the old sailor answered. We are well safe in three goodly vessels, but had we been here in a small craft, I make no doubt that they would have already had their boats out against us. Who then are these people, and how do they live upon so small and windswept an island? asked the soldier. They do not live from the island, fair sir, but from what they can gather upon the sea around it. They are broken folk from all countries, justice flyers, prison breakers, reavers, escape bondsmen and murderers, and staff strikers, who have made their way to this outland place and hold it against all comers. There is one here who could tell you of them and of their ways, for he was long time prisoner amongst them. The seaman pointed to Black Simon, the dark man from Norwich, who was leaning against the side, lost in moody thought, and staring with a broody eye at the distant shore. "'How now, fellow?' asked Knowles. "'What is this I hear? 
Is it indeed sooth that you have been captive upon this island? It is true, fair sir. For eight months I have been servant to the man whom they call their king. His name is La Mouette, and he comes from Jersey, nor is there under God's sky a man who I have more desire to see. Has he then mishandled you? Black Simon gave a wry smile, and pulled off his jerkin. His lean, sinewy back was wheeled and puckered with white scars. "'He has left his sign of hand upon me,' said he. "'He swore that he would break me to his will, and thus he tried to do it. "'But most I desire to see him, because he hath lost a wager to me, and I would fain be paid.' "'This is a strange saying,' said Knowles. "'What is this wager, and why should he pay you?' "'It is but a small matter,' Simon answered. Uh, "'But I am a poor man, and the payment would be welcome. "'Should it have chanced that we stopped at this island, "'I should have craved your leave that I go ashore "'and ask for that which I have fairly won.' "'Sir Robert Knowles laughed. "'This business tickleth my fancy,' said he. "'As to stopping at the island, "'this shipman tells me that we must needs wait a day and a night, "'for that we have strained our planks. "'But if you should go ashore, "'how will you be sure that you will be free to depart?' or that you will see this king of whom you speak. Black Simon's dark face was shining with fierce joy. Fair sir, I will ever be your debtor if you let me go. Concerning what you ask, I know this island even as I know the streets of Norwich, as you may well believe, seeing that it is but a small place, and I upon it for near a year. Should I land after dark, I could win my way to the king's house, and if he be not dead or distraught with drink, I could have speech with him alone for I know his ways and his hours, and how he may be found. I would ask only that Aylward the archer may go with me, that I may have one friend at my side if things should chance to go awry. Knowles thought a while. It is much that you ask, said he, for by God's truth I reckon that you and this friend of yours are two of my men whom I would be least ready to lose. I have seen you both at grips with the Spaniards, and I know you. But I trust you, and if we must indeed stop at this accursed place, then you may do as you will. If you have deceived me, or if this is a trick by which you design to leave me, then God be your friend when next we meet, for man will be of small avail. It proved that not only the seams had to be corked, but that the cog Thomas was out of fresh water. The ships moored, therefore, near the Isle of Brechou, where springs were to be found. There were no people upon this little patch, but over on the farther island many figures could be seen watching them, and the twinkle of steel from among them showed that they were armed men. One boat had ventured forth, and taken a good look at them, but had hurried back with the warning that they were too strong to be touched. Black Simon found Aylward seated under the poop with his back against Bartholomew the bowyer. He was whistling merrily as he carved a girl's face upon the horn of his bow. "'My friend,' said Simon, "'will you come ashore to-night?' for I have need of your help. Aylward crowed lustily. Would I come, Simon? By my hilt, I shall be right glad to put my foot upon the good brown earth once more. All my life I have trod it, and yet I would never have learned its worth had I not journeyed in these cursed ships. We will go on shore together, Simon, and we will seek out the women, if there be any there, for it seems a long year since I heard their gentle voices, and my eyes are weary of such faces as Bartholomew's or thine. Simon's grim features relaxed into a smile. The only face that you will see ashore, Samkin, will bring you small comfort, said he, and I warn you that this is no easy errand, but one which may be neither sweet nor fair, for if these people take us, our end will be a cruel one. By my hilt, said Aylward, I am with you, gossip, wherever you may go. Say no more, therefore, for I am weary of living like a coney in a hole and I shall be right glad to stand by you in your venture. That night, two hours after dark, a small boat put forth from the basilisk. It contained Simon, Aylward, and two seamen. The soldiers carried their swords, and Black Simon bore a brown biscuit-bag over his shoulder. Under his direction the rowers skirted the dangerous surf which beat against the cliffs, until they came to a spot where an outlying reef formed a breakwater. Within was a belt of calm water, and a shallow cove with a sloping beach. Here the boat was dragged up, and the seamen were ordered to wait, while Simon and Aylward started on their errand. 
With the assured air of a man who knows exactly where he is and whither he is going, the man-at-arms began to clamber up a narrow, fern-lined cleft among the rocks. It was no easy ascent in the darkness, but Simon climbed like an old dog out upon ascent, and the panting Aylward struggled after as best he might. At last they were at the summit, and the archer threw himself down upon the grass. "'No, Simon, I have not enough breath to blow out a candle,' said he. "'Stint your haste for a minute, since we have a long night before us. Surely this man is a friend indeed if you hasten to see him.' "'Such a friend,' Simon answered, "'that I have often dreamed of our next meeting. Now, before the moon has set, it will have come.' "'Had it been a wench, I could have understood it,' said Aylward. "'By these ten finger-bones, if Mary of the Mill, or little Kate of Compton, had waited me on the brow of this cliff, I should have come up it and never known it was there. "'But surely I see houses and hear voices over yonder in the shadow.' "'It is their town,' whispered Simon. "'There are a hundred as bloody-minded cutthroats as are to be found in Christendom beneath those roofs.' "'Hucked at that!' A fierce burst of laughter came out of the darkness, followed by a long cry of pain. "'All hallows be with us!' cried Aylward. "'What is that?' "'As like as not some poor devil has fallen into their clutches, even as I did. "'Come this way, Samkin, for there is a peat-cutting where we may hide.' "'Aye. Here it is, but deeper and broader than of old. "'Now follow me close, for if we keep within it, "'we shall find ourselves a stone's cast off the king's house.' "'Together they crept along the dark cutting.' Suddenly Simon seized Aylward by the shoulder, and pushed him into the shadow of the bank. Crouching in the darkness, they heard footsteps and voices upon the farther side of the trench. Two men sauntered along it, and stopped almost at the very spot where the comrades were lying. Aylward could see their dark figures outlined against the starry sky. "'Why should you scold, Jacques?' said one of them, speaking a strange half-French, half-English lingo. Le diable t'emport for a grumbling rascal. You have won a woman, and I got nothing. What more would you have? You will have your chance off the next ship, mon garçon, but mine is past. A woman, it is true, an old peasant out of the fields with a face as yellow as a kite's claw. But Gaston, who threw a nine against my eight, got as fair a little Normandy lass as ever your eyes have seen. Curse the dice, I say. As to my woman... I will sell her to you for a firkin of Gascony. I have no wine to spare, but I will give you a keg of apples, said the other. I had it out of the Peter and Paul, the Falmouth boat that struck in Crebay. Well, well, your apples may be the worse for keeping, but so is old Marie, and we may cry quits on that. Come round and drink a cup over the bargain. They shuffled outward in the darkness. Have you ever heard such villainy? cried Aylward breathing fierce and hard. Did you hear them, Simon? A woman for a keg of apples? And my heart's root is sad for the other one, the girl of Normandy. Surely we can land to-morrow and burn all these water-rats out of their nest. Nay, Sir Robert will not waste time or strength ere he reach Brittany. Sure I am that if my little master, Squire Loring, had the handling of it, every woman on this island would be free ere another day had passed. I doubt not, said Simon. He is one who makes an idol of woman, after the manner of those crazy knight-errants. But Sir Robert is a true soldier, and hath only his purpose in view. Simon, said Aylward, the light is not over good, and the place is cramped for sword-play. But if you would step out into the open, I will teach you whether my master is a true soldier or not. Tut, man, you are foolish yourself, said Simon. Here we are, with our work in hand, and yet you must needs fall out with me on our way to it. I say nothing against your master, save that he hath the way of his fellows who follow dreams and fancies. But Knowles looks neither to right nor left, and walks forward to his mark. Now let us on, for the time passes. Simon, your words are neither good nor fair. When we are back on shipboard, we will speak further of this matter. Now lead on, I pray you, and let us see some more of this ten-devil island. For half a mile Simon led the way until they came to a large house which stood by itself. Peering at it from the edge of the cutting, Aylward could see that it was made from the wreckage of many vessels, for at each corner a prow was thrust out. Lights blazed within, and there came the sound of a strong voice singing a gay song, 
which was taken up by a dozen others in the chorus. "'All is well, lad,' whispered Simon, in great delight. "'That is the voice of the king. "'It is the very song he used to sing. "'Les deux filles de Pierre. "'For God, my back tingles at the very sound of it. "'Here we will wait until his company take their leave.' Hour after hour they crouched in the peat-cutting, listening to the noisy songs of the revellers within, some French, some English, and all growing fouler and less articulate as the night wore on. Once a quarrel broke out, and the clamour was like a cageful of wild beasts at feeding-time. Then a health was drunk, and there was much stamping and cheering. Only once was the long vigil broken. A woman came forth from the house, and walked up and down, with her face sunk upon her breast. She was tall and slender, but her features could not be seen for a wimple over her head. Weary sadness could read in her bowed back and dragging steps. Once only they saw her throw up her two hands to heaven as one who was beyond human aid. Then she passed slowly into the house again. A moment later the door of the hall was flung open, and a shouting, stumbling throng came crowding forth, with whoop and yell into the silent night. Linking arms and striking up a chorus, they marched past the peat-cutting, their voices dwindling slowly away as they made for their homes. "'Now, Samkin, now!' cried Simon, and jumping out from the hiding-place, he made for the door. It had not yet been fastened. The two comrades sprang inside, then Simon drew the bolts so that no one might interrupt them. A long table, littered with flagons and beakers, lay before them. It was lit up by a line of torches, which flickered and smoked in their iron sconces. At the farther end a solitary man was seated. His head rested upon his two hands, as if he were befuddled with wine. But at the harsh sound of the snapping bolts he raised his face and looked angrily around him. It was a strange, powerful head, tawny and shaggy like a lion's, with a tangled beard and a large, harsh face, bloated and blotched with vice. He laughed as the newcomers entered, thinking that two of his boon companions had returned to finish a flagon. Then he stared hard, and he passed his hand over his eyes, like one who thinks he may be dreaming. "'Mon Dieu!' he cried. "'Who are you, and whence come you at this hour of the night? Is this the way to break into our royal presence?' Simon approached up one side of the table, and Aylward up the other. When they were close to the king, the man-at-arms plucked a torch from its socket and held it to his own face. The king staggered back with a cry as he gazed at that grim visage. "'Le diable noir!' he cried. "'Simon the Englishman! What make you here?' Simon put his hand upon his shoulder. "'Sit here,' said he, and he forced the king into his seat. "'Do you sit on the farther side of him, Aylward? We make a merry group, do we not? Often have I served at this table, but never did I hope to drink at it. Fill your cup, Samkin, and pass the flagon.' The king looked from one to the other, with terror in his bloodshot eyes. "'What would you do?' he asked. "'Are you mad that you should come here? One shout, and you are at my mercy.' "'Nay, my friend, I have lived too long in your house not to know the ways of it. No man-servant ever slept beneath your roof, for you feared lest your throat would be cut in the night-time. You may shout and shout, if it so please you. It chanced that I was passing on my way from England in those ships which lie off La Brechou, and I thought I would come in and have speech with you. "'Indeed, Simon, I am right glad to see you,' said the king, cringing away from the fierce eyes of the soldier. "'We were good friends in the past, were we not? And I cannot call to mind that I have ever done you injury. When you made your way to England by swimming to the Levantine, there was none more glad in heart than I. "'If I cared to doff my doublet, I could show you the marks of what your friendship has done for me in the past,' said Simon. It is printed on my back as clearly as on my memory. Why, you foul dog, there are the very rings upon the wall to which my hands were fastened, and there the stains upon the boards on which my blood has dripped. Is it not so, you king of butchers? The pirate chief turned whiter still. Uh, it may be that life here was somewhat rough, Simon, but if I have wronged you in any way, I will surely make amends. What do you ask? I ask only one thing, and I have come hither that I may get it. It is that you pay me forfeit, for that you have lost your wager. My wager, Simon? I call to mind no wager. But I will call it to your mind, and then I will take my payment, 
Often have you sworn that you would break my courage. By my head, you have cried to me. You will crawl at my feet. And again, I will wager my head that I will tame you. Yes, yes, a score of times you have said so. In my heart, as I listened, I have taken up your gauge. And now, Doc, you have lost, and I am here to claim the forfeit. His long, heavy sword flew from its sheath. The king, with a howl of despair, flung his arms around him, and they rolled together under the table. Aylward sat with a ghastly face, and his toes curled with horror at the sight, for he was still new to scenes of strife, and his blood was too cold for such a deed. When Simon rose, he tossed something into his bag and sheathed his bloody sword. "'Come, Samkin, our work is well done,' said he. "'By my hilt, if I had known what it was, I would have been less ready to come with you,' said the archer. "'Could you not have clapped a sword in his fist and let him take his chance in the hall?' "'Nay, Samkin, if you had such memories as I, you would have wished that he should die like a sheep and not like a man. What chance did he give me when he had the power?' and why should I treat him better? But, holy virgin, what have we here? At the farther end of the table a woman was standing. An open door behind her showed that she had come from the inner room of the house. By her tall figure the comrades knew that she was the same that they had already seen. Her face had once been fair, but now was white and haggard, with wild dark eyes full of a hopeless terror and despair. Slowly she paced up the room, her gaze fixed not upon the comrades, but upon the dreadful thing beneath the table. Then, as she stooped, and was sure, she burst into loud laughter and clapped her hands. "'Who shall say there is no God?' she cried. "'Who shall say that prayer is unavailing? Great sir, brave sir, let me kiss that conquering hand.' "'Nay, nay, dame, stand back. Well, if you must needs have one of them.' Take this which is the clean one. It is the other I crave, that which is red with his blood. O oh, joyful night, when my lips have been wet with it. Now I can die in peace. We must go, Aylward, said Simon. In another hour the dawn will have broken. In daytime a rat could not cross this island and pass unseen. Come, man, and at once. But Aylward was at the woman's side. Come with us, fair dame, said he. Surely we can at least take you from this island, and no such change can be for the worse. Nay, said she, the saints in heaven cannot help me now, until they take me to my rest. There is no place for me in the world beyond, and all my friends were slain on the day I was taken. Leave me, brave men, and let me care for myself. Already it lightens in the east, and black will be your fate if you are taken. Go, and may the blessing of one who was once a holy nun go with you and guard you from danger. Sir Robert Knowles was pacing the deck in the early morning when he heard the sound of oars, and there were his two night-birds climbing up the side. "'So, fellow,' said he, "'have you had speech with the King of Sark?' "'Fair sir, I have seen him.' "'And has he paid his forfeit?' "'He has paid it, sir.' Knowles looked with curiosity at the bag which Simon bore. "'What carry you there?' he asked. "'The stake that he has lost.' "'What was it, then?' A goblet, a silver plate. For answer, Simon opened his bag and shook it on the deck. Sir Robert turned away with a whistle. For God, said he, it is in my mind that I carry some hard men with me to Brittany. End of chapter 18「Chapter 19 of Sir Nigel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Clive Catterall. Sir Nigel by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Chapter 19 How a Squire of England Met a Squire of France. Sir Robert Knowles, with his little fleet, had sighted the Breton coast near Cancal. They had rounded the Point de Groin, and finally had sailed past the port of Saint-Malo, and down the long, narrow estuary of the Rance, until they were close to the old-walled city of Dinan, which was held by that Montfort faction, whose cause the English had espoused. Here the horses had been disembarked, the stores were unloaded, 
and the whole force encamped outside the city, whilst the leaders waited for news as to the present state of affairs, and where there was most hope of honour and profit. The whole of France was feeling the effects of that war with England, which had already lasted some ten years. But no province was in so dreadful a condition as this unhappy land of Brittany. In Normandy or Picardy, the inroads of the English were periodical, with intervals of rest between. But Brittany was torn asunder by constant civil war apart from the grapple of the two great combatants, so that there was no surcease of her sufferings. The struggle had begun in 1341, through the rival claims of Montfort and of Blois to the vacant dukedom. England had taken the part of Montfort, France that of Blois. Neither faction was strong enough to destroy the other, and so, after ten years of continual fighting, history recorded a long, ineffectual list of surprises and ambushes, of raids and skirmishes, of towns taken and retaken, of alternate victory and defeat, in which neither party could claim supremacy. It mattered nothing that Montfort and Blois had both disappeared from the scene, the one dead and the other taken by the English. Their wives caught up the swords which had dropped from the hands of their lords, and the long struggle went on even more savagely than before. In the south and east the Blois faction held the country, and Nantes, the capital, was garrisoned and occupied by a strong French army. In the north and the west the Montfort party prevailed, for the island kingdom was at their back, and always fresh sails broke the northern skyline, bearing adventurers from over the channel. Between these two there lay a broad zone comprising all the centre of the country, which was a land of blood and violence, where no law prevailed save that of the sword. From end to end it was dotted with castles, some held for one side, some for the other, and many mere robber strongholds, the scenes of gross and monstrous deeds, whose brute owners, knowing that they could never be called to account, made war upon all mankind and wrung with rack and with flame the last chilling from all who fell into their savage hands. The fields had long been untilled. Commerce was dead. From Rennes in the east to Ennebon in the west, and from Dinan in the north to Nantes in the south, there was no spot where a man's life or a woman's honour was safe. Such was the land, full of darkness and blood, the saddest blackest spot in Christendom, into which Knolls and his men were now advancing. But there was no sadness in the young heart of Nigel, as he rode by the side of Knolls at the head of a clump of spears, nor did it seem to him that fate had led him into an unduly arduous path. On the contrary, he blessed the good fortune which had sent him into so delightful a country, and it seemed to him, as he listened to dreadful stories of robber barons, and looked round at the black scars of war which lay branded upon the fair faces of the hills, that no hero of romances, or trouveur, had ever journeyed through such a land of promise, with so fair a chance of knightly venture and honourable advancement. The red ferret was one deed towards his vow. Surely a second, and perhaps a better, was to be found somewhere upon this glorious countryside. He had borne himself as the others had in the sea-fight, and could not count it to his credit where he had done no more than mere duty. Something beyond this was needed for such a deed as could be laid at the feet of the Lady Mary but surely it was to be found here, in fermenting war-distracted Brittany. Then, with two done, it would be strange if he could not find occasion for that third one, which would complete his service and set him free to look her in the face once more. With the great yellow horse curvetting beneath him, his guildford armour gleaming in the sun, his sword clanking against his stirrup-iron, and his father's tough ash-spear in his hand, he rode with a light heart and a smiling face looking eagerly to right and to left for any chance which his good fate might send. The road from Dinan to Colne, along which the small army was moving, rose and dipped over undulating ground, with a bare marshy plain upon the left, where the river Rance ran down to the sea, while upon the right lay a wooded country with a few wretched villages, so poor and sordid that they had nothing with which to tempt the spoiler. The peasants had left them at the first twinkle of a steel cap, and lurked at the edges of the woods, ready in an instant to dive into those secret recesses known only to themselves. These creatures suffered sorely at the hands of both parties, but when the chance came they revenged their wrongs on either in a savage way which brought fresh brutalities upon their heads. 
the newcomers soon had a chance of seeing to what lengths they would go, for in the roadway near to Colne they came upon an English man-at-arms who had been waylaid and slain by them. How they had overcome him could not be told, but how they had slain him within his armour was horribly apparent, for they had carried such a rock as eight men could lift, and had dropped it upon him as he lay, so that he was spread out in his shattered case like a crab beneath a stone. Many a fist was shaken at the distant woods, and many a curse hurled at those who haunted them, as the column of scowling soldiers passed the murdered man, whose badge of the Moline Cross showed him to have been a follower of that house of Bentley, whose head, Sir Walter, was at that time leader of the British forces in the country. Sir Robert Knowles had served in Brittany before, and he marshalled his men on the march with the skill and caution of the veteran soldier, the man who leaves as little as possible to chance having too steadfast a mind to heed the fool who may think him over-cautious. He had recruited a number of bowmen and men-at-arms at Dinan, so that his following was now close upon five hundred men. In front, under his own leadership, were fifty mounted lancers, fully armed and ready for any sudden attack. Behind them, on foot, came the archers, and a second body of mounted men closed up the rear. Out upon either flank moved small bodies of cavalry, and a dozen scouts, spread fanwise, probed every gorge and dingle in front of the column. So for three days he moved slowly down the southern road. Sir Thomas Percy and Sir James Astley had ridden to the head of the column, and Knowles conferred with them as they marched, concerning the plan of their campaign. Percy and Astley were young and hot-headed, with wild visions of dashing deeds and knight errantry, but Knowles, with cold, clear brain and purpose of iron, held ever his object in view. "'By the holy Dunstan, and all the saints of Lindisfarne!' cried the fiery borderer. "'It goes to my heart to ride forward when there are such honourable chances on either side of us. Have I not heard that the French are at Evron, beyond the river? And is it not sooth that yonder castle, the towers of which I see above the woods, is in the hands of a traitor, who is false to his liege lord of Montfort? There is little profit to be gained upon this road for the folk seem to have no heart for war. Had we ventured as far over the marches of Scotland as we are now in Brittany, we should not have lacked some honourable venture or chance of winning worship. "'You say truth, Thomas,' cried Astley, a red-faced and choleric young man. "'It is well certain that the French will not come to us, and surely it is the more needful that we go to them. In sooth, any soldier who sees us would smile that we should creep for three days along this road, as though a thousand dangers lay before us, when we have but poor broken peasants to deal with. But Robert Knowles shook his head. We know not what are in these woods or behind these hills, said he, and when I know nothing it is my want to prepare for the worst which may befall. It is but prudence to do so. Your enemies might find some harsher name for it, said Astley, with a sneer. Nay, you need not think to scare me by glaring at me, Sir Robert, nor will your ill pleasure change my thoughts. I have faced fiercer eyes than thine, and I have not feared. Mm, your speech, Sir James, is neither courteous nor good, said Knowles. And if I were a free man, I would cram your words down your throat with the point of my dagger. But I am here to lead these men in profit and honour, not to quarrel with every fool who has not the wit to understand how soldiers should be led. Can you not see that if I make attempts here and there, as you would have me do, I shall have weakened my strength before I come to that part where it can best be spent? Uh, and where is that? asked Percy. For God, Astley, it is in my mind that we ride with one who knows more of war than you or I, and that we would be wise to be guided by his reed. Tell us, then, what is in your mind. Thirty miles from here, said Knowles, there is, as I am told, a fortalice named Plurnel and within it is one Bambro, an Englishman, with a good garrison. No great distance from him is the castle of Josselin, where dwells Robert of Beaumanoir, with a great following of Breton. It is my intention that we should join Bambro, and so be in such strength that we may throw ourselves upon Josselin, and by taking it become the masters of all mid-Brittany, and able to make head against the Frenchmen in the south. Indeed, I think that you can do no better, said Percy heartily, and I swear to you on jeopardy of my soul that I will stand by you in the matter. I doubt not that when we come deep into their lair they will draw together and do what they may to make head against us. 
but up to now I swear by all the saints of Lindisfarne that I should have seen more war in a summer's day in Lidsdale, or at the forest of Jedborough than any that Brittany has shown us. But see, you and a horsemen are riding in. They are our own hobblers, are they not? Who are these who are lashed to their stirrups? A small troop of mounted bowmen had ridden out of an oak grove upon the left of the road. They trotted up to where the three knights had halted. Two wretched peasants, whose wrists had been tied to their leathers, came leaping and straining beside the horses, in an effort not to be dragged off their feet. One was a tall, gaunt, yellow-haired man, the other short and swarthy, but both so crusted with dirt, so matted and tangled and ragged, that they were more like beasts of the wood than human beings. "'What is this?' asked Knowles. "'Have I not ordered you to leave the country folk at peace?' The leader of the archers, old Watt of Carlisle, held up a sword, a girdle, and a dagger. "'If it please you, fair sir,' said he, "'I saw the glint of these, and I thought them no fit tools for hands which were made for the spade and the plough. But when we had ridden them down and taken them, there was the Bentley cross upon each, and we knew that they had belonged to yonder dead Englishman upon the road. Surely, then, these are two of the villains who have slain them, and it is right that we do justice upon them. Sure enough, upon sword, girdle, and dagger shone the silver moline cross, which had gleamed upon the dead man's armour. Knolls looked at them, and then at the prisoners, with a face of stone. At the sight of those fell eyes, they had dropped with inarticulate howls upon their knees, screaming out their protests in a tongue which none could understand. "'We must have the road safe for wandering Englishmen,' said Knolls. "'These men must surely die. Hang them to yonder tree.' He pointed to a live oak by the roadside, and rode onward upon his way in converse with his fellow knights. But the old bowman had ridden after him. "'If it please you, Sir Robert, the bowman would fain put these men to death in their own fashion,' said he. "'So that they die, I care not how,' Knowles answered carelessly, and looked back no more. Human life was cheap in those stern days, when the footman of a stricken army or the crew of a captured ship were slain without any question or thought of mercy by the victors. War was a rude game, with death for the stake, and the forfeit was always claimed on the one side and paid on the other, without doubt or hesitation. Only the knight might be spared, since his ransom made him worth more alive than dead. To men trained in such a school, with death forever hanging over their own heads, it may be well believed that the slaying of the two peasant murderers was a small matter. And yet there was a special reason why upon this occasion the bowmen wished to keep the deed in their own hands. Ever since their dispute aboard the basilisk, there had been ill feeling betwixt Bartholomew, the old bald-headed bowyer, and Long Ned Whittington, the dalesman, which had ended in a conflict at Dinan, in which not only they but a dozen of their friends had been laid upon the cobblestones. The dispute raged round their respective knowledge and skill with the bow, and now some quick wit amongst the soldiers had suggested a grim fashion in which it should be put to the proof, once for all, which could draw the surer shaft. A thick wood lay two hundred paces from the road upon which the archers stood. A stretch of smooth, grassy sward lay between. The two peasants were led out fifty yards from the road, with their faces toward the wood. There they stood, held on a leash, and casting many a wondering, frightened glance over their shoulders at the preparations which were being made behind them. Old Bartholomew and the big Yorkshireman had stepped out of the ranks, and stood side by side, each with his strung bow in his left hand, and a single arrow in his right. With care they had drawn on and greased their shooting gloves, and fastened their braces. They plucked and cast up a few blades of grass to measure the wind, examined every small point of their tackle, turned their sides to the mark, and widened their feet in a firm stance. From all sides came chaff and counsel from their comrades. "'A three-quarter wind, Bowyer!' cried one. "'Aim a body's breadth to the right!' "'But not thy body's breadth, Bowyer!' laughed another. "'Else may you be over-wide!' "'Nay, this wind will scarce turn a well-drawn shaft,' said a third. "'Shoot dead upon him, and you'll be clapping a clout!' "'Steady, Ned, for the good name of the Dales,' cried a Yorkshireman. "'Loose easy and pluck not, or I am five crowns the poorer man.' "'A week's pay on Bartholomew!' shouted another. "'Now, old fat pate, fail me not!' "'Enough, enough, stint your talk!' cried the old bowman Watt of Carlisle. 
Were your shafts as quick as your tongues, there would be no facing you. Do you shoot upon the little one, Bartholomew, and you, Ned, upon the other? Give them law until I cry the word, and then loose in your own fashion and at your own time. Are you ready? Hola, there, Hayward. Beddington, let them run. The leashes were torn away, and the two men, stooping their heads, ran madly for the shelter of the wood, amid such a howl from the archers as beaters may give when the hare starts from its form. The two bowmen, each with his arrow drawn to the pile, stood like russet statues, menacing, motionless, their eager eyes fixed upon the fugitives, their bow-staves rising slowly as the distance between them lengthened. The Bretons were halfway to the wood, and still old Watt was silent. It may have been mercy, or it may have been mischief, but at least the chase should have a fair chance of life. At six score paces he turned his grizzled head at last. Loose! he cried. At the word the Yorkshireman's bowstring twanged. It was not for nothing that he had earned the name of being one of the deadliest archers of the north, and had twice borne away the silver arrow of Selby. Swift and true flew the fatal shaft, and buried itself to the feather in the curved back of the long yellow-haired peasant. Without a sound he fell upon his face, and lay stone dead upon the grass, the one short white plume between his dark shoulders to mark where death had smote him. The Yorkshireman threw his bow-stave into the air, and danced in triumph, whilst his comrades roared their fierce delight in a shout of applause, which changed suddenly into a tempest of hooting and of laughter. The smaller peasant, more cunning than his comrade, had run more slowly, but with many a backward glance. He had marked his companion's fate, and had waited with keen eyes until he saw the bowyer loose his string. At the moment he had thrown himself flat upon the grass, and had heard the arrow scream above him, and seen it quiver in the turf beyond. Instantly he had sprung to his feet again, and amid wild whoops and halloos from the bowmen, had made for the shelter of the wood. Now he had reached it, and ten score good paces separated him from the nearest of his persecutors. Surely they could not reach him here. With the tangled brushwood behind him, he was as safe as a rabbit at the mouth of his burrow. In the joy of his heart, he must needs dance in derision and snap his fingers at the foolish men who had let him slip. He threw back his head, howling at them like a dog, and at the instant an arrow struck him full in the throat and laid him dead among the bracken. There was a hush of surprised silence, and then a loud cheer burst from the archers. "'By the root of Beverley!' cried old Watt. "'I have not seen a finer roving shaft this many a year. "'In my own best day I could not have bettered it. "'Which have you loosed it?' "'It was Aylward of Tilford, Sumkin Aylward,' cried a score of voices, "'and the bowman, flushed at his own fame, was pushed to the front. "'Indeed, I would that it had been at a nobler mark,' said he. "'He might have gone free for me, "'but I could not keep my fingers from the string when he turned to jeer at us.' "'I see well that you are indeed a master bowman,' said old Watt and it is comfort to my soul to think that if I fall I leave such a man behind me to hold high the credit of our craft. Now, gather your shafts and on, for Sir Robert awaits us on the brow of the hill. All day Knowles and his men marched through the same wild and deserted country, inhabited only by these furtive creatures, hares to the strong and wolves to the weak, who hovered in the shadows of the wood. Ever and anon upon the tops of the hills they caught a glimpse of horsemen, who watched them from a distance, and vanished when approached. Sometimes bells rang an alarm from villages among the hills, and twice they passed castles which drew up their drawbridges at their approach, and lined their walls with hooting soldiers as they passed. The Englishmen gathered a few oxen and sheep from the pastures of each, but Knowles had no mind to break his strength upon stone walls, and so he went upon his way. Once at St. Mean they passed a great nunnery, girt with a high grey lichened wall, an oasis of peace in this desert of war, the black-robed nuns basking in the sun or working in the gardens, with the strong gentle hand of holy church shielding them ever from evil. The archers doffed caps to them as they passed, for the boldest and roughest dared not cross that line guarded by the dire ban and blight which was the one only force in the whole steel-ridden earth which could stand betwixt the weakling and the spoiler. The little army halted at St. Mean, and cooked its midday meal. It had gathered into its ranks again, and was about to start, when Knowles drew Nigel to one side. "'Nigel,' said he, "'it seems to me that I have seldom set eyes upon a horse which hath more power and promise of speed than this great beast of thine. 
"'It is indeed a noble steed, fair sir,' said Nigel. Betwixt him and his young leader there had sprung up great affection and respect since the day that they set foot in the basilisk. "'It will be the better if you stretch his limbs, for he grows over-heavy,' said the knight. "'Now mark me, Nigel. Yonder, betwixt the ash-tree and the red rock, what do you see on the side of the far hill?' "'There is a white dot upon it. Surely it is a horse.' "'I have marked it all morning, Nigel. "'This horseman has kept ever upon our flank, "'spying upon us, or waiting to make some attempt upon us. "'Now I should be right glad to have a prisoner, "'for it is my wish to know something of this countryside, "'and these peasants can speak neither French nor English. "'I would have you linger here in hiding when we go forward. "'This man will still follow us. "'When he does so, yonder wood will lie betwixt you and him. "'Do you ride round it?' and come upon him from behind. There is broad plain upon his left, and we will cut him off upon the right. If your horse be indeed the swifter, then you cannot fail to take him. Nigel had already sprung down, and was tightening Pommer's girth. Nay, there is no need of haste, for you cannot start until we are two miles upon our way. And above all, I pray you, Nigel, none of your knight-errant ways. It is this Rowan that I want, him and the news he can bring me. Think little of your own advancement, and much of the needs of the army. When you get him, ride westwards upon the sun, and you cannot fail to find the road. Nigel waited with Pommers under the shadow of the nunnery wall, horse and man chafing with impatience, whilst above them six round-eyed innocent nun faces looked down on this strange and disturbing vision from the outer world. At last the long column wound itself out of sight round a curve of the road and the white dot was gone from the bare green flank of the hill. Nigel bowed his steel head to the nuns, gave his bridle a shake, and bounded off upon his welcome mission. The round-eyed sisters saw a yellow horse and twinkling man sweep round the skirt of the wood, caught a last glimmer of him through the tree trunks, and paced slowly back to their pruning and their planting, their minds filled with the beauty and the terror of that outer world beyond the high grey lichen-mottled wall. Everything fell out, even as Knowles had planned. As Nigel rounded the oak forest, there, upon the farther side of it, with only good greensward between, was the rider upon the white horse. Already he was so near that Nigel could see him clearly, a young cavalier, proud in his bearing, clad in purple silk tunic, with a red curling feather in his low black cap. He wore no armour, but his sword gleamed at his side. He rode easily and carelessly, as one who cares for no man, and his eyes were forever fixed upon the English soldiers on the road. So intent was he upon them that he gave no thought to his own safety, and it was only when the low thunder of the great horse's hooves broke upon his ears that he turned in his saddle, looked very coolly and steadily at Nigel, then gave his own bridle a shake, and darted off, swift as a hawk, toward the hills upon the left. Pommers had met his match that day. The white horse, two parts Arab, bore the lighter weight, since Nigel was clad in full armour. For five miles over the open, neither gained a hundred yards upon the other. They had topped the hill and flew down the further side, the stranger continually turning in his saddle to have a look at his pursuer. There was no panic in his flight, but rather the amused rivalry with which a good horseman who is proud of his mount contends with one who has challenged him. Below the hill was a marshy plain, studded with great druidic stones, some prostrate, some erect, some bearing others across their tops like the huge doors of some vanished building. A path ran through the marsh with green rushes as a danger signal on either side of it. Across this path many of the huge stones were lying, but the white horse cleared them in its stride, and Pommers followed close upon his heels. Then came a mile of soft ground, where the lighter weight again drew to the front, but it ended in a dry upland, and once again Nigel gained. A sunken road crossed it, but the white cleared it with a mighty spring, and again the yellow followed. Two small hills lay before them, with a narrow gorge of deep bushes between. Nigel saw the white horse bounding chest-deep amid the underwood. Next instant its hind legs were high in the air, and the rider had been shot from its back. A howl of triumph rose from amidst the bushes, and a dozen wild figures, armed with club and with spear, rushed upon the prostrate man. "'A moi, Anglais! A moi!' cried a voice, 
and Nigel saw the young rider stagger to his feet, strike round him with his sword, and then fall once more before the rush of his assailants. There was a comradeship amongst men of gentle blood and bearing, which banded them together against all ruffianly or unchivalrous attack. These rude fellows were no soldiers. Their dress and arms, their uncouth cries and wild assault, marked them as banditti, such men as had slain the Englishmen upon the road. Waiting in narrow gorges with a hidden rope across the path, they watched for the lonely horseman as a fowler waits by his bird-trap, trusting that they could overthrow the steed and then slay the rider ere he had recovered from his fall. Such would have been the fate of the stranger, as of so many cavaliers before him, had Nigel not chanced to be close upon his heels. In an instant Pommers had burst through the group who had struck at the prostrate man, and in another two of the robbers had fallen before Nigel's sword. A spear rang on his breastplate, but one blow shore off its head, and a second, that of him who held it. In vain they thrust at the steel-girt man. His sword played round them like lightning, and the fierce horse ramped and swooped above them with pawing iron-shod hooves and eyes of fire. With cries and shrieks they flew off to right and left amidst the bushes, springing over boulders and darting under branches where no horseman could follow them. The foul crew had gone as swiftly and suddenly as it had come and save for four ragged figures littered amongst the trampled bushes, no sign remained of their passing. Nigel tethered Pommers to a thorn-bush, and then turned his attention to the injured man. The white horse had regained his feet, and stood whinnying gently as he looked down on his prostrate master. A heavy blow, half broken by his sword, had beaten him down, and left a great raw bruise upon his forehead. But a stream gurgled through the gorge, and a capful of water dashed over his face brought the senses back to the injured man. He was a mere stripling, with the delicate features of a woman and a pair of great violet-blue eyes which looked up presently with a puzzled stare into Nigel's face. "'Who are you?' he asked. "'Ah, ah yes, I call you to mind. You are the young Englishman who chased me on the great yellow horse.' By Our Lady of Rocamador, whose vernicle is around my neck, I could not have believed that any horse could have kept at the heels of Charlemagne so long. But I will wager you a hundred crowns, Englishman, that I lead you over a five-mile course. Nay, said Nigel, we will wait till you can back a horse ere we talk of racing it. I am Nigel of Tilford, of the family of Loring, a squire by rank, and the son of a knight. How are you called, young sir? I also am a squire by rank and the son of a knight. I am Raoul de la Roche, Pierre de Bras, whose father writes himself Lord of Grosbois, a free vavasseur of the noble Count of Toulouse, and the right of Fossa and of Furca, the high justice, the middle, and the low. He sat up and rubbed his eyes. Englishman, you have saved my life, as I would have saved yours, had I seen such yelping dogs set upon a man of blood and of coat armour. But now I am yours, and what is your sweet will? When you are fit to ride, you will come back with me to my people. Alas, I feared that you would say so. Had I taken you, Nigel, that is your name, is it not? Had I taken you, I would not have acted thus. How then would you have ordered things? asked Nigel, much taken with the frank and debonair manner of his captive. I would not have taken advantage of such a mischance as has befallen me, which has put me in your power. I would have given you a sword, and beat you in a fair fight, so that I might send you to give greeting to my dear lady, and show her the deeds which I do for her fair sake. "'Indeed, your words are both good and fair,' said Nigel. "'By St. Paul, I cannot call to mind that I have ever met a man who bore himself better. But since I am in my armour, and you without, I see not how we can debate the matter.' "'Surely, gentle Nigel, you could doff your armour. Then have I only my underclothes? Nay, there shall be no unfairness there.' for I also will very gladly strip to my underclothes. Nigel looked wistfully at the Frenchman, but he shook his head. Alas, it may not be, said he. The last words that Sir Robert said to me were that I was to bring you to his side, for he would have speech with you. Ah, would that I could do what you ask, for I also have a fair lady to whom I would fain send you. What use are you to me, Royal, since I have gained no honour in the taking of you? How is it with you now? The young Frenchman had risen to his feet. "'Do not take my sword,' he said. "'I am yours, rescue or no rescue. "'I think, now that I could mount my horse, "'though indeed my head still rings like a cracked bell.' 
Nigel had lost all traces of his comrades, but he remembered Sir Robert's words that he should ride upon the sun with the certainty that sooner or later he would strike upon the road. As they jogged slowly along over undulating hills, the Frenchman shook off his hurt, and the two chatted merrily together. "'I had but just come to France,' said he, "'and I had hoped to win honour in this country, "'for I have ever heard that the English are very hardy men "'and excellent people to fight with. "'My mules and my baggage are at Evron, "'but I rode forth to see what I could see, "'and I chanced upon your army moving down the road, "'so I coasted it in the hopes of some profit or adventure. "'Then you came after me, "'and I would have given all the gold goblets upon my father's table "'if I had my harness so that I could have turned upon you. I have promised the Countess Beatrice that I will send her an Englishman or two to kiss her hands. One might perchance have a worse fate, said Nigel. Is this fair dame your betrothed? She is my love, answered the Frenchman. We are but waiting for the Count to be slain in the wars, and then we mean to marry. And this lady of thine, Nigel, I would that I could see her. Perchance you shall, fair sir, said Nigel, for all that I have seen of you fills me with a desire to go further with you. It is in my mind that we might turn this thing to profit and to honour, uh, for when Sir Robert has spoken with you, I am free to do with you as I will. And what will you do, Nigel? We shall surely try some small deed upon each other, so that either I shall see the Lady Beatrice, or you the Lady Mary. Nay, thank me not, for like yourself, I have come to this country in search of honour, and I know not where I may better find it than at the end of your sword-point. My good lord and master, Sir John Chandos, has told me many times that never yet did he meet French knight nor squire that he did not find great pleasure and profit from their company, and now I very clearly see that he has spoken the truth. For an hour these two friends rode together, the Frenchman pouring forth the praises of his lady, whose glove he produced from one pocket, her garter from his vest, and her shoe from his saddle-bag. She was blonde, and when he heard that Mary was dark, he would fain stop then and there to fight the question of colour. He talked, too, of his great chateau at Lota, by the headwaters of the pleasant Garonne, of the hundred horses in the stables, and the seventy hounds in the kennels, the fifty hawks in the mews. His English friend should come there when the wars were over, and what golden days would be theirs. Nigel, too, with his English coldness thawing before this young sunbeam of the south, found himself talking of the heather slopes of Surrey, of the forest of Woolmer, even of the sacred chambers of Cosford. But as they rode onward towards the sinking sun, their thoughts far away in their distant homes, their horses striding together, there came that which brought their minds back in an instant to the perilous hillsides of Brittany. It was the long blast of a trumpet, blown from somewhere on the farther side of a ridge towards which they were riding. A second long-drawn note from a distance answered it. "'It is your camp,' said the Frenchman. "'Nay,' said Nigel, we have pipes with us and a naker or two, but I have heard no trumpet call from our ranks. It behooves us to take heed, for we know not what may be before us. Ride this way, I pray you, that we may look over and yet ourselves be unseen. Some scattered boulders crowned the height, and from behind them the two young squires could see the long rocky valley beyond. Upon a knoll was a small square building with a battlement round it. Some distance from it towered a great dark castle, as massive as the rocks on which it stood, with one strong keep at the corner and four long lines of maculated walls. Above a great banner flew proudly in the wind, with some device which glowed red in the setting sun. Nigel shaded his eyes and stared with a wrinkled brow. "'It is not the arms of England, nor yet the lilies of France, nor is it the ermine of Brittany,' said he. He who holds this castle fights for his own hand, since his own device flies above it. Surely it is a head jewels on an argent field. The bloody head on a silver tray, cried the Frenchman. Was I not warned against him? This is not a man, friend Nigel. It is a monster who wars upon English, French, and all Christendom. Have you not heard of the butcher of La Brohiniere? Nay, I have not heard of him. His name is accursed in France. Have I not been told also that he put to death this very year Gilles de Saint-Paul, a friend of the English king? Yes, in very truth it comes back to my mind now that I heard something of this matter in Calais before we started. There he dwells, 
and God guard you if ever you pass under yonder portal, for no prisoner has ever come forth alive. Since these wars began he has been a king to himself, and the plunder of eleven years lies in yonder cellars. How can justice come to him when no man knows who owns the land? But when we have packed you all back to your island, by the blessed mother of God we have a heavy debt to pay to the man who dwells in yonder pile. But even as they watched, the trumpet call burst forth once more. It came not from the castle, but from the farther end of the valley. It was answered by a second call from the walls. Then, in a long, straggling line, there came a wild troop of marauders, streaming homeward from some foray. In the van, at the head of a body of spearmen, rode a tall and burly man, clad in brazen armour, so that he shone like a golden image in the slanting rays of the sun. His helmet had been loosened from his gorget, and was held before him on his horse's neck. A great tangled beard flowed over his breastplate, and his hair hung down as far behind. A squire at his elbow bore high the banner of the bleeding head. Behind the spearmen were a line of heavily laden mules, and on either side of them a drove of poor country folk who were being herded into the castle. Lastly came a second strong troop of mounted spearmen, who conducted a score or more of prisoners who marched together in a solid body. Nigel stared at them, and then, springing on his horse, he urged it along the shelter of the ridge so as to reach unseen a spot which was close to the castle gate. He had scarce taken up his new position when the cavalcade reached the drawbridge, and amid yells of welcome from those upon the wall, filed in a thin line across it. Nigel stared hard once more at the prisoners in the rear, and so absorbed was he by the sight that he had passed the rocks and was standing sheer upon the summit. "'By St. Paul!' he cried. "'It must indeed be so. "'I see their russet jackets. "'They are English archers.' "'As he spoke, the hindmost one, "'a strongly built, broad-shouldered man, "'looked round and saw the gleaming figure above him upon the hill "'with open helmet and the five roses glowing upon his breast. "'With a sweep of his hands he had thrust his guardians aside "'and for a moment was clear of the throng. "'Squire Loring! Squire Loring!' he cried. "'It is I, Aylward the archer!' It is I, Samkin Aylward. The next minute a dozen hands had seized him. His cries were muffled with a gag, and he was hurled, the last of the band, through the black and threatening archway of the gate. Then, with a clang, the two iron wings came together. The portcullis swung upward, and captives and captors, robbers and booty, were all swallowed up within the grim and silent fortress. End of chapter 19Chapter twenty of Sir Nigel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Clive Catterall. Sir Nigel by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Chapter twenty. How the English attempted the castle of La Brunière. For some minutes Nigel remained motionless upon the crest of the hill, his heart like lead within him, and his eyes fixed upon the huge grey walls which contained his unhappy henchmen. He was roused by a sympathetic hand upon his shoulder, and the voice of his young prisoner in his ear. "'Pest!' said he. "'They have some of your birds in their cage, have they not?' "'What then, my friend? Keep your heart high. Is it not the chance of war? Today them, tomorrow thee, and death at last for us all?' and yet I had rather they were in any hands than those of Oliver the Butcher. "'By St. Paul, we cannot suffer it!' cried Nigel distractedly. "'This man has come with me from my own home. He has stood between me and death before now. It goes to my very heart that he should call upon me in vain. I pray you, Raoul, to use your wits, for mine are all curdled in my head. Tell me what I should do, and how I may bring him help.' The Frenchman shrugged his shoulders. "'as easy to get a lamb unscathed out of a wolf's lair "'as a prisoner safe from La Brunière. "'Nay, Nigel, whither do you go? "'Have you indeed taken leave of your wits?' "'The squire had spurred his horse down the hillside "'and never halted until he was within a bowshot of the gate. 
The French prisoner followed hard behind him, with a buzz of reproaches and expostulations. "'You are mad, Nigel!' he cried. "'What do you hope to do, then? Would you carry the castle with your own hands? Halt, man! Halt in the name of the Virgin!' But Nigel had no plan in his head, and only obeyed the fevered impulse to do something to ease his thoughts. He paced his horse up and down, waving his spear and shouting insults and challenges to the garrison. Over the high wall a hundred jeering faces looked down upon him. So rash and wild was his action that it seemed to those within to mean some trap, so the drawbridge was still held high, and none ventured forth to seize him. A few long-range arrows pattered on the rocks, and then, with a deep, booming sound, a huge stone, hurled from a mangonel, sang over the head of the two squires, and crushed into splinters among the boulders behind them. The Frenchman seized Nigel's bridle, and forced him further from the gateway. "'By the dear virgin!' he cried. "'I care not to have those pebbles around my ears, yet I cannot go back alone, so it is very clear, my crazed comrade, that you must come also. Now we are beyond their reach.' "'But see, my friend Nigel, who are those who crown the height?' The sun had sunk behind the western ridge, but the glowing sky was fringed at its lower edge by a score of ruddy twinkling points. A body of horsemen showed hard and black upon the bare hill. Then they dipped down the slope into the valley, whilst a band of footmen followed behind. "'They are my people,' cried Nigel joyously. "'Come, my friend, hasten that we may take counsel what we should do.' Sir Robert Knowles rode a bowshot in front of his men, and his brow was as black as night. Beside him, with crestfallen face, his horse bleeding, his armour dinted and soiled, was the hot-headed knight, Sir James Astley. A fierce discussion raged between them. "'I have done my devoir as best I might,' said Astley. "'Alone I had ten of them at my sword-point. I know not how I have lived to tell it.' "'What is your devoir to me? Where are my thirty bowmen?' cried Knowles in bitter wrath. Ten lie dead upon the ground, and twenty are worse than dead in yonder castle. And all because you must needs show all men how bold you are, and ride into a bushman such as a child could see. Alas, for my own folly that ever I should have trusted such a one as you with the handling of men. By God, Sir Robert, you shall answer to me for those words, cried Astley with a choking voice. Never has a man dared to speak to me as you have done this day. As long as I hold the king's order, I shall be master, and by the Lord I shall hang you, James, on a near tree, if I have further cause of offence. How now, Nigel? I see by yonder white horse that you at least have not failed me. I will speak with you anon. Percy, bring up your men, and let us gather round this castle, for, as I hope for my soul's salvation, I will not leave until I have my archers, or the head of him who holds them. That night the English lay thick round the fortress of La Brouinière so that none might come forth from it. But if none could come forth, it was hard to see how any could win their way in, for it was full of men, the walls were high and strong, and a deep, dry ditch girt it round. But the hatred and the fear which its master had raised over the whole countryside could now be plainly seen, for during the night the brushwood men and the villagers came in from all parts with offers of such help as they could give for the intaking of the castle. Knowles set them cutting bushes and tying them into faggots. When morning came, he rode out before the wall, and he held counsel with his knights and squires as to how he should enter in. "'By noon,' said he, "'we shall have so many faggots that we may make our way over the ditch. Then we will beat in the gates, and so win a footing.' The young Frenchman had come with Nigel to the conference, and now, amid the silence which followed the leader's proposal, he asked if he might be heard. He was clad in the brazen armour which Nigel had taken from the red ferret. "'It may be that it is not for me to join in your counsel,' said he, "'seeing that I am a prisoner and a Frenchman. "'But this man is the enemy of all, "'and we of France owe him a debt even as you do, "'since many a good Frenchman has died in his cellars. "'For this reason I crave to be heard.' "'We will hear you,' said Knowles. "'I have come from Evrin yesterday,' said he. Sir Henry Spinfor, Sir Peter Leroy, and many other brave knights and squires lie there, with a good company of men, all of whom would very gladly join with you to destroy this butcher and his castle. For it is well known amongst us that his deeds are neither good nor fair. There are also bombards which we could drag over the hills, and so beat down this iron gate. If you so order it, I will ride to Evrin and bring my companions back with me. Indeed, Robert, said Percy, it is in my mind that this Frenchman speaks very wisely and well. "'And when we have taken the castle, what then?' asked Knowles. 
"'Then you could go upon your way, fair sir, and we upon ours. "'Or, if it please you better, you could draw together on yonder hill, "'and we on this one, so that the valley lies between us. "'Then, if any cavalier wished to advance himself, "'or to shed a vow and exalt his lady, "'an opening might be found for him. "'Surely it would be shame if so many brave men drew together, "'and no small deed were to come of it.' Nigel clasped his captive's hand to show his admiration and esteem, but Knolles shook his head. "'Things are not ordered thus, save in the tales of the minstrels,' said he. "'I have no wish that your people at Evran should know our numbers and our plans. "'I am not in this land for knight errantry, but I am here to make head against the king's enemies. "'Has no one aught else to say?' Percy pointed to the small outlying fortalice upon the knoll, on which also flew the flag of the bloody head. This smaller castle, Robert, is of no great strength, and cannot hold more than fifty men. It is built, as I conceive it, that no one should seize the high ground and shoot down into the other. Why should we not turn all our strength upon it, since it is the weaker of the twain? But again the young leader shook his head. If I should take it, said he, I am still no nearer to my desire, nor will it avail me in getting back my bowmen. It may cost a score of men, and what profit shall I have from it? Had I bombards... I might place them on yonder hill, but having none, it is of little use to me. It may be, said Nigel, that they have scant food or water, and so must come forth to fight us. I have made inquiry of the peasants, Knowles answered, and they are of one mind that there is a well within the castle and a great store of food. Nay, gentlemen, there is no way before us save to take it by arms, and no spot where we can attempt it save through the great gate. Soon we will have so many faggots that we can cast them down into the ditch, and so win our way across. I have ordered them to cut a pine tree on the hill, and shear the branches, so that we may beat down the gate with it. But what is now amiss, and why do they run forward to the castle? A buzz had risen from the soldiers in the camp, and they all crowded in one direction, rushing toward the castle wall. The knights and squires rode after them, and when in view of the main gate, the cause of the disturbance lay before them. On the tower above the portal three men were standing in the garb of English archers, ropes round their necks, and their hands bound behind them. Their comrades surged below them with cries of recognition and of pity. "'It is Ambrose!' cried one. "'Surely it is Ambrose of Ingleton!' "'Yes, in truth, I see his yellow hair. And the other, him with the beard, it is Lockwood of Skipton. Alas for his wife, who keeps the booth by the bridgehead of Ribble. I wot not who the third may be.' "'It is little Johnny Allspey, the youngest man in the company,' cried old Watt, with the tears running down his cheeks. "'Twas I who brought him from his home. Alas, alas! Foul fare the day that ever I coaxed him from his mother's side, that he might perish in a far land!' There was a sudden flourish of a trumpet, and the drawbridge fell. Across it strode a portly man with a faded herald's coat. He halted warily upon the farther side, and his voice boomed like a drum. "'I would speak with your leader,' he cried. Knowles rode forward. "'Have I your knightly word that I may advance unscathed "'with all courteous entreaty, as befits a herald?' Knowles nodded his head. "'The man came slowly and pompously forward. "'I am the messenger and liege servant,' said he, "'of the high baron Oliver de Saint-Yvon, "'lord of La Brunière. "'He bids me to say that if you continue your journey "'and molest him no further,' he will engage upon his part to make no further attack upon you. As to the men whom he holds, he will enroll them in his own honourable service, for he has need of longbowmen, and has heard much of their skill. But if you constrain him, or cause him further displeasure by remaining before his castle, he hereby gives you warning that he will hang these three men over his gateway, and every morning another three, until all have been slain. This he has sworn upon the rood of Calvary, and as he has said, so he will do upon jeopardy of his soul. Robert Knowles looked grimly at the messenger. You may thank the saints that you have my promise, said he. Else would I have stripped that lying tabard from thy back, and the skin beneath it from thy bones, that thy master might have a fitting answer to his message. Tell him that I hold him and all that are within his castle as hostage for the lives of my men, and that, should he dare to do them scathe, he and every man that is with him shall hang upon his battlements. Go, and go quickly, lest my patience fail. There was that in Knoll's cold grey eyes, and in his manner of speaking those last words, which sent the portly envoy back at a quicker gait than he had come. As he vanished into the gloomy arch of the gateway, 
the drawbridge swung up with a creak and a rattle behind him. A few minutes later a rough-bearded fellow stepped out over the portal where the condemned archers stood, and, seizing the first by the shoulders, he thrust him over the wall. A cry burst from the man's lips, and a deep groan from those of his comrades below, as he fell with a jerk, which sent him halfway up to the parapet again, and then, after dancing like a child's toy, swung slowly backward and forward, with limp limbs and twisted neck. The hangman turned and bowed in mock reverence to the spectators beneath him. He had not yet learned in a land of puny archers how sure and how strong is the English bow. Half a dozen men, old Watt amongst them, had run forward toward the wall. They were too late to save their comrades, but at least their deaths were speedily avenged. The man was in the act of pushing off the second prisoner when an arrow crashed through his head, and he fell stone dead upon the parapet. But even in falling he had given the fatal thrust, and a second russet figure swung beside the first against the dark background of the castle wall. There only remained the young lad, Johnny Allspay, who stood shaking with fear, an abyss below him, and the voices of those who would hurl him over it behind. There was a long pause before anyone would come forth to dare those deadly arrows. Then a fellow, crouching double, ran forward from the shelter, keeping the young archer's body as a shield between him and danger. "'Aside, John! Aside!' cried his comrades from below. The youth sprang as far as the rope would allow him, and slipped it half over his face in the effort. Three arrows flashed past his side, and two of them buried themselves in the body of the man behind. A howl of delight burst from the spectators as he dropped first upon his knees, and then upon his face. A life for a life was no bad bargain. But it was only a short respite which the skill of his comrades had given to the young archer. Over the parapet there appeared a ball of brass, then a pair of great brazen shoulders, and lastly the full figure of an armoured man. He walked to the edge, and they heard his hoarse guffaw of laughter as the arrows clanged and clattered against his impenetrable mail. He slapped his breastplate as he jeered at them. Well he knew that at the distance no dart ever sped by mortal hands could cleave through his plates of metal. So he stood, the great burly butcher of La Brauvinière, with head uptossed, laughing insolently at his foes. Then, with slow and ponderous tread, he walked towards his boy victim, seized him by the ear, and dragged him across so that the rope might be straight. Seeing that the noose had slipped across the face, he tried to push it down, but the mailed glove hampering him, he pulled it off, and grasped the rope above the lad's head with his naked hand. Quick as a flash, old Watt's arrow had sped, and the butcher sprang back with a howl of pain, his hand skewered by a clothyard shaft. As he shook it furiously at his enemies, a second grazed his knuckles. With a brutal kick of his metal-shod feet, he hurled young Allspay over the edge, looked down for a few moments at his death agonies, and then walked slowly from the parapet, nursing his dripping hand, the arrow still ringing loudly upon his back-piece as he went. The archers below, enraged at the death of their comrades, leapt and howled like a pack of ravening wolves. "'By St. Dunstan,' said Percy, looking round at their flushed faces, "'if ever we are to carry it, now is the moment, for these men will not be stopped if hate can take them forward.' "'You are right, Thomas,' cried Knowles. "'Gather together twenty men-at-arms, each with his shield to cover him. Astley, do you place the bowmen so that no head may show at window or parapet?' "'Nigel, I pray you to order the country folk forward with their fardels of faggots. "'Let the others bring up the lopped pine-trees which lies yonder behind the horse-lines. Ten men-at-arms can bear it on the right, and ten on the left, having shields over their heads. "'The gate once down, let every man rush in, and God help the better cause.' "'Swiftly, and yet quietly, the dispositions were made, "'for these were old soldiers whose daily trade was war.' In little groups the archers formed in front of each slit or crevice in the walls, whilst others scanned the battlements with wary eyes, and sped an arrow at every face which gleamed for an instant above them. The garrison shot forth a shower of crossbow bolts, and an occasional stone from their engine, but so deadly was the hail which rained upon them, that they had no time to dwell upon their aim, and their discharges were wild and harmless. Under cover of the shafts of the bowmen, a line of peasants ran unscathed to the edge of the ditch, each hurling in the bundle which he bore in his arms, and then hurrying back for another one. 
In twenty minutes a broad pathway of faggots lay level with the ground upon one side and the gate upon the other. With the loss of two peasants slain by bolts and one archer crushed by a stone, the ditch had been filled up. All was ready for the battering ram. With a shout, twenty picked men rushed forward with the pine tree under their arms, the heavy end turned towards the gate. The arbalesters on the tower leaned over and shot into the midst of them, but could not stop their advance. Two dropped, but the others, raising their shields, ran onward, still shouting, crossed the bridge of faggots, and came with a thundering crash against the door. It splintered from base to arch, but kept its place. Swinging their mighty weapon, the storming party thudded and crashed upon the gate, every blow loosening and widening the cracks which rent it from end to end. The three knights, with Nigel, the Frenchman Raoul, and the other squires, stood beside the ram, cheering on the men, and chanting to the rhythm of the swing with a loud HA! at every blow. A great stone loosened from the parapet, roared through the air, and struck Sir James Astley and another of the attackers. But Nigel and the Frenchman had taken their places in an instant, and the ram thudded and smashed with greater energy than ever. Another blow, and another. The lower part was staving inward, but the great central bar still held firm. Surely another minute would beat it from its sockets. But suddenly from above there came a great deluge of liquid. A hogshead of it had been tilted from the battlements, until soldiers, bridge, and ram were equally drenched in yellow slime. Knowles rubbed his gauntlet in it, held it to his visor, and smelled it. "'Back! back!' he cried. "'Back before it is too late!' There was a small barred window above their heads at the side of the gate. A ruddy glare shone through it, and then a blazing torch was tossed down upon them. In a moment the oil had caught, and the whole place was a sheet of flame. The fir tree they carried, the faggots beneath them, their very weapons were all in a blaze. To right and left the men sprang down into the dry ditch, rolling with screams upon the ground in their endeavour to extinguish the flames. The knights and squires, protected by their armour, strove hard, stamping and slapping, to each of those who had but leather jacks to shield their bodies. From above, a ceaseless shower of darts and of stones were poured down upon them, whilst on the other hand the archers, seeing the greatness of the danger, ran up to the edge of the ditch, and shot fast and true at every face which showed above the wall. Scorched, wearied, and bedraggled, the remains of the storming party clambered out of the ditch as best they could, clutching at the friendly hands held down to them, and so limped their way back amid the taunts and howls of their enemies. A long pile of smouldering cinders was all that remained of their bridge, and on it lay Astley and six other red-hot men glowing in their armour. Knowles clinched his hands as he looked back at the ruin that was wrought, and then surveyed the group of men who stood or lay around him, nursing their burned limbs, and scowling up at the exultant figures who waved on the castle wall. Badly scorched himself, the young leader had no thought for his own injuries in the rage and grief which racked his soul. "'We will build another bridge,' he cried. "'Set the peasants binding faggots once more.' But a thought had flashed through Nigel's mind. "'See, fair sir,' said he, "'the nails of yonder door are red-hot, and the wood as white as ashes. Surely we can break our way through it.' "'By the Virgin, you speak truly,' cried the French squire. "'If we can cross the ditch, the gate will not stop us. Come, Nigel.' For our fair lady's sakes, I will race you who will reach it first, England or France. Alas for all the wise words of the good Chandos. Alas for all the lessons in order and discipline learned from the wary Knolls. In an instant, forgetful of all things but this noble challenge, Nigel was running at the top of his speed for the burning gate. Close at his heels was the Frenchman, blowing and gasping as he rushed along in his brazen armour. Behind came a stream of howling archers and men-at-arms, like a flood which has broken its dam. Down they slipped into the ditch, rushed across it, and clambered on each other's backs up the opposite side. Nigel, Raoul, and two archers gained a foothold in front of the burning gate at the same moment. With blows and kicks they burst it to pieces, and dashed with a yell of triumph through the dark archway beyond. For a moment they thought with mad rapture that the castle was carried. A dark tunnel lay before them, down which they rushed. But alas, at the farther end it was blocked by a second gateway, as strong as that which had been burned. In vain they beat upon it with their swords and axes. On each side the tunnel was pierced with slits, and the crossbow bolts discharged at only a few yards' distance crashed through armour as if it were cloth, and laid man after man upon the stones. 
They raged and leapt before the great iron-clamped barrier, but the wall itself was as easy to tear down. It was bitter to draw back, but it was madness to remain. Nigel looked round and saw that half his men were down. At the same moment Raoul sank with a gasp at his feet, a bolt driven to its socket through the links of the camail which guarded his neck. Some of the archers, seeing that certain death awaited them, were already running back to escape from the fatal passage. "'By St. Paul!' cried Nigel hotly. "'Would you leave our wounded where this butcher may lay his hands upon them? Let the archers shoot inwards, and hold them back from the slits. Now, let each man raise one of our comrades, lest we leave our honour in the gate of this castle.' With a mighty effort he had raised Raoul upon his shoulders, and staggered with him to the edge of the ditch. Several men were waiting below where the steep bank shielded them from the arrows, and to them Nigel handed down his wounded friend, and each archer, in turn, did the same. Again and again Nigel went back until no one lay in the tunnel save seven who had died there. Thirteen wounded were laid in the shelter of the ditch, and there they must remain until night came to cover them. Meanwhile the bowmen on the farther side protected them from attack, and also prevented the enemy from all attempts to build up the outer gate. The gaping, smoke-blackened arch was all that they could show for a loss of thirty men. But that, at least, Knowles was determined to keep. Burned and bruised, but unconscious of either pain or fatigue for the turmoil of his spirit within him, Nigel knelt by the Frenchman and loosed his helmet. The girlish face of the young squire was white as chalk, and the haze of death was gathering over his violet eyes, but a faint smile played round his lips as he looked up at his English comrade. "'I shall never see Beatrice again,' he whispered. "'I pray you, Nigel, that when there is a truce "'you will journey as far as my father's chateau "'and tell him how his son died. "'Young Gaston will rejoice, "'for to him come the land and the coat, "'the war-cry and the prophet. "'See them, Nigel, and tell them that I was as forward as the others.' "'Indeed, Raoul, no man could have carried himself "'with more honour or won more worship than you have done this day.' I will do your behest when the time comes. Surely you are happy, Nigel, the dying squire murmured, for this day has given you one more deed which you may lay at the feet of your lady-love. It might be so had we carried the gate, Nigel answered sadly. But by St. Paul I cannot count it a deed where I have come back with my purpose unfulfilled. But this is no time, Raoul, to talk of my small affairs. If we take the castle, and I bear a good part of it, then perchance all this may indeed avail. The Frenchman sat up with that strange energy which comes often as the harbinger of death. You will win your Lady Mary, Nigel, and your great deeds will not be three, but a score, so that in all Christendom there shall be no man of blood and coat armour who has not heard your name and your fame. This I tell you, I, Raoul de la Roche, Pierre de la Bras, dying upon the field of honour. And now kiss me, sweet friend, and lay me back, for the mists close around me, and I am gone. With tender hands the squire lowered his comrade's head. But even as he did so there came a choking rush of blood, and the soul had passed. So died a gallant cavalier of France. And Nigel, as he knelt in the ditch beside him, prayed that his own end might be as noble and as debonair. End of chapter 20Chapter 21. How the Second Messenger Went to Cosford Under cover of night the wounded men were lifted from the ditch and carried back, whilst pickets of archers were advanced to the very gate so that none should rebuild it. Nigel, sick at heart over his own failure, the death of his prisoner, and his fears for Aylward, crept back into camp, but his cup was not yet full, for Knolls was waiting for him with a tongue which cut like a whiplash. Who was he, a raw squire, that he should lead an attack without orders? See what his crazy knight-errantry had brought about? Twenty men had been destroyed by it, and nothing gained. Their blood was on his head. Chandos should hear of his conduct. He should be sent back to England when the castle had fallen. 
Such were the bitter words of Knowles, the more bitter because Nigel felt in his heart that he had indeed done wrong, and that Chandos would have said the same, though perchance in kinder words. He listened in silent respect, as his duty was, and then, having saluted his leader, he withdrew apart, threw himself down amongst the bushes, and wept the hottest tears of his life, sobbing bitterly with his face between his hands. He had striven hard, and yet everything had gone wrong with him. He was bruised, burned, and aching from head to foot. Yet so high as the spirit above the body that all was nothing compared to the sorrow and shame which racked his soul. But a little thing changed the current of his thoughts and brought some peace to his mind. He had slipped off his mail gauntlets, and as he did so, his fingers lighted upon the tiny bangle which Mary had fastened there when they stood together upon St. Catherine's Hill on the Guildford Road. He remembered the motto, curiously worked in filigree of gold. It ran, Fais ce que dois, à vienne que pourra, c'est commande au chevalier. The words rang in his weary brain. He had done what seemed right, come what might. It had gone awry, it is true, but all things human may do that. If he had carried the castle, he felt that Knowles would have forgiven and forgotten all else. If he had not carried it, it was no fault of his. No man could have done more. If Mary could see, she would surely have approved. Dropping into sleep, he saw her dark face, shining with pride and with pity, stooping over him as he lay. She stretched out her hand in his dream, and touched him on the shoulder. He sprang up and rubbed his eyes, for the fact had woven itself into dream in the strange way that it does, and someone was, indeed, leaning over him in the gloom, and shaking him from his slumbers. But the gentle voice and soft touch of the Lady Mary had changed suddenly to the harsh accents and rough grip of Black Simon, the fierce Norfolk man-at-arms. "'Surely you are Squire Loring,' he said, peering close to his face in the darkness. "'I am he. What then?' "'I have searched through the camp for you, but when I saw the great horse tethered near the bushes, I thought you would be found hard by. I have a word with you. Speak on. This man, Aylward, the bowman, was my friend, and it is the nature that God has given me to love my friends, even as I hate my foes. He is also thy servant, and it has seemed to me that you love him also. I have good cause to do so.' "'Then you and I, Squire Loring, have more reason to strive on his behalf than any of these others, "'who think more of taking the castle than of saving those who are captives within. "'Do you not see that such a man as this robber lord would, when all else had failed him, "'most surely cut the throats of his prisoners at the last instant before the castle fell, "'knowing well that, come what might, he would have short shrift himself? "'Is that not certain?' "'By St. Paul, I had not thought of it.' "'I was with you, hammering at the inner gate,' said Simon. "'And yet, once, when I thought that it was giving way, "'I said in my heart, "Goodbye, bye Samkin. "'I shall never see you more. "'This baron has gall in his soul, "'even as I have myself. "'Do you think that I would give up my prisoners alive, "'if I were constrained so to do? "'No, no. "'Had we won our way this day, "'it would have been the death-stroke for them all.' "'It may be that you are right, Simon,' said Nigel and the thought of it should assuage our grief. But if we cannot save them by taking the castle, then surely they are lost indeed. It may be so, or it may not, Simon answered slowly. It is in my mind that if the castle were taken very suddenly, and in such a fashion that they could not foresee it, then perchance we might get the prisoners before they could do them scathe. Nigel bent forward eagerly, his hand on the soldier's arm. You have some plan in your mind, Simon. Tell me what it is. I had wished to tell Sir Robert, but he is preparing the assault for tomorrow, and would not be turned from his purpose. I have indeed a plan, but whether it be good or not I cannot say until I have tried it. But first, I will tell you what put it into my thoughts. Know then that this morning, when I was in yonder ditch, I marked one of their men upon the wall. He was a big man, with a white face, red hair, and a touch of St. Anthony's fire upon the cheek. "'But what has this to do with Aylward? "'I will show you. "'This evening, after the assault, "'I chanced to walk with some of my fellows "'round yonder small fort upon the knoll "'to see if we could spy a weak spot in it. "'Some of them came to the wall to curse us. "'And among them, whom should I see but a big man "'with a white face, red hair, 
and a touch of St. Antony's fire upon his cheek. "'What make you of that, Squire Nigel?' "'That this man had crossed from the castle to the fort. "'In good sooth it must indeed be so. "'There are not two such ken-speckled men in the world. "'But if he crossed from the castle to the fort, "'it was not above the ground, "'for our own people were between.' "'By St. Paul, I see your meaning,' cried Nigel. "'It is in your mind that there is a passage under the earth "'from one to the other. "'I am well sure of it. "'Then if we should take the small fort, "'we may pass down this tunnel "'and so carry the great castle also.' "'Such a thing might happen,' said Simon, "'and yet it is dangerous also, "'for surely those in the castle "'would hear our assault upon the fort "'and so be warned to bar the passage against us "'and to slay the prisoners before we should come.' "'What then is your read?' Yeah. "'Could we find where the tunnel lay, Squire Nigel? "'I know not what is to prevent us from digging down upon it "'and breaking into it, "'so that both fort and castle are at our mercy "'before either knows that we are there.' "'Nigel clapped his hands with joy. "'For God!' he cried. "'It is a most noble plan. "'But alas, Simon, "'I see not how we can tell the course of this passage "'or where we should dig.' "'I have peasants yonder with spades,' said Simon. "'There are two of my friends, Harding of Barnstable and West Country John, "'who are waiting for us with their gear. "'If you will come to lead us, Squire Nigel, "'we are ready to venture our bodies in the attempt.' "'What would Noll say in case they failed?' "'The thought flashed through Nigel's mind, "'but another came swiftly behind it. "'He would not venture further unless he found hopes of success. "'If he did venture further, he would put his life upon it. Giving that, he made amends for all errors. And if, on the other hand, success crowned their efforts, then Knolls would forgive his failure at the gateway. A minute later, every doubt banished from his mind, he was making his way through the darkness under the guidance of Black Simon. Outside the camp, the two other men-at-arms were waiting for them, and the four advanced together. Presently, a little group of figures loomed up in the darkness. It was a cloudy night, and a thin rain was falling which obscured both the castle and the fort, but a stone had been placed by Simon in the daytime, which assured that they were between the two. "'Is blind Andreas there?' asked Simon. "'Yes, kind sir, I am here,' said a voice. "'This man,' said Simon, "'was once rich and of good repute, but he was beggared by this robber lord, who afterwards put out his eyes, so that he has lived for many years in darkness at the charity of others.' "'How can he help us in our enterprise if he be indeed blind?' asked Nigel. "'It is for that very reason, fair lord, that he can be of greater service than any other man,' Simon answered. "'For it often happens that when a man has lost a sense, the good God will strengthen those that remain. Hence it is that Andreas has such ears that he can hear the sap in the trees, or the cheep of the mouse in its burrow. He has come to help us find the tunnel.' "'And I have found it,' said the blind man proudly. Here I have placed my staff upon the line of it. Twice, as I lay there with my ear to the ground, I have heard footsteps pass beneath me. I trust you make no mistake, old man, said Nigel. For answer, the blind man raised his staff and smote twice upon the ground, once to the right and once to the left. The one gave a dull thud, the other a hollow boom. Can you not hear that? he asked. Will you ask me now if I make mistake? "'Indeed. We are much beholden to you,' cried Nigel. "'Let the peasants dig, then, and as silently as they may. "'Do you keep your ear upon the ground, Andreas, "'so that if any one pass beneath us we shall be warned?' "'So, amid the driving rain, the little group toiled in the darkness. "'The blind man lay silent, flat upon his face, "'and twice they heard his warning hiss and stopped their work, "'whilst someone passed beneath. "'In an hour they had dug down to a stone arch, which was clearly the outer side of the tunnel roof. Here was a sad obstacle, for it might take long to loosen a stone, and if the work was not done by the break of day, then their enterprise was indeed hopeless. They loosened the mortar with a dagger, and at last dislodged one small stone, which enabled them to get at the others. Presently a dark hole, blacker than the night around them, yawned at their feet, and their swords could touch no bottom to it. They had opened the tunnel. "'I would fain enter at first, said Nigel. "'I pray you to lower me down.' They held him to the full length of their arms, and then, letting him drop, they heard him land safely beneath them. 
An instant later the blind man started up with a low cry of alarm. "'I hear steps coming,' said he. "'They are far off, but they draw nearer.' Simon thrust his head and neck down the hull. "'Squire Nigel,' he whispered, "'can you hear me?' "'I can hear you, Simon. Andreas says that someone comes.' "'Then cover the hole,' came the answer. "'Quick, I pray you, cover it over.' A mantle was stretched across it, so that no glimmer of light should warn the newcomer. The fear was that he might have heard the sound of Nigel's descent, but soon it was clear that he had not done so, for Andreas announced that he was still advancing. Presently Nigel could hear the distant thud of his feet. If he bore a lantern, all was lost, but no gleam of light appeared in the black tunnel, and still the footsteps drew nearer. Nigel breathed a prayer of thanks to all his guardian saints as he crouched close to the slimy wall, and waited breathless, his dagger in his hand. Nearer yet and nearer came the steps. He could hear the stranger's coarse breathing in the darkness. Then, as he brushed past, Nigel bounded upon him with a tiger spring. There was one gasp of astonishment, and not a sound more, for the squire's grip was on the man's throat, and his body was pinned motionless against the wall. "'Simon! Simon!' cried Nigel loudly. The mantle was moved from the hole. "'Have you a cord, or your belts linked together may serve?' One of the peasants had a rope, and Nigel soon felt it dangling against his hand. He listened, and there was no sound in the passage. For an instant he released the captive's throat. A torrent of prayers and entreaties came forth. The man was shaking like a leaf in the wind. Nigel pressed the point of his dagger against his face, and dared him to open his lips. Then he slipped the rope beneath his arms and tied it. "'Pull him up,' he whispered, and for an instant the grey glimmer above him was obscured. "'We have him, fair sir,' said Simon. "'Then drop me the rope and hold it fast.' A moment later Nigel stood among the group of men who had gathered round their captive. It was too dark to see him, and they dare not strike flint and steel. Simon passed his hand roughly over him, and felt a fat, clean-shaven face, and a cloth gabardine which hung to his ankles. "'Who are you?' he whispered. Speak the truth, and speak it low, if you would ever speak again. The man's teeth chattered in his head with cold and fright. I speak no English, he murmured. French, then, said Nigel. I am a holy priest of God. You caught the ban of holy church when you lay hands upon me. I pray you to let me go upon my way, for there are those whom I would shrive and housel. If they should die in sin, their damnation is upon you. How are you called, then? I am Dom Peter de Servol. "'De Serval, the archpriest who heated the brazier when they burnt out my eyes,' cried old Andreas. "'Of all the devils in hell there is none fouler than this one. Friends, friends, if I have done aught for you this night, I ask but one reward, that you let me have my will of this man.' But Nigel pushed the old man back. "'There is no time for this,' he said. "'Now, hark you, priest, if priest indeed you be. Your gown and tonsure will not save you if you play us false.' for we are here of a set purpose, and we will go forward with it, come what may. Answer me, and answer me truly, or it will be an ill night for you. In what part of the castle does this tunnel enter? In the lower cellar. What is at the end? An oaken door. Is it barred? Yes, it is barred. How would you have entered? I would have given the password. Who then would have opened? There is a guard within. And beyond him? Beyond him are the prison cells and the jailers. Who else would be afoot? None save a guard at the gate and another on the battlement. What then is the password? The man was silent. The password, fellow! The cold points of two daggers pricked his throat, but still he would not speak. Where is the blind man? asked Nigel. Here, Andreas, you can have him and do what you will with him. "'Nay, nay,' the priest whimpered. "'Keep him off me. Save me from blind Andreas. I will tell you everything.' "'The password, then, this instant.' "'It is Benedicite.' "'We have the password, Simon,' cried Nigel. "'Come, then, let us on to the farther end. These peasants will guard the priest, and they will remain here, lest we wish to send a message.' "'Nay, fair sir, it is in my mind that we can do better,' said Simon. "'Let us take the priest with us, so that he who is within may know his voice.' "'It is well thought of,' said Nigel. "'And first let us pray together, for indeed this night may well be our last.' He and the three men-at-arms knelt in the rain, and sent up their simple horizons, Simon still clutching tight to the prisoner's wrist. The priest fumbled in his breast, and drew something forth. "'It is the heart of the blessed confessor, St. Enoga,' said he. 
it may be that it will ease and to soil your souls, if you would wish to handle it. The four Englishmen passed the flat silver case from hand to hand, each pressing his lips devoutly upon it. Then they rose to their feet. Nigel was the first to lower himself down the hole, then Simon, then the priest, who was instantly seized by the other two. The men-at-arms followed them. They had scarcely moved away from the hole when Nigel stopped. Surely someone else came after us, said he. They listened, but no whisper or rustle came from behind them. For a minute they paused, and then resumed their journey through the dark. It seemed a long, long way, though in truth it was but a few hundred yards before they came to a door with a glimmer of yellow light around it which barred their passage. Nigel struck upon it with his hand. There was the rasping of a bolt, and then a loud voice. "'Is that you, priest?' "'Yes, it is I,' said the prisoner, in a quavering voice. "'Open, Arnold.' The voice was enough. There was no question of passwords. The door swung inward, and in an instant the janitor was cut down by Nigel and Simon. So sudden and so fierce was the attack, that save for the thud of his body, no sound was heard. A flood of light burst outward into the passage, and the Englishman stood with blinking eyes in its glare. In front of them lay a stone-flagged corridor, across which lay the dead body of the janitor. It had doors on either side of it, and another grated door at the farther end. A strange hubbub, a kind of low droning and whining, filled the air. Four men were standing, listening, full of wonder as to what this might mean, when a sharp cry came from behind them. The priest lay in a shapeless heap upon the ground, and the blood was rushing from his gaping throat. Down the passage, a black shadow in the yellow light, there fled a crouching man who clattered with a stick as he went. "'It is Andreas,' cried West Country Will. "'He has slain him.' "'Then it is he that I heard behind us,' said Nigel. "'Doubtless he was at our very heels in the darkness.' "'I fear that the priest's cry has been heard.' "'Nay,' said Simon, "'there are so many cries that one more may well pass. "'Let us take this lamp from the wall "'and see what sort of devil's den we have around us.' They opened the door upon the right, and so horrible a smell issued from it that they were driven back from it. The lamp which Simon held forward showed a monkey-like creature, mowing and grimacing in the corner, man or woman, none could tell, but driven crazy by loneliness and horror. In the other cell was a grey-bearded man, fettered to the wall, looking blankly before him, a body without a soul, yet with life still in him, for his dull eyes turned slowly in their direction. But it was from behind the central door at the end of the passage that the chorus of sad cries came which filled the air. Simon, said Nigel, before we go further we will take this outer door from its hinges. With it we will block this passage, so that at the worst we may hold our ground here until help comes. Do you back to the camp as fast as your feet can bear you. The peasants will draw you upward through the hole. Give my greetings to Sir Robert, and tell him that the castle is taken without fail if he comes this way with fifty men. Say that we have made a lodgment within the walls, and also tell him, Simon, that I would counsel him to make a stir before the gateway, so that the guard may be held there whilst we make good our footing behind them. Go, good Simon, and lose not a moment. But the man-at-arms shook his head. It is I who have brought you here, fair sir, and here I abide through fair and foul. But you speak wisely and well, for Sir Robert should indeed be told what is going forward, now that we have gone so far. Harding, do you go with all speed, and bear the gentle Nigel's message. Reluctantly the man-at-arms sped upon his errand. They could hear the racing of his feet and the low jingle of his harness until they died away in the tunnel. Then the three companions approached the door at the end. It was their intention to wait where they were until help should come, but suddenly amid the babble of cries within there broke forth an English voice shouting in torment. "'My God!' it cried. "'I pray you, comrades, for a cup of water, as you hope for Christ's mercy.' A shout of laughter and the thud of a heavy blow followed the appeal. All the hot blood rushed to Nigel's head at the sound, buzzing in his ears and throbbing in his temples. There are times when the fiery heart of a man must overbear the cold brain of a soldier. With one bound he was at the door, with another he was through it, the men-at-arms at his heels. So strange was the scene before them that for an instant all three stood motionless with horror and surprise. It was a great vaulted chamber brightly lit by many torches. At the farther end roared a great fire. In front of it three naked men were chained to posts in such a way that, flinch as they might, 
they could never get beyond the range of its scorching heat. Yet they were so far from it that no actual burn could be inflicted if they could but keep turning and shifting so as continually to present some fresh portion of their flesh to the flames. Hence they danced and whirled in front of the fire, tossing ceaselessly this way and that within the compass of their chains, wearied to death, their protruding tongues cracked and blackened with thirst, but unable for one instant to rest from their writhings and contortions. Even stranger was the sight at each side of the room, whence came that chorus of groans which had first struck upon the ears of Nigel and his companions. A line of great hogsheads were placed alongside the walls, and within each sat a man, his head protruding from the top. As they moved within, there was a constant splashing and washing of water. The white, wan faces all turned together as the door flew open, and a cry of amazement and of hope took the place of those long-drawn moans of despair. At the same instant, two fellows clad in black, who had been seated with a flagon of wine between them at a table near the fire, sprang wildly to their feet, staring with blank amazement at this sudden inrush. That instant of delay deprived them of their last chance of safety. Midway down the room was a flight of stone steps which led to the main door. Swift as a wildcat, Nigel bounded towards it, and gained the steps a stride or two before the jailers. They turned and made for the other which led to the passage, but Simon and his comrades were nearer to it than they. Two sweeping blows, two dagger thrusts into writhing figures, and the ruffians who worked the will of the butcher lay dead upon the floor of their slaughter-house. Oh, the buzz of joy and of prayer from all those white lips! Oh, the light of returning hope in all those sunken, weary eyes! One wild shout would have gone up had not Nigel's outstretched hands and warning voice hushed them to silence. He opened the door behind him. A curving newel staircase wound upward into the darkness. He listened, but no sound came down. There was a key in the outer lock of the iron door. He whipped it out and turned it on the inner side. The ground that they had gained was safe. Now they could turn to the relief of those poor fellows beside them. A few strong blows struck off the irons and freed the three dancers before the fire. With a husky croak of joy they rushed across to their comrades' water-barrels, plunged their heads in like horses, and drank and drank and drank. Then, in turn, the poor shivering wretches were taken out of the barrels, their skins bleached and wrinkled with long soaking, their bonds were torn from them, but cramped and fixed, their limbs refused to act, and they tumbled and twisted upon the floor in their efforts to reach Nigel and to kiss his hand. In a corner lay Aylward, dripping from his barrel and exhausted with cold and hunger. Nigel ran to his side and raised his head. The jug of wine from which the two jailers had drunk still stood upon their table. The squire placed it to the archer's lips, and he took a hearty pull at it. "'How is it with you now, Aylward? "'Better, squire, better, but may I never touch water again as long as I live. "'Alas, poor deacon has gone, and Stephen also, the life chilled out of them.' The cold is in the very marrow of my bones. I pray you, let me lean upon your arm as far as the fire, that I may warm the frozen blood and set it running in my veins once more. A strange sight it was to see these twenty naked men crouching in a half-circle round the fire, with their trembling hands extended to the blaze. Soon their tongues at least were thawed, and they poured out the story of their troubles with many a prayer and ejaculation to the saints for their safe delivery. No food had crossed their lips since they had been taken. The butcher had commanded them to join his garrison and to shoot upon their comrades from the wall. When they refused, he had set aside three of them for execution. The others had been dragged to the cellar, whither the leering torrent had followed them. Only one question he had asked them, whether they were of a hot-blooded nature or of a cold. Blows were showered upon them until they answered. Three had said cold, and had been condemned to the torment of the fire. The rest, who had said hot, were delivered up to the torture of the water-cask. Every few hours this man, or fiend, had come down to exult over their sufferings, and to ask them whether they were ready yet to enter his service. Three had consented, and were gone. But the others had all of them stood firm, two of them even to their death. Such was the tale to which Nigel and his comrades listened whilst they waited impatiently for the coming of Knowles and his men. Many an anxious look did they cast down the black tunnel, but no glimmer of light and no clash of steel came from its depths. Suddenly, however, a loud and measured sound broke upon their ears. 
it was a dull metallic clang, ponderous and slow, growing louder and ever louder, the tread of an armoured man. The poor wretches round the fire, all unnerved by hunger and suffering, huddled together with wan, scared faces, their eyes fixed in terror on the door. "'It is he,' they whispered. "'It is the butcher himself.' Nigel had darted to the door and listened intently. There were no footfalls save those of one man. Once sure of that, he softly turned the key in the lock. At the same instant there came a bull's bellow from without. "'Eve! Bertrand!' cried the voice. "'Can you not hear me coming, you drunken varlets? You shall cool your own heads in the water-casks, you lazy rascals. What? Not even now? Open, you dogs! Open, I say!' He had thrust down the latch and with a kick he flung the door wide and rushed inward. For an instant he stood motionless, a statue of dull yellow metal, his eyes fixed upon the empty casks and the huddle of naked men. Then, with the roar of a trapped lion, he turned, but the door had slammed behind him, and Black Simon, with grim figure and sardonic face, stood between. The butcher looked round him helplessly, for he was unarmed save for his dagger. Then his eyes fell upon Nigel's roses. "'You are a gentleman of coat-armour,' he cried. "'I surrender myself to you.' "'I will not take your surrender, you black villain,' said Nigel. "'Draw and defend yourself. Simon, give him your sword.' "'Nay, this is madness,' said the blunt man-at-arms. "'Why should I give the wasp a sting? "'Give it to him, I say. "'I cannot kill him in cold blood.' "'But I can,' yelled Aylward, who had come up from the fire. "'Comrades, comrades, by these ten finger-bones "'has he not taught us how cold blood should be warmed?' Like a pack of wolves they were on him, and he clanged upon the floor with a dozen frenzied naked figures clutching and clinging above him. In vain Nigel tried to pull them off. They were mad with rage, these tortured, starving men, their eyes fixed and glaring, their hair on end, their teeth gnashing with fury, while they tore at the howling, writhing man. Then, with a rattle and clatter, they pulled him across the room by his two ankles and dragged him into the fire. Nigel shuddered and turned away his eyes as he saw the brazen figure roll out and stagger to his knees, only to be hurled once more into the heart of the blaze. His prisoners screamed with joy and clapped their hands as they pushed him back with their feet until the armour was too hot for them to touch. Then, at last, he lay still, and glowed darkly red, whilst the naked men danced in a wild half-circle round the fire. But now, at last, the supports had come. Lights flashed, and armour gleamed down the tunnel. The cellar filled with armed men, while from above came the cries and turmoil of a feigned assault upon the gate. Led by Knowles and Nigel, the storming party rushed upward and seized the courtyard. The guard of the gate, taken in the rear, threw down their weapons and cried for mercy. The gate was thrown open, and the assailants rushed in, with hundreds of furious peasants at their heels. Some of the robbers died in hot blood, many in cold, but all died, for Knowles had vowed to give no quarter. Day was just breaking when the last fugitive had been hunted out and slain. From all sides came the yells and whoops of the soldiers, with the rending and riving of doors as they burst into the storerooms and treasure chambers. There was a joyous scramble amongst them, for the plunder of eleven years, gold and jewels, satins and velvets, rich plate and noble hangings, were all to be had for the taking. The rescued prisoners, their hunger appeased and their clothes restored, led the search for booty. Nigel, leaning on his sword by the gateway, saw Aylward totter past, a huge bundle under each arm, another slung over his back, and a smaller packet hanging from his mouth. He dropped it for a moment as he passed his young master. "'By these ten finger-bones, I am right glad that I came to the war, and no man could ask for a more goodly life,' said he. I have a present here for every girl in Tilford, and my father need never fear the frown of the sacrist of Waverley again. But how have you, Squire Loring? It standeth not aright that we should gather the harvest, whilst you, who sowed it, go forth empty-handed. Come, gentle sir, take these things I have gathered, and I will go back and find more. But Nigel smiled and shook his head. You have gained what your heart desired, and perchance I have done so also, said he. An instant later Knolls strode up to him with outstretched hand. "'I ask your pardon, Nigel,' said he. "'I have spoken too hotly in my wrath.' "'Nay, fair sir, I was at fault. If we stand here now within the castle, it is to you that I owe it. 
The king shall know of it, and Chandos also. Can I do aught else, Nigel, to prove to you the high esteem in which I hold you? The squire flushed with pleasure. Do you send a messenger home to England, fair sir, with news of these doings? Uh, surely I must do, but do not tell me, Nigel, that you would be that messenger. Ask some other favour, for indeed I cannot let you go. Now, God forbid, cried Nigel. By St. Paul, I would not be so catliff and so thrall as to leave you when some small deed might still be done. But I would fain send a message by your messenger. To whom? It is to the Lady Mary, daughter of old Sir John Butsthorn, who dwells near Guildford. But you will write the message, Nigel. Such greetings as a cavalier sends to his lady love should be under seal. Nay, he can carry my message by word of mouth. Then I shall tell him, for he goes this morning. What message, then, shall he say to the lady? He will give her my very humble greeting, and he will say to her that for the second time St. Catherine has been our friend. End of chapter 21「Chapter twenty two of Sir Nigel. This For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Clive Catterall. Sir Nigel by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Chapter twenty two. How Robert of Beaumanoir came to Plumel. Sir Robert Knowles and his men passed onward that day, looking back many a time to see the two dark columns of smoke, one thicker and one more slender, which arose from the castle and from the fort of La Brouinière. There was not an archer nor a man-at-arms who did not bear a great bundle of spoil upon his back, and Knowles frowned darkly as he looked upon them. Gladly he would have thrown it all down by the roadside, but he had tried such matters before and he knew that it was as safe to tear a half-gnawed bone from a bear as their blood won plunder from such men as these. In any case, it was but two days' march to Plumel, where he hoped to bring his journey to an end. That night they camped at Meurault, where a small English and Breton garrison held the castle. Right glad were the bowmen to see some of their own countrymen once more, and they spent the night over wine and dice, a crowd of Breton girls assisting, so that the next morning their bundles were much lighter, and most of the plunder of La Brohiniere was left with the men and women of Morel. Next day their march lay with a fair sluggish river upon their right, and a great rolling forest upon their left, which covered the whole country. At last, toward evening, the towers of Plumel rose before them, and they saw against a darkening sky the red cross of England waving in the wind. So blue was the river Duc, which skirted the road, and so green its banks, that they might indeed have been back beside their own homely streams, the Oxford Thames or the Midland Trent. But ever as the darkness deepened, there came in wild gusts the howling of wolves from the forest to remind them that they were in a land of war. So busy had men been for many years in hunting one another, that the beasts of the chase had grown to a monstrous degree until the streets of the towns were no longer safe from the wild inroads of the fierce creatures, the wolves and the bears, who swarmed around them. It was nightfall when the little army entered the outer gate of the castle of Plumel, and encamped in the broad bailey yard. Plumel was, at that time, the centre of British power in mid-Brittany, as Innebon was in the west, and it was held by a garrison of five hundred men under an old soldier, Richard of Bambro a rugged Northumbrian, trained in that great school of warriors, the Border Wars. He who had ridden the marches of the most troubled frontier in Europe, and served his time against the Liddlesdale and Nithsdale raiders, was hardened for a life in the field. Of late, however, Bambro had been unable to undertake any enterprise, for his reinforcements had failed him, and amid his following he had but three English knights and seventy men. The rest were a mixed crew of Bretons, Inulters, and a few German mercenary soldiers, brave men individually, as those of that stock have ever been, but lacking interest in the cause, and bound together by no common tie of blood or tradition. On the other hand, the surrounding castles, and especially that of Josselin, 
were held by strong forces of enthusiastic Bretons, inflamed by a common patriotism and full of warlike ardour. Robert of Beaumanoir, the fierce seneschal of the house of Rohan, pushed constant forays and excursions against Blumel, so that town and castle were both in daily dread of being surrounded and besieged. Several small parties of the English faction had been cut off and slain to a man, and so straitened were the others that it was difficult for them to gather provisions from the country round. Such was the state of Bamborough's garrison, when, on that March evening, Knolls and his men streamed into the bailey-yard of his castle. In the glare of the torches, at the inner gate, Bamborough was waiting to receive them, a dry, hard, wizened man, small and fierce, with beady black eyes and quick, furtive ways. Beside him, a strange contrast, stood his squire Crookart, a German whose name and fame as a man-at-arms were widespread, though, like Robert Knowles himself, he had begun as a humble page. He was a very tall man, with an enormous spread of shoulders and a pair of huge hands with which he could crack a horseshoe. He was slow and lethargic, save in moments of excitement, and his calm blond face, his dreamy blue eyes, and his long fair hair gave him so gentle an appearance that none save those who had seen him in his berserk mood, raging, an iron giant in the forefront of the battle, could ever guess how terrible a warrior he might be. A little knight and huge squire stood together under the arch of the donjon, and gave welcome to the newcomers, whilst a swarm of soldiers crowded round to embrace their comrades, and to lead them off where they might feed and make merry together. Bambro and Crockart were there, with Sir Hugh Calverley, an old friend of Knolls, and a fellow townsman, for both were men of Chester. Sir Hugh was a middle-sized flaxen man, with hard grey eyes and fierce, large-nosed face, sliced across with a scar of a sword-cut. There, too, were Geoffrey Dardane, a young Breton seigneur, Sir Thomas Belford, a burly, thick-set, middle-Englishman, Sir Thomas Walton, whose surcoat of scarlet martlets showed that he was of the Surrey Waltons, James Marshall and John Russell, young English squires, and the two brothers, Richard and Hugh Le Galliard, who were of Gascon blood. Besides these were several squires, unknown to fame, and of the newcomers, Sir Robert Knowles, Sir Thomas Percy, Nigel Loring, and two other squires, Allington and Parsons. These were the company who gathered in the torchlight round the table of the Seneschal of Plumel, and kept high revel with joyous hearts, because they thought that much honour and noble deeds lay before them. But one sad face there was at the board, and that belonged to him at the head of it. Sir Robert Bambro sat with his chin leaning upon his hand, and his eyes downcast upon the cloth, whilst all around him rose the merry clatter of voices, every one planning some fresh enterprise which might now be attempted. Sir Robert Knowles was for an immediate advance upon Josselin, Calverley thought that a raid might be made into the south, where the main French power lay. Others spoke of an attack upon Vannes. To all these eager opinions, Bambro listened in a moody silence, which he broke at last by a fierce execration, which drew a hushed attention from the company. "'Say no more, fair sirs,' he cried, "'for indeed your words are like so many stabs in my heart. All this and more we might indeed have done, but of a truth you are too late.' "'Too late?' cried Knowles. "'What mean you, Richard?' "'Alas, that I should have to say it. "'But you and all these fair soldiers "'might be back in England once more, "'for all the profit that I am like to have from your coming. "'Saw you a rider on a white horse, ere you reached the castle?' "'Nay, I saw him not. "'He came by the western road from Ennebon. "'Would that he had broken his neck ere he came here. "'Not an hour ago he left his message, "'and now hath ridden on to warn the garrison of Malestois.' A truce has been proclaimed for a year betwixt the French king and the English, and he who breaks it forfeits life and estate. A truce! Here was an end to all their fine dreams. They looked blankly at each other all round the table whilst Crockart brought his great fist down upon the board until the glasses rattled again. Knolls sat with clenched hands as if he were a figure of stone, while Nigel's heart turned cold and heavy within him. A truce. Where, then, was his third deed? And how might he return without it? Even as they sat in moody silence, there was the call of a bugle from somewhere out in the darkness. 
Sir Richard looked up with surprise. "'We are not wont to be summoned after, once the portcullis is up,' said he. "'Truce or no truce, we must let no man within our walls until we have proved him. Crockart, see to it.' The huge German left the room. The company were still seated in despondent silence when he returned. "'Sir Richard,' said he, "'the brave knight Robert of Beaumanoir and his squire William de Montaubon are without the gate, and would fain have speech with you.' Bambrose started in his chair. What could the fierce leader of the Bretons, a man who was red to the elbow with English blood, have to say to them? On what errand had he left his castle of Josselin to pay this visit to his deadly enemies? "'Are they armed?' he asked. "'They are unarmed.' "'Then admit them, and bring them hither, but double the guards, and take all heed against surprise.' Places were set at the farther end of the table for these most unexpected guests. Presently the door was swung open, and Crockart, with all form and courtesy, announced the two Bretons, who entered with the proud and lofty air of gallant warriors and high-bred gentlemen. Beaumanoir was a tall, dark man with raven hair and long, swarthy beard. He was strong and straight as a young oak, with fiery black eyes and no flaw in his comely features, save that his front teeth had been dashed from their sockets. His squire, William of Montabon, was also tall, with a thin hatchet face, and two small grey eyes set very close upon either side of a long, fierce nose. In Beaumanoir's expression one read only gallantry and frankness. In Montabon's there was gallantry also, but it was mixed with the cruelty and cunning of the wolf. They bowed as they entered, and the little English seneschal advanced with outstretched hand to meet them. "'Welcome, Robert, so long as you are beneath this roof,' said he. "'Perhaps the time may come, in another place, when we may speak to each other in another fashion.' "'So I hope, Richard,' said Beaumanoir. "'But indeed we of Josselin bear you in high esteem, and are much beholden to you and to your men for all that you have done for us.' We could not wish better neighbours, nor any from whom more honour is to be gained. I learn that Sir Robert Knowles and others have joined you, and we are heavy-hearted to think that the orders of our kings should debar us from attempting a venture. He and his squire sat down at the places set for them, and, filling their glasses, drank to the company. "'What you say is true, Robert,' said Bambro. "'And before you came we were discussing the matter among ourselves, and grieving that it should be so.' "'When heard you of the truce?' "'Yester evening a messenger rode from Nantes. "'Our news came to-night from Enimble. "'The king's own seal was on the order, "'so I fear that for a year at least "'you will bide at Josselin and we at Plumel, "'and kill time as we may. "'Perchance we may hunt the wolf together in the great forest, "'or fly our hawks on the banks of the Duke. "'Doubtless we shall do all this, Richard,' said Beaumanoir. But by St. Cadoc, it is in my mind that with good will upon both sides we may please ourselves and yet stand excused before our kings. Knights and squires leaned forward in their chairs, their eager eyes fixed upon him. He broke into a gap-toothed smile as he looked round at the circle, the wizened seneschal, the blond giant, Nigel's fresh young face, the grim features of Knolls and the yellow hawk-like Calverley, all burning with the same desire. "'I see that I need not doubt the good will, said he. "'And of that I was very certain before I came upon this errand. "'Bethink you, then, that this order applies to war, "'but not to challenges, spear-runnings, "'knightly exchanges, or the like. "'King Edward is too good a knight, and so is King John, "'that either of them should stand in the way of a gentleman "'who desires to advance himself, "'or to venture his body for the exaltation of his lady. "'Is this not so?' "'A murmur of eager assent rose from the table. "'If uh, you... As the garrison of Plumel march upon the garrison of Josselin, then it is very plain that we have broken the truce, and upon our heads be it. But if there be a private bickering betwixt me, for example, and this young squire, whose eyes show that he is very eager for honour, and if thereafter others on each side join in and fight upon the quarrel, it is in no sense war, but rather our own private business, which no king can alter. Indeed, Robert, said Bambro. All that you say is very good and fair. Beaumanoir leaned forward towards Nigel, his brimming glass in his hand. Your name, squire? said he. My name is Nigel Loring. 
I see that you are young and eager, so I choose you as I would fain have been chosen when I was of your age. I thank you, fair sir, said Nigel. It is great honour that one so famous as yourself should condescend to do some small deed upon me. But we must have cause for quarrel, Nigel. Now, here I drink to the ladies of Brittany, who of all ladies upon this earth are the most fair and the most virtuous, so that the least worthy amongst them is far above the best of England. What do you say to that, young sir? Nigel dipped his finger in his glass, and leaning over he placed its wet impress upon the Breton's hand. This in your face, said he. Beaumanoir swept off the red drop of moisture, and smiled his approval. It could not have been better done, said he. Why spoil my velvet pultock, as so many a hot-headed fool would have done? It is in my mind, young sir, that you will go far. And now, who follows up this quarrel? A growl ran round the table. Beaumanoir ran his eye round and shook his head. Alas, said he, there are but twenty of you here, and I have thirty of Jocelyn, who are so eager to advance themselves, that if I return without hope for all of them, there will be sore hearts amongst them. I pray you, Richard, since we have been at these pains to arrange matters, that you in turn will do what you may. Can you not find ten more men, but not of gentle blood? Nay, nay, it matters not, if they will only fight. Of that there can be no doubt, for the castle is full of archers and men-at-arms, who would gladly play a part in the matter. Then choose ten, said Beaumanoir. But for the first time the wolf-like squire opened his thin lips. Surely, my lord, you will not allow archers, said he. I fear not any man. Nay, fair sir, consider that this is a trial of weapons betwixt us where man faces man. You have seen these English archers, and you know how fast and how strong are their shafts. Bethink you that if ten of them were against us, it is likely that half of us would be down before ever we came to handstrokes. Ah, by St. Cadoc, William, I think that you are right, cried the Breton. If we are to have such a fight as will remain in the memories of men, you will bring no archers and we no crossbows. Let it be steel upon steel. How say you then? Oh, surely we can bring ten men-at-arms to make up the thirty that you desire, Robert. It is agreed, then, that we fight on no quarrel of England and France, but over this matter of the ladies in which you and Squire Loring have fallen out. And now, at the time, at once, surely at once, or perchance a second messenger may come and this also be forbidden. We will be ready with to-morrow's sunrise. Nay, a day later, cried the Breton squire. Bethink you, my lord, that the three lances of Radenac would take time to come over. They are not of our garrison, and they shall not have a place. But, fair sir, of all the lances of Brittany, nay, William, I will not have it an hour later. To-morrow it shall be, Richard. And where? Oh, I have marked a fitting place even as I rode here this evening. If you cross the river and take the bridle path through the fields which leads to Josselin, you come midway upon a mighty oak standing at the corner of a fair and level meadow. Let us meet at midday to-morrow. Agreed, cried Bambro. But I pray you not to rise, Robert. The night is still young, and the spices and hippocras will soon be served. Bide with us, I pray you, for if you would fain hear the latest songs from England, these gentlemen have doubtless brought them. To some of us, perchance, it is the last night, so we would make it a full one. But the gallant Breton shook his head. It may indeed be the last night for many, said he, and it is but right that my comrades should know it. I have no need of monk or friar, for I cannot think that harm will ever come beyond the grave to one who has borne himself as a knight should. But others have other thoughts upon these matters, and would fain have time for prayer and penitence. Adieu, fair sirs, and I drink a last glass to a happy meeting at the Midway Oak. End of chapter 22《Chapter Twenty Three of Sir Nigel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Clive Catterall. Sir Nigel, by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Chapter Twenty Three: How Thirty of Josselin Encountered Thirty of Plumel. All night the castle of Plumel rang with warlike preparations, for the smiths were hammering and filing and riveting, preparing the armour for the champions. 
In the stable-yard hostlers were testing and grooming the great war-horses, whilst in the chapel knights and squires were easing their souls at the knees of old Father Benedict. Down in the courtyard, meanwhile, the men-at-arms had been assembled, and the volunteers weeded out until the best men had been selected. Black Simon had obtained a place, and great was the joy which shone upon his grim visage. With him were chosen young Nicholas Dagsworth, a gentleman adventurer, who was nephew to the famous Sir Thomas, Walter the German, Ulbite, a huge peasant whose massive frame gave promise which his sluggish spirit failed to fulfil, John Alcock, Robin Aidy, and Raoul Provost. These, with three others, made up the required thirty. Great was the grumbling, and evil the talk amongst the archers, when it was learned that none of them were to be included, but the bow had been forbidden on either side. It is true that many of them were expert fighters, both with axe and with sword, but they were unused to carry heavy armour, and a half-armed man would have short shrift in such a hand-to-hand -hand struggle as lay before them. It was two hours after Tiers, or one hour before noon, on the fourth Wednesday of Lent, in the year of Christ 1351, that the men of Plumel rode forth from their castle gate, and crossed the bridge of the Duke. In front was Bambro, with his squire Crookart, the latter on a great rowan horse bearing the banner of Plumel, which was a black rampant lion holding a blue flag upon a field of ermine. Behind him came Robert Knowles and Nigel Loring, with an attendant at their side who carried the pennon of the black raven. Then rode Sir Thomas Percy, with his blue lion flaunting above him, and Sir Hugh Calverley, whose banner bore a silver owl, followed by the massive Belford, who carried a huge iron club, weighing sixty pounds upon his saddle-bow, and Sir Thomas Walton, the knight of Surrey. Behind them were four brave Anglo-Bretons, Perrault de Comelain, Le Gaillard, d'Aspremont, and Dardaine, who fought against their own countrymen because they were partisans of the Countess of Montfort. Her engrailed cross upon a blue field was carried at their head. In the rear were five German or Eno mercenaries, the tall Ulbite and the men-at-arms. Altogether of these combatants, twenty were of English birth, four were Breton, and six were of German blood. So with glitter of armour and flaunting of pennons, their war-horses tossing and pawing, the champions rode down to the midway oak. Behind them streamed hundreds of archers and men-at-arms, whose weapons had been wisely taken from them, lest a general battle should ensue. With them also went the townsfolk, men and women, together with wine-sellers, provisions merchants, armourers, grooms, and heralds, with surgeons to tend the wounded, and priests to shrive the dying. The path was blocked by this throng, but all over the face of the country, horsemen and footmen, gentle and simple, men and women, could be seen speeding their way to the scene of the encounter. The journey was not a long one, for presently, as they threaded their way through the fields, there appeared before them a great grey oak, which spread its gnarled leafless branches over the corner of a green and level meadow. The tree was black with the peasants who had climbed into it, and all around it was a huge throng, chattering and calling like a rookery at sunset. A storm of hooting broke out from them at the approach of the English, for Bambro was hated in the country where he raised money for the Montfort cause by putting every parish to ransom and maltreating those who refused to pay. There was little amenity in the warlike ways which had been learned upon the Scottish border. The champions rode onward without deigning to take notice of the taunts of the rabble, but the archers turned that way and soon beat the mob to silence. Then they resolved themselves into the keepers of the ground, and pressed the people back until they formed a dense line along the edge of the field, leaving the whole space clear for the warriors. The Breton champions had not yet arrived, so the English tethered their horses at one side of the ground, and then gathered round their leader. Every man had his shield slung round his neck, and had cut his spear to the length of five feet, so that it might be more manageable for fighting on foot. Besides the spear, a sword or a battle-axe hung at the side of each. They were clad from head to foot in armour, with devices upon the crests and surcoats to distinguish them from their antagonists. At present their visors were still up, and they chatted gaily with each other. "'By St. Dunstan!' cried Percy, slapping his gauntleted hands together and stamping his steel feet. "'I shall be right glad to get to work, for my blood is chilled.' "'I warrant you will be warm enough ere you get through,' said Calverley. "'Or oh, cold for ever. Candle shall burn and bell toll at Alnwick Chapel if I leave this ground alive.' 
"'But come what may, fair sirs, it should be a famous joust, "'and one which will help us forward. "'Surely each of us will have worshipfully won worship "'if we chance to come through.' "'You say truth, Thomas,' said Knowles, bracing his girdle. "'For my own part I have no joy in such encounters "'when there is warfare to be carried out, "'for it standeth not aright that a man should think "'of his own pleasure and advancement, "'rather than of the king's cause and the wheel of the army. "'But in times of truce I can think of no better way "'in which a day may be profitably spent. "'Why so silent, Nigel?' "'Indeed, fair sir, I was looking towards Jossler, "'which lies, as I understand, beyond these woods.' I see no sign of this debonair gentleman and of his following. It would indeed be grievous pity if any cause came to hold them back. Hugh Calverley laughed at the words. You need have no fear, young sir, said he. Such a spirit lies in Robert de Beaumanoir, that if he must come alone he would ride against us none the less. And I warrant that if he were on a bed of death he would be born here and die on the green field. You say truly, Hugh, said Bambro. I know him and those who ride behind him. Thirty stouter men, or more skilled in arms, are not to be found in Christendom. It is in my mind that, come what may, there will be much honour for all of us this day. Ever in my head I have a rhyme which the wife of a Welsh archer gave me when I crossed her hand with a golden bracelet after the intaking of Bergerac. She was of the old blood of Merlin, with the power of sight. Thus she said, "'Twixt the oak tree and the river, knightly fame aid brave endeavour make an honoured name for ever. Methinks I see the oak tree, and yonder is the river. Surely this should betide some good to us. The huge German squire betrayed some impatience during this speech of his leader. Though his rank was subordinate, no man present had more experience of warfare, or was more famous as a fighter than he. He now broke brusquely into the talk. We should be better employed in ordering our line, at making our plans, than in talking of the rhymes of Merlin, or such old wives' tales, said he. It is to our own strong arms and good weapons that we must trust this day. And first, I would ask you, Sir Richard, what is your will, if perchance you should fall in the midst of the fight? Bambro turned to the others. If such should be the case, fair sirs, I desire that my squire Crockart should command. There was a pause while the knights looked with some chagrin at each other. The silence was broken by Knolls. "'I will do what you say, Richard,' said he, "'though indeed it is bitter that we who are knights should serve beneath the squire. Yet it is not for us to fall out among ourselves now at this last moment. And I have ever heard that Crockart is a very worthy and valiant man. Therefore I will pledge you on jeopardy of my soul that I will accept him as leader if you fall.' "'So will I also, Richard,' said Calverley. "'And I too,' cried Belford. "'But surely I hear music, and yonder are their pennons amid the trees.' They all turned, leaning upon their short spears, and watched the advance of the men of Josselin, as their troop wound its way out from the woodlands. In front rode three heralds, with tabards of the ermine of Brittany, blowing loudly upon silver trumpets. Behind them a great man upon a white horse bore the banner of Josselin, which carries nine golden torteaux upon a scarlet field. Then came the champions, riding two and two, fifteen knights and fifteen squires, each with his pennon displayed. Behind them, on a litter, was born an aged priest, the Bishop of Rennes, carrying in his hands the viaticum and the holy oils, that he might give the last aid and comfort of the church to those who were dying. The procession was terminated by hundreds of men and women from Josselin, Gurgon, and Elion, and by the entire garrison of the fortress who came, as the English had done, without their arms. The head of this long column had reached the field before the rear were clear of the wood, but as they arrived the champions picketed their horses on the farther side, behind which their banner was planted, and the people lined up until they had enclosed the whole lists with a dense wall of spectators. With keen eyes the English party had watched the armorial blazonry of their antagonists, for those fluttering pennons and brilliant surcoats carried a language which all men could read, in front was the banner of Beaumanoir, blue with silver frets. His motto, J'aime qui m'aime, was carried on a second flag by a little page. Whose is the shield behind him, uh, silver with scarlet drops? asked Knolles. It is his squire, William of Montabon, Calverley answered. And there are the golden lion of Rochefort and the silver cross of Dubois the Strong. I would not wish to meet a better company than are before us this day. See! There are the blue rings of young Tintiniac, 
who slew my squire Hubert last Lammastide. With the aid of St. George I will avenge him ere nightfall. By the three kings of Almain, growled Crockart, we will need to fight hard this day, for never have I seen so many good soldiers gathered together. Yonder is Yves Cherouel, whom they call the Man of Iron, Carreau de Bodega, also with whom I have had more than one bickering. That is he with the three ermine circles on the scarlet shield. There, too, is left-handed Alain de Carigny. Bear in mind that his stroke comes on the side where there is no shield. "'Who is this small stout man?' asked Nigel. "'He with the black and silver shield. "'By St. Paul, he seems a very worthy person, "'and one from whom much might be gained, "'for he is nigh as broad as he is long.' "'It is Sir Robert Ragunel,' said Calverley, "'whose long spell of service in Brittany "'had made him familiar with the people. "'It is said that he can lift a horse upon his back. "'Beware a full stroke of that steel mace, "'for the armour is not made that can abide it. "'But here is the good Beaumanoir, "'and surely it is time that we came to grips.' "'The Breton leader had marshalled his men "'in a line opposite to the English, "'and now he strode forward and shook Bambro by the hand. "'By St. Cadoc, this is a very joyous meeting, Richard,' said he, "'and we have certainly hit upon a very excellent way of keeping a truce.' "'Indeed, Robert,' said Bambro, we owe you much thanks, for I can see that you have been at great pains to bring a worthy company against us this day. Surely, if all should chance to perish, there will be few noble houses in Brittany who will not mourn. Nay, we have none of the highest of Brittany, Beaumanoir answered. Neither a Blois, nor a Leon, nor a Rohan, nor a Conan fights in our ranks this day. And yet we are all men of blood and coat armour, who are ready to venture our persons for the desire of our ladies and the love of the high order of knighthood. "'And now, Richard, what is your sweet will concerning this fight?' "'That we continue until one or other can endure no longer, "'for since it is seldom that so many brave men draw together, "'it is fitting that we see as much as is possible of each other. "'Richard, your words are fair and good. "'It shall be even as you say. "'For the rest, each shall fight as pleases him best "'from the time that the herald calls the word. "'If any man from without shall break in upon us, "'he shall be hanged upon yonder oak.' With a salute he drew down his visor and returned to his own men, who were kneeling in a twinkling many-coloured group, whilst the old bishop gave them his blessing. The heralds rode round with a warning to the spectators, then they halted at the side of the two bands of men, who now stood in a long line facing each other, with fifty yards of grass between. The visors had been closed, and every man was now cased in metal from head to foot, some few glowing in brass, the greater number in shining steel. Only their fierce eyes could be seen smouldering in the dark shadow of their helmets. So for an instant they stood glaring and crouching. Then with a loud cry of, Allez! the herald dropped his upraised hand, and the two lines of men shuffled as fast as their heavy armour would permit, until they met with a sharp clang of metal in the middle of the field. There was a sound as of sixty smiths working upon their anvils. Then the babble of yells and shouts from the spectators, cheering on this party or that, rose and swelled until even the uproar of the combat was drowned in that mighty surge. So eager were the combatants to engage, that in a few moments all order had been lost, and the two bands were mixed up in one furious, scrambling, clattering throng, each man tossing hither and thither, thrown against one adversary and then against another, beaten and hustled and buffeted, with only one thought in his mind, to thrust with his spear, or to beat with his axe against any one who came within the narrow slit of vision left by his visor. But alas for Nigel, and his hopes of some great deed! His was at least the fate of the brave, for he was the first to fall. With a high heart he had placed himself in the line as nearly opposite to Beaumanoir as he could, and had made straight for the Breton leader, remembering that, in the outset, the quarrel had been so ordered that it lay between them. But ere he could reach his goal, he was caught in the swirl of his own comrades, and being the lighter man, was swept aside, and dashed into the arms of Alain de Carnet, the left-handed swordsman, with such a crash that the two rolled upon the ground together. Light-footed as a cat, Nigel had sprung up first, and was stooping over the Breton squire, when the powerful dwarf Ragunel brought his mace thudding down upon the exposed back of his helmet. With a groan, Nigel fell upon his face blood gushing from his mouth, nose, and ears. There he lay, trampled over by either party, 
while that great fight for which his fiery soul had panted was swaying back and forward above his unconscious form. But Nigel was not long unavenged. The huge iron club of Belford struck the dwarf Raguenel to the ground, while Belford in turn was felled by a sweeping blow from Beaumanoir. Sometimes a dozen were on the ground at one time, but so strong was the armour, and so deftly was the force of a blow broken by guard and shield, that the stricken men were often pulled to their feet once more by their comrades, and were able to continue the fight. Some, however, were beyond all aid. Crockart had cut at a Breton knight named Jean Rousselot, and had shorn away his shoulder-piece, exposing his neck and the upper part of his arm. Vainly he tried to cover this vulnerable surface with his shield. It was his right side, and he could not stretch it far enough across, nor could he get away on account of the press of men around him. For a time he held his foeman at bay, but that bare patch of white shoulder was a mark for every weapon, until at last a hatchet sank up to the socket in the knight's chest. Almost at the same moment a second Breton, a young squire named Geoffrey Muller, was slain by a thrust from Black Simon which found the weak spot beneath the armpit. Three other Bretons, Evan Cheruel, Caro de Bodega, and Tristan de Pestivian, the first two knights and the latter a squire, became separated from their comrades, and were beaten to the ground with English all around them, so that they had to choose between instant death and surrender. They handed their swords to Bambro, and stood apart, each of them sorely wounded, watching with hot and bitter hearts the melee which surged up and down the field. But now the combat had lasted half an hour without stint or rest, until the warriors were so exhausted with the burden of their armour, the loss of blood, the shock of blows, and their own furious exertions, that they could scarce totter or raise their weapons. There must be a pause if the combat was to have any decisive end. Cessez, cessez, retirez, cried the heralds as they spurred their horses between the exhausted men. Slowly the gallant Beaumanoir led the twenty-five men who were left to their original station where they opened their visors and threw themselves down upon the grass, panting like weary dogs, and wiping the sweat from their bloodshot eyes. A pitcher of wine of Anjou was carried round by a page, and each in turn drained a cup, save only Beaumanoir, who kept his Lent with such strictness that neither food nor drink might pass his lips before sunset. He paced slowly amongst his men, croaking forth encouragement from his parched lips, and pointing out to them that among the English there was scarce a man who was not wounded and some so sorely that they could hardly stand. If the fight so far had gone against them, there were still five hours of daylight, and much might happen before the last of them was laid upon his back. Varlets had rushed forth to draw away the two dead Bretons, and a brace of English archers had carried Nigel from the field. With his own hands Aylward had unlaced the crushed helmet, and had wept to see the bloodless and unconscious face of his young master. He still breathed, however, and stretched upon the grass by the riverside, the bowmen tended him with rude surgery, until the water upon his brow and the wind upon his face had coaxed back the life into his battered frame. He breathed with heavy gasps, and some tinge of blood crept back into his cheeks, but still he lay unconscious of the roar of the crowd, and of that great struggle which his comrades were now waging once again. The English had lain for a space, bleeding and breathless, in no better case than their rivals, save that they were still twenty-nine in number. But of this master there were not nine who were hale men, and some were so weak from loss of blood that they could scarce keep standing. Yet, when the signal was at last given to re-engage, there was not a man upon either side who did not totter to his feet and stagger forward towards his enemies. But the opening of this second phase of the combat brought one great misfortune and discouragement to the English. Bambro, like the others, had undone his visor, but with his mind full of many cares, he had neglected to make it fast again. There was an opening an inch broad betwixt it and the beaver. As the two lines met, the left-handed Breton squire, Alain de Caronet, caught sight of Bambro's face, and in an instant thrust his short spear through the opening. The English leader gave a cry of pain and fell on his knees, but staggered to his feet again, too weak to raise his shield. As he stood exposed, the Breton knight, Geoffrey Dubois the Strong, struck him such a blow with his axe that he beat in the whole breastplate with the breast behind it. Bambro fell dead upon the ground, and for a few minutes a fierce fight raged round the body. Then the English drew back, sullen and dogged, bearing Bambro with them, and the Bretons, breathing hard, gathered again in their own quarter. 
At the same instant the three prisoners picked up such weapons as were scattered upon the grass, and ran over to join their own party. "'Nay, nay!' cried Knolles, raising his visor and advancing. "'This may not be. You have been held to mercy when we might have slain you, and by the Virgin I will hold you dishonoured, all three, if you stand not back.' "'Say not so, Robert Knowles,' Evan Sherwell answered. "'Never yet has the word dishonour been breathed with my name. "'But I should count myself fainant if I did not fight beside my comrades "'when chance has made it right and proper that I should do so.' "'By St. Cadoc, he speaks truly,' croaked Beaumanoir, advancing in front of his men. "'You are well aware, Robert, that it is the law of war and the usage of chivalry "'that if the knight to whom you have surrendered is himself slain, "'the prisoners thereby become released.' There was no answer to this, and Knolles, weary and spent, returned to his comrades. "'I would that we had slain them,' said he. "'We have lost our leader, and they have gained three men by the same stroke. "'If any more lay down their arms, it is my order that you slay them forthwith,' said Crockart, whose bent sword and bloody armour showed how manfully he had borne himself in the fray. "'And now, comrades, do not be heavy-hearted because we have lost our leader. Indeed, his rhymes of Merlin have availed him little. By the three kings of Almain, I can teach you what is better than an old woman's prophecies, and that is that you should keep your shoulders together and your shields so close that none can break between them. Then you will know what is on either side of you, and you can fix your eyes upon the front. Also, if any be so weak or wounded that he must sink his hands, his comrades on right and left can bear him up. Now, advance all together in God's name, for the battle is still ours if we bear ourselves like men." In a solid line the English advanced, while the Bretons ran forward as before to meet them. The swiftest of these was a certain squire, Geoffrey Poulard, who bore a helmet which was fashioned as a cock's head, with high comb above and long pointed beak in front, pierced with the breathing holes. He thrust his sword at Calverley, but Belford, who was the next in the line, raised his giant club and struck him a crushing blow from the side. He staggered, and then, pushing forth from the crowd, he ran round and round in circles, as one whose brain is stricken, the blood dripping from the holes of his brazen beak. So for a long time he ran, the crowd laughing and cock-crowing at the sight, until at last he stumbled and fell stone dead upon his face. But the fighters had seen nothing of his fate, for desperate and unceasing was the rush of the Bretons and the steady advance of the English line. For a time it seemed as if nothing would break it, but gap-toothed Beaumanoir was a general as well as a warrior. Whilst his weary, bleeding, hard-breathing men still flung themselves upon the front of the line, he himself, with Raguenel, Tentignac, Alain de Carinet, and Dubois, rushed round the flank and attacked the English with fury from behind. There was a long and desperate melee, until once more the heralds, seeing the combatants stand gasping and unable to strike a blow, rode in and called yet another interval of truce. But in those few minutes, whilst they had been assaulted upon both sides, the losses of the English party had been heavy. The Anglo-Breton Dardane had fallen before Beaumanoir's sword, but not before he had cut deeply into his enemy's shoulder. Sir Thomas Walton, Richard of Ireland, one of the squires, and Ulbite, the big peasant, had all fallen before the mace of the dwarf Raguenel, or the swords of his companions. Some twenty men were still left standing upon either side, but all were in the last state of exhaustion, gasping, reeling, hardly capable of striking a blow. It was strange to see them as they staggered with many a lurch and stumble toward each other once more, for they moved like drunken men, and the scales of their neck armour and joints were red as fish's gills when they raised them. They left foul wet footprints behind them on the green grass as they moved forward once more to their endless contest. Beaumanoir, faint with the drain of his blood and with a tongue of leather, paused as he advanced. "'I am fainting, comrades,' he cried. "'I must drink.' "'Drink your own blood, Beaumanoir,' cried Dubois, and the weary men all croaked together in dreadful laughter. But now the English had learned from experience, and under the guidance of Crocart they fought no longer in a straight line, but in one so bent that at last it became a circle. As the Bretons still pushed and staggered against it, they thrust it back on every side, until they had turned it into the most dangerous formation of all, a solid block of men, their faces turned outward, their weapons bristling forth to meet every attack. Thus the English stood, and no assault could move them. 
they could lean against each other back to back while they waited and allowed their foemen to tire themselves out. Again and again the gallant Bretons tried to make a way through. Again and again they were beaten back by a shower of blows. Beaumanoir, his head giddy with fatigue, opened his helmet and gazed in despair at this terrible, unbreakable circle. Only too clearly he could see the inevitable result. His men were wearing themselves out. Already many of them could scarce stir hand or foot, and might be dead for any aid which they could give him in winning the fight. Soon all would be in the same plight. Then these cursed English would break their circle to swarm over his helpless men and to strike them down. Do what he might, he could see no way by which such an end might be prevented. He cast his eyes round in his agony, and there was one of his Bretons slinking away to the side of the lists. He could scarce credit his senses when he saw by the scarlet and silver that the deserter was his own well-tried squire, William of Montabon. "'William! William!' he cried. "'Surely you would not leave me!' But the other's helmet was closed, and he could hear nothing. Beaumanoir saw that he was staggering away as swiftly as he could. With a cry of bitter despair he drew into a knot as many of his braves as could still move, and together they made a last rush upon the English spears. This time he was firmly resolved, deep in his gallant soul, that he would come no foot back, but would fight his death there amongst his foemen, or carve a path into the heart of their ranks. The fire in his breast spread from man to man of his followers, and amid the crashing of blows they still locked themselves against the English shields, and drove hard for an opening in their ranks. But all was vain. Beaumanoir's head reeled. His senses were leaving him. In another minute he and his men would have been stretched senseless before this terrible circle of steel, when suddenly the whole array fell in pieces before his eyes. His enemies, Crocart, Knolls, Calverley, Belford, and all were stretched upon the ground together, their weapons dashed from their hands, and their bodies too exhausted to rise. The surviving Bretons had but strength to fall upon them, dagger in hands, and to wring from them their surrender, with the sharp points stabbing through their visors. Then victors and vanquished lay groaning and panting in one helpless and blood-smeared heap. To Beaumanoir's simple mind it had seemed that at the supreme moment the saints of Brittany had risen at their country's call. Already, as he lay gasping, his heart was pouring forth its thanks to his patron St. Cadoc. But the spectators had seen clearly enough the earthly cause of this sudden victory, and a hurricane of applause from one side, with a storm of hooting from the other showed how different was the emotion which it raised in minds which sympathised with the victors or the vanquished. William of Montauban, the cunning squire, had made his way across to the spot where the steeds were tethered, and had mounted his own great Roussin. At first it was thought that he was about to ride from the field, but the howl of execration from the Breton peasants changed suddenly to a yell of applause and delight as he turned the beast's head for the English circle and thrust his long prick-spurs into its side. Those who faced him saw this sudden and unexpected appearance. Time was when both horse and rider must have winced away from the shower of their blows. But now they were in no state to meet such a rush. They could scarce raise their arms. Their blows were too feeble to hurt this mighty creature. In a moment it had plunged through the ranks, and seven of them were on the grass. It turned and rushed through them again, leaving five others helpless beneath its hoofs. No need to do more. Already Beaumanoir and his companions were inside the circle. The prostrate men were helpless, and Josselin had won. That night a train of crestfallen archers, bearing many a prostrate figure, marched sadly into Plumel Castle. Behind them rode ten men, all weary, all wounded, and all with burning hearts against William of Montabon for the foul trick which he had served them. But over at Josselin, yellow gorse-blossoms in their helmets, the victors were borne in on the shoulders of a shouting mob, amid the fanfare of trumpets and the beating of drums. Such was the combat of the Midway Oak, where brave men met brave men, and such honour was gained that from that day he who had fought in the Battle of the Thirty was ever given the highest place and the post of honour. Nor was it easy for any man to pretend to have been there, for it has been said by that great chronicler who knew them all, that not one on either side failed to carry to his grave the marks of that stern encounter. End of chapter 23
Chapter Twenty Four of Sir Nigel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Clive Catterall. Sir Nigel by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Chapter Twenty Four. How Nigel was called to his master. My sweet lady wrote Nigel, in a script which it would take the eyes of love to read. There hath been a most noble meeting in the fourth senite of Lent, betwixt some of our own people and sundry most worthy persons of this country, which ended, by the grace of Our Lady, in so fine a joust that no man living can call to mind so fair an occasion. Much honour was gained by the Seigneur Beaumanoir, and also by an Almain named Crocart, with whom I hope to have some speech when I am hale again, for he is a most excellent person and very ready to advance himself, or to relieve another from a vow. For myself, I had hoped, with God's help, to venture that third small deed which might set me free to haste to your sweet side. But things have gone awry with me, and I early met with such a scathe, and was of so small comfort to my friends, that my heart is heavy within me, and in sooth I feel that I have lost honour rather than gained it. Here I have lain since the Feast of the Virgin, and here I am like to still be, for I can move no limb, save only my hand. But grieve not, sweet lady, for St. Catherine hath been our friend, since in so short a time I had two such ventures as the red ferret and the intaking of the reaver's fortalice. It needs but one more deed, and sickerly when I am hale once more, it will not be long ere I seek it out. Till then, if my eyes may not rest upon you, my heart at least is ever at thy feet. So he wrote from his sick-room in the castle of Plumel, late in the summer. But yet another summer had come before his crushed head had mended, and his wasted limbs had gained their strength once more. With despair he heard of the breaking of the truce, and of the fight at Moron, in which Sir Robert Knowles and Sir Walter Bentley crushed the rising power of Brittany, a fight in which many of the thirty champions of Josselin met their end. Then, when with renewed strength and high hopes in his heart, he went forth to search for the famous Crocart, who proclaimed himself ever ready night or day to meet any man with any weapon. It was only to find that in trying the paces of his new horse, the German had been cast into a ditch and had broken his neck. In the same ditch perished Nigel's last chance of soon accomplishing that deed which would free him from his vow. There was truce once more over all Christendom, and mankind was sated with war, so that only in far-off Prussia, where the Teutonic knights waged ceaseless battle with the Lithuanian heathen, could he hope to find his heart's desire. But money and high knightly fame were needed ere a man could go upon the northern crusade, and ten years were yet to pass ere Nigel should look from the battlements of Marienburg on the waters of the Frischer Haff, or should endure the torture of the hot plate when bound to the holy Woden stone of Memel. Meanwhile, he chafed his burning soul out through the long seasons of garrison life in Brittany, broken only by one visit to the chateau of the father of Raoul, when he carried to the lord of Grosbois the news of how his son had fallen like a gallant gentleman under the gateway of La Broignere. And then, then at last, when all hope was well-nigh dead in his heart, there came one glorious July morning, which brought a horseman bearing a letter to the castle of Vannes, of which Nigel was now seneschal. It contained but few words, short and clear as the call of a war-trumpet. It was Chandos who wrote. He needed his squire at his side, for his pennon was in the breeze once more. He was at Bordeaux. The prince was starting at once for Bergerac, whence he would make a great raid into France. It would not end without a battle. They had sent word of their coming, and the good French king had promised to be at great pains to receive them. Let Nigel hasten at once. If the army had left, then let him follow after with all speed. Chandos had three other squires, but would very gladly see his fourth once again, for he had heard much of him since he parted, and nothing which he might not have expected to hear of his father's son. Such was the letter which made the summer sun shine brighter, and the blue sky seem of a still fairer blue upon that happy morning in Van. It is a weary way from Van to Bordeaux. Coastwise ships are hard to find, and winds blow north when all brave hearts would fain be speeding south. 
A full month had passed from the day when Nigel received his letter before he stood upon the quayside of the Garonne amid the stacked barrels of Gascon wine and helped to lead Pommers down the gangplanks. Not Aylward himself had a worse opinion of the sea than the great yellow horse, and he whinnied with joy as he thrust his muzzle into his master's outstretched hand and stamped his ringing hoofs upon the good firm cobblestones. Beside him, slapping his tawny shoulder in encouragement, was the lean spare form of Black Simon, who had remained ever under Nigel's pennon. But Aylward, where was he? Alas! Two years before, he and the whole of Knoll's company of archers had been drafted away on the king's service to Guienne. And, since he could not write, the squire knew not whether he was alive or dead. Simon, indeed, had thrice heard of him from wandering archers, each time that he was alive and well, and newly married. But as the wife in one case was a fair maid, and in another a dark, while in the third she was a French widow, it was hard to know the truth. Already the army had been gone a month, but news of it came daily to the town, and such news as all men could read, for through the landward gates there rolled one constant stream of wagons, pouring down the Libourne Road, and bearing the booty of southern France. The town was full of foot-soldiers, for none but mounted men had been taken by the prince. With sad faces and longing eyes they watched the passing of the train of plunder-laden carts, piled high with rich furniture, silks, velvets, tapestries, carvings, and precious metals, which had been the pride of many a lordly home in fair Auvergne, or the wealthy Bourbonnais. Let no man think that in these wars England alone was face to face with France alone. There is glory and to spare without trifling with the truth. Two provinces in France, both rich and warlike, had become English through a royal marriage, and these, Guienne and Gascony, furnished many of the most valiant soldiers under the island flag. So poor a country as England could not afford to keep a great force overseas, and so must needs have lost the war with France through want of power to uphold the struggle. The feudal system enabled an army to be drawn rapidly together with small expense, but at the end of a few weeks it dispersed again as swiftly and only by a well-filled money-chest could it be held together. There was no such chest in England, and the king was forever at his wit's end how to keep his men in the field. But Guienne and Gascony were full of knights and squires who were always ready to assemble from their isolated castles for a raid into France, and these were the addition of those English cavaliers who fought for honour, and a few thousand of the formidable archers hired for fourpence a day, made an army with which a short campaign could be carried on. Such were the materials of the prince's force, some eight thousand strong, who were now riding in a great circle through southern France, leaving a broad wale of blackened and ruined country behind them. But France, even with her southwestern corner in English hands, was still a very warlike power, far richer and more populous than her rival. Single provinces were so great that they were stronger than many a kingdom. Normandy in the north, Burgundy in the east, Brittany in the west, and Languedoc in the south were each capable of fitting out a great army of their own. Therefore the brave and spirited John, watching from Paris this insolent raid into his dominions, sent messengers in hot haste to all these great feudatories, as well as to Lorraine, Picardy, Auvergne, Hinault, Vermandois, Champagne, and to the German mercenaries over his eastern border, bidding all of them to ride hard, with bloody spur, day and night, until they should gather to a head at Chartres. There a great army had assembled early in September, whilst the prince, all unconscious of its presence, sacked towns and besieged castles from Bourges to Issoudun, passing Romorotin, and so onward to Vierzon and to Tours. From week to week there were merry skirmishes at barriers, brisk assaults of fortresses in which much honour was won, nightly meetings with detached parties of Frenchmen, and occasional spear-runnings, where noble champions deigned to venture their persons. Houses, too, were to be plundered, while wine and women were in plenty. Never had either knights or archers had so pleasant and profitable an excursion, so that it was with high heart and much hope of pleasant days at Bordeaux, with their pockets full of money, that the army turned south from the Loire, and began to retrace its steps to the seaboard city. But now its pleasant and martial promenade changed suddenly to very serious work of war. As the prince moved south, he found that all supplies had been cleared away from in front of him, and that there was neither fodder for the horses nor food for the men. 
Two hundred wagons, laden with spoil, rolled at the head of the army. But the starving soldiers would soon have gladly changed it all for as many loads of bread and of meat. The light troops of the French had preceded them, and burned or destroyed everything that could be of use. Now, also, for the first time, the prince and his men became aware that a great army was moving upon the eastern side of them, streaming southward in the hope of cutting off their retreat to the sea. The sky glowed with their fires at night, and the autumn sun twinkled and gleamed from one end of the horizon to the other upon the steel caps and flashing weapons of a mighty host. Anxious to secure his plunder, and conscious that the levies of France were far superior in number to his own force, the prince redoubled his attempts to escape. But his horses were exhausted, and his starving men were hardly to be kept in order. A few more days would unfit them for battle. Therefore, when he found near the village of Maupertuis a position in which a small force might have a chance to hold its own, he gave up the attempt to outmarch his pursuers, and he turned at bay like a hunted boar, all tusks and eyes of flame. Whilst these high events had been in progress, Nigel, with Black Simon and four other men-at-arms from Bordeaux, was hastening northward to join the army. As far as Bergerac they were in a friendly land, but thence onward they rode over a blackened landscape, with many a roofless house, its two bare gable-ends sticking upward. A Knoll's mitre, as it was afterward called, when Sir Robert worked his stern will upon the country. For three days they rode northward, seeing many small parties of French in all directions, but too eager to reach the army to ease their march in search of adventures. Then, at last, after passing Lusignan, they began to come in touch with the English foragers, mounted bowmen for the most part, who were endeavouring to collect supplies either for the army or for themselves. From them Nigel learned that the prince, with Chandos ever at his side, was hastening south and might be met within a short day's march. As he still advanced, these English stragglers became more and more numerous, until at last he overtook a considerable column of archers moving in the same direction as his own party. These were men whose horses had failed them, and who had therefore been left behind on the advance, but were now hastening to be in time for the impending battle. A crowd of peasant girls accompanied them upon their march, and a whole train of laden mules were led beside them. Nigel and his little troop of men-at-arms were riding past the archers when Black Simon, with a sudden exclamation, touched his leader upon the arm. "'See yonder, fair sir,' he cried with gleaming eyes. "'There, where the wastrel walks with a great fardel upon his back. Who is he who marches behind him?' Nigel looked, and was aware of a stunted peasant, who bore upon his rounded back an enormous bundle very much larger than himself. Behind him walked a burly, broad-shouldered archer, whose stained jerkin and battered headpiece gave token of long and hard service. His bow was slung over his shoulder, and his arms were round the waists of two buxom Frenchwomen, who tripped along beside him with much laughter and many saucy answers flung back over their shoulders to a score of admirers behind them. "'Aylward!' cried Nigel, spurring forward. The archer turned his bronzed face, stared for an instant with wild eyes, and then, dropping his two ladies, who were instantly carried off by his comrades, he rushed to seize the hand which his young master held down to him. "'Now, by my hilt, Squire Nigel, this is the fairest sight of my lifetime,' he cried. "'And you, old Leatherface! Nay, Simon, I would put my arms round your dried herring of a body if I could but reach you. Here is Pommers, too, and I read in his eye that he knows me well, and is as ready to put his teeth into me as when he stood in my father's stall.' It was like a whiff of the heather-perfumed breezes of Hankley to see his homely face once more. Nigel laughed with sheer joy as he looked at him. "'It was an ill day when the King's service called you from my side,' said he. "'And by St. Paul, I am right glad to set eyes upon you once more. I see well that you are in no wise altered, but the same Aylward that I have ever known. But who is this varlet with the great bundle who waits upon your movements?' "'It is no less than a feather-bed, fair sir, which he bears upon his back, for I would fain bring it to Tilford, and yet it is over-large for me when I take my place with my fellows in the ranks.' But, indeed, this war has been a most excellent one, and I have already sent half a wagon-load of my gear back to Bordeaux to await my homecoming. Yet I have my fears when I think of all the rascal foot-soldiers who are waiting there, for some folk have no grace or honesty in their souls, and cannot keep their hands from that which belongs to another. But if I may throw my leg over yonder spare horse, I will come on with you, fair sir, for, indeed, it would be a joy to my heart to know that I was riding under your banner once again. 
So Aylward, having given instructions to the bearer of his feather-bed, rode away in spite of shrill protests from his French companions, who speedily consoled themselves with those of his comrades who seemed to have most to give. Nigel's party was soon clear of the column of archers, and riding hard in the direction of the prince's army. They passed by a narrow and winding track through the great wood of Nouay, and found before them a marshy valley down which ran a sluggish stream. Along its farther bank hundreds of horses were being watered, and beyond was a dense block of wagons. Through these the comrades passed, and then topped a small mound from which the whole strange scene lay spread before them. Down the valley the slow stream meandered with marshy meadows on either side. A mile or two lower a huge drove of horses were to be seen assembled upon the bank. They were the steeds of the French cavalry, and the blue haze of a hundred fires showed where King John's men were camping. In front of the mound upon which they stood the English line was drawn. But there were few fires, for indeed, save their horses, there was little for them to cook. Their right rested upon the river, and their array stretched across a mile of ground until the left was in touch with a tangled forest which guarded it from flank attack. In front was a long, thick hedge, and much broken ground, with a single deeply rutted country road cutting through it in the middle. Under the hedge, and along the whole front of the position, lay swarms of archers upon the grass, the greater number slumbering peacefully with sprawling limbs in the warm rays of the September sun. Behind were the quarters of the various knights, and from end to end flew the banners and pennons marked with the devices of the chivalry of England and Guienne. With a glow in his heart, Nigel saw those badges of famous captains and leaders, and knew that now, at last, he also might show his coat-armour in such noble company. There was the flag of Jean Grély, the Captal de Buch, five silver shells on a black cross, which marked the presence of the most famous soldier of Gascony, while beside it waved the red lion of the noble knight of Hino, Sir Eustace d'Ambreticourt. Those two coats Nigel knew, as did every warrior in Europe but a dense grove of pennoned lances surrounded them, bearing charges which were strange to him, from which he understood that these belonged to the Guienne division of the army. Farther down the line the famous English ensigns floated on the wind, the scarlet and gold of Warwick, the silver star of Oxford, the golden cross of Suffolk, the blue and gold of Willoughby, and the gold-fretted scarlet of Audley. In the very centre of them all was one which caused all others to pass from his mind for close to the royal banner of england crossed with the label of the prince there waved the war-torn flag with the red wedge upon the golden field which marked the quarters of the noble chandos at the sight nigel set spurs to his horse and a few minutes later had reached the spot chandos gaunt from hunger and want of sleep but with the old fire lurking in his eye was standing by the prince's tent gazing down at what could be seen of the french array and heavy with thought nigel sprang from his horse and was within touch of his master when the silken hanging of the royal tent was torn violently aside and edward rushed out he was without his armour and clad in a sober suit of black but the high dignity of his bearing and the imperious anger which flushed his face proclaimed the leader and the prince at his heels was a little white-haired ecclesiastic in a flowing gown of scarlet sendal expostulating and arguing in a torrent of words not another word my lord cardinal cried the angry prince I have listened to you over long, and by God's dignity that which you say is neither good nor fair in my ears. Hark you, John, I would have your counsel. What think you is the message which my lord Cardinal of Perigord has carried from the King of France? He says that of his clemency he will let my army pass back to Bordeaux, if we will restore to him all that we have taken, remit all ransoms, and surrender my own person with that of a hundred nobles of England and Guienne to be held as prisoners. What think you, John? Chandos smiled. "'Things are not done in that fashion,' said he. "'But, my Lord Chandos,' cried the Cardinal, "'I have made it clear to the Prince that, indeed, "'it is a scandal to all Christendom, "'and a cause of mocking to the heathen, "'that two great sons of the Church "'should turn their swords thus upon each other.' "'Then bid the King of France to keep clear of us,' said the Prince. "'Fair son, you are aware that you were in the heart of his country, "'and that it standeth not aright "'that he should suffer you to go forth as you came.' You have but a small army, three thousand bowmen and five thousand men-at-arms at the most. You seem in evil case for want of food and rest. The king has thirty thousand men at his back, of which twenty thousand are expert men-at-arms. It is fitting, therefore, that you make such terms as you may, lest worse befall. 
Give my greetings to the King of France, and tell him that England will never pay ransom for me. But it seems to me, my lord cardinal, that you have our numbers and condition very readily upon your tongue, and I would fain know how the eye of a churchman can read a line of battle so easily. I have seen that these knights of your household have walked freely to and fro within our camp, and I much fear that when I welcomed you as envoys I have in truth given my protection to spies. How say you, my lord cardinal? Fair prince, I know not how you can find it in your heart or conscience to say such evil words. There is this red-bearded nephew of thine, Robert de Duras. See where he stands yonder, counting and prying. Hark hither, young sir. I have been saying to your uncle the cardinal that it is in my mind that you and your comrades have carried news of our dispositions to the French king. How say you? The knight turned pale and sank his eyes. My lord, he murmured, it may be that I have answered some questions. And how will such answers accord with your honour, seeing that we have trusted you since you came in the train of the cardinal? Uh, my lord, it is true that I am in the train of the cardinal, and yet I am liegeman of King John and a knight of France, so I pray you to assuage your wrath against me. The prince ground his teeth, and his piercing eyes blazed upon the youth. By my father's soul, I can scarce forbear to strike you to the earth. But this I promise you, that if you show that sign of the red griffin in the field, and if you be taken alive in to-morrow's battle, your head shall most assuredly be shorn from your shoulders. Fair son, indeed you speak wildly, cried the cardinal. I pledge you my word that neither my nephew Robert nor any of my train will take part in the battle. And now I leave you, sire, and may God assoil your soul, for indeed in all this world no men stand in greater peril than you and those who are around you, and I redo that you spend the night in such ghostly exercises as may best prepare you for that which may befall. So saying, the cardinal bowed, and with his household walking behind him, set off for the spot where they had left their horses, whence they rode to the neighbouring abbey. The angry prince turned upon his heel and entered his tent once more, whilst Chandos, glancing round, held out a warm welcoming hand to Nigel. "'I have heard much of your noble deeds,' said he. "'Already your name rises as a squire errant. I stood no higher, nor so high at your age.' Nigel flushed with pride and pleasure. "'Indeed, my dear lord, it is very little that I have done. But now that I am back at your side, I hope that in truth I shall learn to bear myself in worthy fashion, for where else should I win honour if it not be under your banner?' "'Truly, Nigel, you have come at a very good time for advancement. I cannot see how we can leave this spot without a great battle which will live in men's minds for ever. In all our fights in France I cannot call to mind any in which they have been so strong, or we so weak as now, so that there will be the more honour to be gained. I would that we had two thousand more archers, but I doubt not that we shall give them much trouble ere they drive us from amidst these hedges. Have you seen the French? Nay, fair sir, I have but this moment arrived. I was about to ride forth myself, to coast their army and observe their countenance. So come with me ere the night fall, and we shall see what we can of their order and dispositions. There was a truce betwixt the two forces for the day, on account of the ill-advised and useless interposition of the Cardinal of Perigord. Hence, when Chandos and Nigel had pushed their horses through the long hedge which fronted the position, they found that many small parties of the knights of either army were riding up and down on the plain outside. The greater number of these groups were French, since it was very necessary for them to know as much as possible of the English defences, and many of their scouts had ridden up to within a hundred yards of the hedge, where they were sternly ordered back by the pickets of archers on guard. Through these scattered knots of horsemen Chandos rode, and as many of them were old antagonists it was Ha John on the one side and Ha Roll, Ha Nicholas, Ha Guichard upon the other, as they brushed past them. Only one cavalier greeted them amiss, a large, red-faced man, the Lord Clermont, who by some strange chance bore upon his surcoat a blue virgin standing amid golden sunbeams, which was the very device which Chandos had donned for the day. The fiery Frenchman dashed across their path and drew his steed back onto its haunches. "'How long is it, my Lord Chandos?' said he hotly, "'since you have taken it upon yourself to wear my arms?' Chandos smiled. "'It is surely you who have mine,' said he since this surcoat was worked for me by the good nuns of Windsor a long year ago. "'If it were not for the truce,' said Clermont, "'I would soon show you that you have no right to wear it.' "'Look for it, then, in the battle to-morrow, and I also will look for yours,' Chandos answered. "'Then we can very honourably settle the matter.' But the Frenchman was choleric and hard to appease. "'You English can invent nothing,' said he, "'and you take for your own whatever you see handsome belonging to others.' So grumbling and fuming, he rode upon his way. 
while Chandos, laughing gaily, spurred onward across the plain. The immediate front of the English line was shrouded with scattered trees and bushes, which hid the enemy. But when they had cleared these, a fair view of the great French army lay before them. In the centre of the huge camp was a long and high pavilion of red silk, with the silver lilies of the king at one end of it, and the golden oriflamme, the battle-flag of old France, at the other. Like the reeds of a pool, from side to side of the broad array, and dwindling away as far as their eyes could see, were the banners and pennons of high barons and famous knights. But above them all flew the ducal standards, which showed that the feudal muster of all the warlike provinces of France was in the field before them. With a kindling eye, Chandos looked across at the proud ensigns of Normandy, of Burgundy, of Auvergne, of Champagne, of Vemandois, and of Berry, flaunting and gleaming in the rays of the sinking sun. Riding slowly down the line, he marked with attentive gaze the camp of the crossbowmen, the muster of the German mercenaries, the numbers of the foot soldiers, the arms of every proud vassal of Vavasseur which might give some guide as to the power of each division. From wing to wing and round the flanks he went, keeping ever within crossbow shot of the army, and then, at last having noted all things in his mind, he turned his horse's head and rode slowly back, heavy with thought to the English lines. End of chapter 24Chapter twenty five of Sir Nigel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Clive Catterall. Sir Nigel by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Chapter twenty five. How the King of France held council at Maupertuis. The morning of Sunday, the 19th of September, in the year of our Lord, 1356, was cold and fine. A haze which rose from the marshy valley of Mousson covered both camps and set the starving Englishmen shivering, but it cleared slowly away as the sun rose. In the red silken pavilion of the French king, the same which had been viewed by Nigel and Chandos the evening before, a solemn mass was held by the Bishop of Chalon, who prayed for those who were about to die, with little thought in his mind that his own last hour was so near at hand. Then, when communion had been taken by the king and his four young sons, the altar was cleared away, and a great red-covered table placed lengthwise down the tent, round which John might assemble his council and determine how best he should proceed. With the silken roof, rich tapestries of arras round the walls, and eastern rugs beneath the feet, his palace could furnish no fairer chamber. King John, who sat upon the canopied dais at the upper end, was now in the sixth year of his reign, and the thirty-sixth year of his life. He was a short, burly man, ruddy-faced and deep-chested, with dark, kindly eyes, and a most noble bearing. It did not need the blue cloak sewed with silver lilies to mark him as the king. Though his reign had been short, his fame was already widespread over all Europe as a kindly gentleman and a fearless soldier, a fit leader for a chivalrous nation. His elder son, the Duke of Normandy, still hardly more than a boy, stood beside him, his hand upon the king's shoulder, and John half turned from time to time to fondle him. On the right, at the same high dais, was the king's younger brother, the Duke of Orléans, a pale, heavy-featured man with a languid manner and intolerant eyes. On the left was the Duke of Bourbon, sad-faced and absorbed, with that gentle melancholy in his eyes and bearing which comes often with a premonition of death. All these were in their armour, save only for their helmets which lay upon the board before them. Below, grouped around the long red table, was an assembly of the most famous warriors in Europe. At the end nearest the king was the veteran soldier, the Duke of Athens, son of a banished father, and now High Constable of France. On one side of him sat the red-faced and choleric Lord Clermont, with the same blue virgin in gold rays upon his surcoat, which had caused his quarrel with Chandos the night before. On the other was a noble-featured, grizzly-haired soldier, Arnold Dandregan, who shared with Clermont the honour of being Marshal of France. Next to them sat Lord James of Bourbon, a brave warrior who was afterwards slain by the White Company at Grignier, 
and beside him a little group of German noblemen, including the Earl of Salzburg and the Earl of Nassau, who had ridden over the frontier with their formidable mercenaries at the bidding of the French king. The ridged armour and the hanging nasals of their bassinets were enough in themselves to tell every soldier that they were from beyond the Rhine. At the other side of the table were a line of proud and warlike lords, Fienne, Chatillon, Nestle, de Landas, de Beaujeu, with the fierce knight-errant de Chagny, who had planned the surprise of Calais, and Eustace de Ribaumont, who had, upon the same occasion, won the prize of valour from the hands of Edward of England. Such were the chiefs to whom the king now turned for assistance and advice. "'You have already heard, my friends,' said he, "'that the Prince of Wales has made no answer to the proposal which we sent by the Lord Cardinal of Perigord. Certes, this is as it should be, and, though I have obeyed the call of Holy Church, I had no fears that so excellent a prince as Edward of England would refuse to meet us in battle. I am now of opinion that we should fall upon them at once, lest perchance the Cardinal's cross should again come betwixt our swords and our enemies. A buzz of joyful assent arose from the meeting, and even from the attendant men-at-arms who guarded the door. When it had died away, the Duke of Orléans rose in his place beside the King. Sire, said he, you speak as we would have you do, and I, for one, am of opinion that the Cardinal of Perigord has been an ill friend of France, for why should we bargain for a part, when we have but to hold out our hand in order to grasp the whole? What need is there for words? Let us spring to horse forthwith, and ride over this handful of marauders who have dared to lay waste your fair dominions. If one of them go hence, save as our prisoner, we are the more to blame." by saint denis brother said the king smiling if words could slay you would have had them upon their backs ere ever we left chartres you are new to war but when you have had experience of a stricken field or two you would know that things must be done with forethought and in order or they may go awry in our father's time we sprang to horse and spurred upon these english at crecy and elsewhere as you advise but we had little profit from it and now we are grown wiser how say you, Seigneur de Ribaumont? You have coasted their lines and observed their countenance. Would you ride down upon them, as my brother has advised, or how would you order the matter? De Ribaumont, a tall, dark-eyed, handsome man, paused ere he answered. Sire, he said at last, I have indeed ridden along their front and down their flanks in company with Lord Landas and Lord de Beaujeu, who are here at your council to witness what I say. Indeed, sire. It is in my mind that, though the English are few in numbers, yet they are in such a position amongst these hedges and vines, that you would be well advised if you were to leave them alone, for they have no food and must retreat, so that you will be able to follow them and to fight them to better advantage. A murmur of disapproval rose from the company, and the Lord Clermont, Marshal of the Army, sprang to his feet, his face red with anger. "'Eustace! Eustace!' said he. I bear in mind the days when you were of great heart and high enterprise, but since King Edward gave you yonder chaplet of pearls, you have ever been backward against the English. My Lord Clermont, said de Ribaumont sternly, it is not for me to brawl at the King's council and in the face of the enemy, but we will go further into this matter at some other time. Meanwhile, the King has asked me for my advice, and I have given it as best I might. It had been better for your honour, Sir Eustace, had you held your peace, said the Duke of Orleans. Shall we let them slip from our fingers, when we have them here, and are fourfold their number? I know not where we should dwell afterwards, for I am very sure that we should be ashamed to ride back to Paris, or to look our ladies in the eyes again. Indeed, Eustace, you have done very well to say what is in your mind, said the King. But I have already said that we shall join battle this morning, so that there is no room here for further talk. But I would fain have heard from you how it would be wisest and best that we attack them. I will advise you, sire, to the best of my power. Upon their right is a river with marshes around it, and upon their left a great wood, so that we can advance only upon the centre. Along their front is a thick hedge, and behind it I saw the green jerkins of their archers, as thick as the sedges by the river. It is broken by one road, where only four horsemen could ride abreast, which leads through the position. It is clear, then, that if we are to drive them back, we must cross the great hedge and I am very sure that the horses will not face it, with such a storm of arrows beating from behind it. Therefore, it is my counsel that we fight upon foot, as the English did at Cressy, for, indeed, 
we may find that our horses will be more hindrance than help to us this day. The same thought was in my own mind, sire, said Arnold Andregan, the veteran marshal. At Crecy the bravest had to turn their backs, for what can a man do with a horse which is mad with pain and fear? If we advance upon foot, we are our own masters, and if we stop, the shame is ours. The council is good, said the Duke of Athens, turning his shrewd, wizened face to the king. But one thing only I would add to it. The strength of these people lies in their archers, and if we could throw them into disorder, were it only for a short time, we should win the hedge, else they will shoot so strongly that we must lose many men before we reach it, for indeed we have learned that no armour will keep out their shafts when they are close. Your words, fair sir, are both good and wise, said the king, but I pray you to tell us how you would throw these archers into disorder. I would choose three hundred horsemen, sire, the best and most forward in the army. With these I would ride up the narrow road, and so turn to right and left, falling upon the archers behind the hedge. It may be that the three hundred would suffer sorely, but what are they amongst so great a host, if a road may be cleared for their companions? I would say a word to that, sire, cried the German Count of Nassau. I have come here with my comrades to venture our persons in your quarrel, but we claim the right to fight in our own fashion, and we would count it dishonour to dismount from our steeds out of fear of the arrows of the English. Therefore, with your permission, we will ride to the front, as the Duke of Athens has advised, and so clear a path for the rest of you. This may not be, cried the Lord Clermont angrily. It would be strange indeed if Frenchmen could not be found to clear a path for the army of the King of France. One would think, to hear you talk, my Lord Count, that your hardihood was greater than our own. But by Our Lady of Rocamador, you will learn before nightfall that it is not so. It is for me, who am Marshal of France, to lead these three hundred, since it is an honourable venture. And I claim the same right for the same reason, said Arnold of Andregan. The German Count struck the table with a mailed fist. Do what you like, said he, but this only I can promise you, that neither I nor any of my German riders will descend from our horses so long as they are able to carry us, for in our country it is only people of no consequence who fight upon their feet. The Lord Clermont was leaning angrily forward with some hot reply when King John intervened. Enough, enough, he said. It is for you to give your opinions and for me to tell you what to do. Lord Clermont, and you, Arnold, you will choose three hundred of the bravest cavaliers in the army, and you will endeavour to break these archers. As to you and your Germans, my Lord Nassau, you will remain on horseback, since you desire it, and you will follow the marshals and support them as best you may. The rest of the army will advance upon foot, in three other divisions, as arranged, yours, Charles, and he patted his son, the Duke of Normandy, affectionately upon the hand. Yours, Philip, he glanced at the Duke of Orléans, and the main battle, which is my own. To you, Geoffrey de Charny, I entrust the Oriflamme this day. But who is this knight, and what does he desire? A young knight, ruddy-bearded and tall, a red griffin upon his surcoat, had appeared in the opening of the tent. His flushed face and dishevelled dress showed that he had come in haste. Sire, said he, I am Robert de Duras, of the household of the Cardinal of Perigord. I have told you yesterday all that I have learned of the English camp. This morning I was again admitted to it, and I have seen their wagons moving to the rear. Sire, they are in flight for Bordeaux. For God, I knew it, cried the Duke of Orléans in a voice of fury. Whilst we have been talking they have slipped through our fingers. Did I not warn you? Be silent, Philip, said the king angrily. But you, sir, have you seen this with your own eyes? With my own eyes, sire, and I have ridden straight from their camp. King John looked at him with a stern gaze. "'I know not how it accords with your honour to carry such tidings in such fashion,' said he. "'But we cannot choose but to take advantage of it. "'Fear not, brother Philip. "'It is in my mind that you will see all that you would wish of the Englishmen before nightfall. "'Should we fall upon them whilst they cross the ford, it will be to our advantage. "'Now, fair sirs, I pray you to hasten to your posts, and to carry out all that we have agreed. "'Advance the Oriflamme, Geoffrey, and do you marshal the divisions, Arnold?' So may God and Saint-Denis have us in their holy keeping this day. The Prince of Wales stood upon that little knoll where Nigel had halted the day before. Beside him were Chandos, and a tall, sun-burned warrior of middle age, the Gascon Captal de Bouch. The three men were all attentively watching the distant French lines, 
while behind them a column of wagons wound down to the ford of the Mouisson. Close in the rear, four knights in full armor with open visors sat their horses and conversed in undertones with each other. A glance at their shields would have given their names to any soldier, for they were all men of fame who had seen much warfare. At present they were awaiting their orders, for each of them commanded the whole or part of a division of the army. The youth upon the left, dark, slim, and earnest, was William Montacute, Earl of Salisbury, only twenty-eight years of age, and yet a veteran of Crecy. How high he stood in reputation is shown by the fact that the command of the rear, the post of honour in a retreating army, had been given to him by the prince. He was talking to a grizzled, hard-faced man, somewhat over middle age, with lion features and fierce light blue eyes which gleamed as they watched the distant enemy. It was the famous Robert de Ufford, Earl of Suffolk, who had fought without a break from Cadsand onward through the whole Continental War. The other tall soldier, with the silver star gleaming upon his surcoat, was John de Vere, Earl of Oxford, and he listened to the talk of Thomas Beauchamp, a burly, jovial, ruddy nobleman and a tried soldier, who leaned forward and tapped his mailed hand upon the other's steel-clad thigh. They were old battle companions, of the same age and in the very prime of life, with equal fame and equal experience of the wars. Such was the group of famous English soldiers who sat their horses behind the prince and waited for their orders. "'I would that you had laid hands upon him,' said the prince angrily, continuing his conversation with Chandos, "'and yet perchance it was wiser to play this trick and make them think that we are retreating.' "'He has certainly carried the tidings,' said Chandos, with a smile. "'No sooner had the wagon started than I saw him gallop down the edge of the wood.' "'It was well thought of, John,' the prince remarked. "'For it would indeed be great comfort if we could turn their own spy against them. "'Unless they advance upon us, I know not how we can hold out another day, "'for there is not a loaf left in the army. "'And yet if we leave this position, where shall we hope to find such another?' "'They will stoop, fair sir, they will stoop to our lure.' Even now Robert de Duras will be telling them that the wagons are on the move, and they will hasten to overtake us lest we pass the ford. But who is this? Who rides so fast? Here, perchance, may be tidings. A horseman had spurred up to the knoll. He sprang from the saddle and sank on one knee before the prince. How now, my lord Audley? said Edward. What would you have? Sir, said the knight, still kneeling with bowed head before his leader, I have a boon to ask of you. Nay, James, rise. Let me hear what I can do. The famous knight-errant, pattern of chivalry for all time, rose and turned his swarthy face and dark, earnest eyes upon his master. Sir, said he, I have ever served most loyally my lord your father and yourself, and shall continue to do so as long as I have life. Dear sir, I must now acquaint you that formerly I made a vow that, if ever I should be in any battle under your command, that I would be foremost or die in the attempt. I beg, therefore, that you will graciously permit me to honourably quit my place among the others, that I may post myself in such wise as to accomplish my vow. The prince smiled, for it was very sure that vow or no vow, permission or no permission, Lord James Audley would still be in the van. Go, James, said he, shaking his hand, and God grant that this day you may shine in valour above all knights. But hark, John, what is that? Chandos cast up his fierce nose like the eagle which smells slaughter afar. Surely, sir, all is forming even as we had planned it. From far away there came a thunderous shout, then another, and yet another. "'See! They are moving!' cried the Captal de Boeuf. All morning they had watched the gleam of the armed squadrons who were drawn up in front of the French camp. Now, whilst a great blare of trumpets was borne to their ears, the distant masses flickered and twinkled in the sunlight. "'Yes. Yes, they are moving!' cried the Prince. "'They are moving! They are moving!' Down the line the murmur ran, and then, with a sudden impulse, the archers at the hedge sprang to their feet, and the knights behind them waved their weapons in the air, while one tremendous shout of warlike joy carried their defiance to the approaching enemy. Then there fell such a silence that the pawing of the horses or the jingle of their harness struck loud upon the ear, until, amid the hush, there rose a low, deep roar like the sound of the tide upon the beach, ever growing and deepening as the host of France drew near. End of chapter 25
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Clive Catterall. Sir Nigel by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Chapter 26 How Nigel Found His Third Deed. Four archers lay behind a clump of bushes, ten yards in front of the thick hedge which shielded their companions. Amid the long line of bowmen, those behind them were their own company, and in the main the same who were with Knolls in Brittany. The four in front were their leaders, Old Watt of Carlisle, Ned Whittington, the red-headed Dalesman, the bald bowyer Bartholomew, and Samkin Aylward, newly rejoined after a week's absence. All four were munching bread and apples, for Aylward had brought in a full haversack, and divided them freely amongst his starving comrades. The old borderer and the Yorkshireman were gaunt and hollow-eyed with privation, while the bowyer's round face had fallen in so that the skin hung in loose pouches under his eyes and beneath his jaws. Behind them, lines of haggard, wolfish men glared through the underwood, silent and watchful, save that they burst into a fierce yelp of welcome when Chandos and Nigel galloped up, sprang from their horses, and took their station beneath them. All along the green fringe of bowmen might be seen the steel-clad figures of knights and squires, who had pushed their way into the front line to share the fortune of the archers. "'I call to mind that I once shot six ends with the Kentish Waldsman at Ashford,' began the bowyer. "'Nay, nay, we have heard that story,' said old Watt impatiently. "'Shut thy clap, Bartholomew, for it is no time for readless gossip. Walk down the line, I pray you, and see if there be no frayed string, nor broken knock, nor loosened whipping to be mended.' The stout bowyer passed down the fringe of bowmen, amidst a running fire of rough wit. Here and there a bow was thrust out at him through the hedge for his professional advice. "'Wax your heads!' he kept crying. "'Pass down the wax-pot and wax your heads. A wax arrow will pass where a dry will be held. Tom Beverley, you jack-fool, where is your brazer-guard?' "'Your string will flay your arm ere you reach your upshot this day. And you, Watkin, Draw not to your mouth, as is your want, but to your shoulder. You are so used to the wine-pot that the string must needs follow it. Nay, stand loose, and give space for your drawing arms, for they will be upon us anon. He ran back and joined his comrades in the front, who had now risen to their feet. Behind them a half-mile of archers stood behind the hedge, each with his great war-bow strung, half a dozen shafts loose behind him, and eighteen more in the quiver slung across his front. With arrow on string, their feet firm planted, their fierce, eager faces peering through the branches, they awaited the coming storm. The broad flood of steel, after oozing slowly forward, had stopped about a mile from the English front. The greater part of the army had then descended from their horses, while a crowd of varlets and hostlers led them to the rear. The French formed themselves now into three great divisions, which shimmered in the sun like silvery pools reed-capped with many a thousand of banners and pennons. A space of several hundred yards divided each. At the same time, two bodies of horsemen formed themselves in front. The first consisted of three hundred men in one thick column, the second of a thousand riding in a more extended line. The prince had ridden up to the line of archers. He was in dark armour, his visor open, and his handsome aquiline face all glowing with spirit and martial fire. The bowman yelled at him, and he waved his hands to them as a huntsman cheers his hounds. "'Well, John, what think you now?' he asked. "'What would my noble father not give to be by our side this day? "'Have you seen that they have left their horses?' "'Yes, my fair lord, they have learned their lesson,' said Chandos. "'Because we have had good fortune upon our feet at Cressy and elsewhere, "'they think that they have found the trick of it. "'But it is in my mind that it is very different to stand when you are assailed, as we have done.' and to assail others when you must drag your harness for a mile and come weary to the fray. You speak wisely, John, but these horsemen who form in front and ride slowly towards us, what make you of them? Doubtless they hope to cut the strings of our bowmen, and so clear away for the others. But they are indeed a chosen band, for, mark you, fair sir, are not those the colours of Clermont upon the left, and of Dandragen upon the right, so that both marshals ride with the vanguard? "'By God's soul, John!' cried the prince. "'It is very sure that you can see more with one eye "'than any man in this army with two. "'But it is even as you say. 
and this larger band behind? They should be Germans, fair sir, by the fashion of their harness. The two bodies of horsemen had moved slowly over the plain, with a space of nearly a quarter of a mile between them. Now, having come two bowshots from the hostile line, they halted. All that they could see of the English was the long hedge, with an occasional twinkle of steel through its leafy branches, and behind that the spearheads of the men-at-arms rising from amidst the brushwood and the vines. A lovely autumn countryside, with changing, many-tinted foliage, lay stretched before them, all bathed in peaceful sunshine, and nothing, save those flickering fitful gleams, to tell of the silent and lurking enemy who barred their way. But the bold spirit of the French cavaliers rose the higher to the danger. The clamour of their war-cries filled the air, and they tossed their pennoned spears over their heads in menace and defiance. From the English line it was a noble sight. The gallant, pawing, cavetting horses, the many-coloured, twinkling riders, the swoop and wave and toss of plume and banner. Then a bugle rang forth. With a sudden yell, every spur struck deep, every lance was laid in rest, and the whole gallant squadron flew like a glittering thunderbolt for the centre of the English line. A hundred yards they had crossed, and yet another hundred, but there was no movement in front of them, and no sound save their own hoarse battle-cries and the thunder of their horses. Ever swifter and swifter they flew. From behind the hedge it was a vision of horses, white, bay, and black, their necks stretched, their nostrils distended, their bellies to the ground, whilst of the rider one could but see a shield with a plume-tufted visor above it, and a spearhead twinkling in the front. Then of a sudden the prince raised his hand and gave a cry. Chandos echoed it. It swelled down the line, and with one mighty chorus of twanging strings and hissing shafts, the long pent storm broke at last. Alas for the noble steeds! Alas for the gallant men! When the lust of battle is over, who would not grieve to see that noble squadron break into red ruin before the rain of arrows beating upon the faces and breasts of the horses? The front rank crashed down, and the others piled themselves upon the top of them, unable to check their speed, or to swerve aside from the terrible wall of their shattered comrades, which had so suddenly sprung up before them. Fifteen feet high was that blood-spurting mound of screaming, kicking horses, and writhing, struggling men. Here and there, on the flanks, a horseman cleared himself, and dashed for the hedge, only to have his steed slain under him, and to be hurled from his saddle. Of all the three hundred gallant riders, not one ever reached that fatal hedge. But now, in a long rolling wave of steel, the German battalion roared swiftly onward. They opened in the centre to pass that terrible mound of death, and then spurred swiftly in upon the archers. They were brave men, well led, and in their open lines they could avoid the clubbing together which had been the ruin of the vanguard. Yet they perished singly, even as the others had perished together. A few were slain by the arrows, the greater number had their horses killed under them, and were so shaken and shattered by the fall that they could not raise their limbs, overweighted with iron, from the spot where they lay. Three men, riding together, broke through the bushes which sheltered the leaders of the archers, cut down Whittington the Dalesman, spurred onward through the hedge, dashed over the bowmen behind it, and made for the prince. One fell with an arrow through his head, a second was beaten from his saddle by Chandos, and a third was slain by the prince's own hand. A second band broke through near the river, but were cut off by Lord Audley and his squires, so that all were slain. A single horseman, whose steed was mad with pain, an arrow in its eye and a second in its nostril, sprang over the hedge and clattered through the whole army, disappearing amid whoops and laughter into the woods behind. But none others won as far as the hedge. The whole front of the position was fringed with a litter of German wounded or dead while one great heap in the centre marked the downfall of the gallant French three hundred. Whilst these two waves of the attack had broken in front of the English position, leaving this blood-stained wreckage behind them, the main divisions had halted and made their last preparations for their own assault. They had not yet begun their advance, and the nearest was still half a mile distant, when the few survivors from the forlorn hope, their maddened horses bristling with arrows, flew past them on either flank. At the same moment the English archers and men-at-arms dashed through the hedge and dragged all who were living out of that tangled heap of shattered horses and men. It was a mad, wild rush, for in a few minutes the fight must be renewed, and yet there was a rich harvest of wealth for the lucky man who could pick a wealthy prisoner from amid the crowd. 
The nobler spirits disdained to think of ransoms while the fight was still unsettled, but a swarm of needy soldiers, Gascons and English, dragged the wounded out by the leg or the arm, and with daggers at their throats demanded their names, titles, and means. He who had made a good prize hurried him to the rear, where his own servants could guard him, while he who was disappointed too often drove the dagger home, and then rushed once more into the tangle in the hope of better luck. Clermont, with an arrow through the sky-blue virgin on his surcoat, lay dead within ten paces of the hedge. Dandragen was dragged by a penniless squire from under a horse, and became his prisoner. The Earl of Salzburg and of Nassau were both found helpless on the ground, and taken to the rear. Aylward cast his thick arms round Count Otto von Langenbeck, and laid him, helpless from a broken leg, behind his bush. Black Simon had made prize of Bernard, Count of Ventadour, and hurried him through the hedge. Everywhere there was rushing and shouting, brawling and buffeting, while amid it all a swarm of archers were seeking their shafts, plucking them from the dead and sometimes even from the wounded. Then there was a sudden cry of warning. In a moment every man was back in his place once more, and the line of the hedge was clear. It was high time, for already the first division of the French was close upon them. If the charge of the horsemen had been terrible from its rush and its fire, this steady advance of a huge phalanx of armoured footmen was even more fearsome to the spectator. They moved very slowly, on account of the weight of their armour, but their progress was the more regular and inexorable. With elbows touching, their shields slung in front, their short five-foot spears carried in their right hands, and their maces or swords ready at their belts, the deep column of men-at-arms moved onward. Again the storm of arrows beat upon them, clinking and thudding on the armour. They crouched double behind their shields as they met it. Many fell, but still the slow tide lapped onward. Yelling, they surged up to the hedge, and lined it for half a mile, struggling hard to pierce it. For five minutes the long straining ranks faced each other with fierce stab of spear on one side, and heavy beat of axe or mace upon the other. In many parts the hedge was pierced, or levelled to the ground, and the French men-at-arms were raging amongst the archers, hacking and hewing among the lightly armed men. For a moment it seemed as if the battle was on the turn. But John de Vere, Earl of Oxford, cool, wise, and crafty in war, saw and seized his chance. On the right flank a marshy meadow skirted the river. So soft was it that a heavily armed man would sink to his knees. At his order a spray of light bowmen was thrown out from the battle-line, and, forming upon the flank of the French, poured their arrows into them. At the same moment Chandos, with Audley, Nigel, Bartholomew Burgash, the Captal de Buch, and a score of other knights, sprang upon their horses, and, charging down the narrow lane, rode over the French line in front of them. Once through it, they spurred to left and right, trampling down the dismounted men-at-arms. A fearsome sight was Pommers that day, his red eyes rolling, his nostrils gaping, his tawny mane tossing, and his savage teeth gnashing in fury, as he tore and smashed and ground beneath his ramping hooves all that came before him. Fearsome, too, was the rider, ice-cool, alert, concentrated of purpose, with heart of fire and muscles of steel. A very angel of battle he seemed, as he drove his maddened horse through the thickest of the press. But, strive as he would, the tall figure of his master, upon his coal-black steed, was ever half a length before him. Already the moment of danger was past. The French line had given back. Those who had pierced the hedge had fallen like brave men amid the ranks of their foemen. The division of Warwick had hurried up from the vineyards to fill the gaps of Salisbury's battle-line. Back rolled the shining tide, slowly at first, even as it had advanced, but quicker now as the bolder fell and the weaker shredded out and shuffled with ungainly speed for a place of safety. Again there was a rush from behind the hedge, again there was a reaping of that strange crop of bearded arrows which grew so thick upon the ground, and again the wounded prisoners were seized and dragged in brutal haste to the rear. Then the line was restored, and the English, weary, panting, and shaken, awaited the next attack. But a great good fortune had come to them, so great that as they looked down the valley they could scarce credit their own senses. Behind the division of the Dauphin, which had pressed them so hard, stood a second division, hardly less numerous, led by the Duke of Orléans. The fugitives from in front, blood-smeared and bedraggled, 
blinded with sweat and with fear, rushed amidst its ranks in their flight, and in a moment, without a blow being struck, had carried them off in their wild rout. This vast array, so solid and so martial, thawed suddenly away like a snow-wreath in the sun. It was gone, and in its place thousands of shining dots scattered over the whole plain, as each man made his own way to the spot where he could find his horse and bear himself from the field. For a moment it seemed that the battle was won, and a thunder-shout of joy pealed up from the English line. But as the curtain of the Duke's division was drawn away, it was only to disclose, stretching far behind it, and spanning the valley from side to side, the magnificent array of the French king, solid, unshaken, and preparing its ranks for the attack. Its numbers were as great as those of the English army. It was unscathed by all that was past, and it had a valiant monarch to lead it to the charge. With the slow deliberation of the man who means to do or to die, its leader marshalled its ranks for the supreme effort of the day. Meanwhile, during that brief moment of exultation when the battle appeared to be won, a crowd of hot-headed young knights and squires swarmed and clamoured round the prince, beseeching that he would allow them to ride forth. "'See this insolent fellow who bears three martlets upon a field jules,' cried Sir Maurice Berkeley. "'He stands betwixt two armies as though he had no dread of us. "'I pray you, sir, that I may ride out to him, since he seems ready to attempt some small deed,' pleaded Nigel. "'Nay, fair sirs, it is an evil thing that we should break our line, seeing that we still have much to do,' said the prince. "'See, he rides away, and so the matter is settled.' Nay, fair prince, said the young knight who had spoken first, my grey horse, Le Bright, could run him down ere he could reach shelter. Never since I left Severn's side have I seen steeds so fleet as mine. Shall I not show you? In an instant he had spurred the charger and was speeding across the plain. The Frenchman, John de Hélène, a squire of Picardy, had waited with a burning heart, his soul sick at the flight of the division in which he had ridden. In the hope of doing some redeeming exploit, or of meeting his own death, he had loitered betwixt the armies, but no movement had come from the English lines. Now he had turned his horse's head to join the king's array, when the low drumming of hoofs sounded behind him, and he turned to find a horseman hard upon his heels. Each had drawn his sword, and the two armies paused to view the fight. In the first bout, Sir Maurice Barclay's lance was struck from his hand, and as he sprang down to recover it, the Frenchman ran him through the thigh dismounted from his horse, and received his surrender. As the unfortunate Englishman hobbled away at the side of his captor, a roar of laughter burst from both armies at the spectacle. "'By my ten finger-bones!' cried Aylward, chuckling from behind the remains of his bush. "'He found more on his distaff that time than he knew how to spin. Who was the knight?' "'By his arms,' said old Wat, "'he should either be a Barclay of the West or a Popham of Kent.' "'I call to mind that I shot a match of six ends once with a Kentish waldsman,' began the fat bowyer. "'Nay, nay, stint thy talk, Bartholomew,' cried old Wat. "'Here is poor Ned with his head cloven, and it would be more fitting if he were saying aves for his soul instead of all this bobbins and boasting. "'Now, now, Tom of Beverley. "'We have suffered sorely in this last bout, Wat. "'There are forty of our men upon their backs, and the Dean Foresters on the right are in worse case still. "'Talking will not mend it, Tom.' and if all but one were on their backs, he must still hold his ground. Whilst the archers were chatting, the leaders of the army were in solemn conclave just behind them. Two divisions of the French had been repulsed, and yet there was many an anxious face as the older knights looked across the plain at the unbroken array of the French king moving slowly towards them. The line of the archers was much thinned and shredded. Many knights and squires had been disabled in the long and fierce combat at the hedge. Others, exhausted by want of food, had no strength left, and was stretched panting upon the ground. Some were engaged in carrying the wounded to the rear, and laying them under the shelter of the trees, whilst others were replacing their broken swords or lances from the weapons of the slain. The Captal de Buch, brave and experienced as he was, frowned darkly, and whispered his misgivings to Chandos. But the prince's courage flamed the higher as the shadow fell while his dark eyes gleamed with the soldier's pride as he glanced round him at his weary comrades, and then at the dense masses of the king's battle, which now, with a hundred trumpets blaring and a thousand pennons waving, rolled slowly over the plain. "'Come what may, John, this has been a most noble meeting,' said he. "'They will not be ashamed of us in England. Take heart, my friends, for if we conquer, we shall carry the glory ever with us. But if we be slain, 
and we die most worshipfully and in high honour as we have ever prayed that we might die as we leave behind us our brothers and kinsmen who will assuredly avenge us it is but one more effort and all will be well warwick oxford salisbury suffolk every man to the front my banner to the front also your horses fair sirs the archers are spent and our own good lances must win the field this day advance walter and may god and st george be with england sir walter woodland riding a high black horse took station by the prince with the royal banner resting in a socket by his saddle from all sides the knights and squires crowded in upon it until they formed a great squadron containing the survivors of the battalions of warwick and salisbury as well as those of the prince four hundred men-at-arms who had been held in reserve were brought up and thickened the array but even so chandos's face was grave as he scanned it and then turned his eyes upon the masses of the frenchmen i like it not fair sir the weight is over great he whispered to the prince how would you order it john speak what is in your mind we should attempt something upon their flank whilst we hold them in front how say you jean he turned to the captal de Boeuf, whose dark resolute face reflected the same misgivings indeed john i think as you do said he the french king is a very valiant man and so are those who are about him and i know not how we may drive them back unless we can do as you advise if you will give me only a hundred men i will attempt it surely the task is mine fair sir since the thought was come from me nay john i would keep you at my side but you speak well jean and you shall do even as you have said go ask the earl of oxford for a hundred men-at-arms and as many hobblers that you may ride round the mound yonder and so fall upon them unseen let all that are left of the archers gather on each side shoot away their arrows and then fight as best they may wait till they are past yonder thorn-bush and then walter bear my banner straight against that of the king of france fair sirs may god and the thought of your ladies hold high your hearts the french monarch seeing that his footman had made no impression upon the english and also that the hedge had been well nigh leveled to the ground in the course of the combat so that it no longer presented an obstacle had ordered his followers to remount their horses and it was as a solid mass of cavalry that the chivalry of france advanced to their last supreme effort the king was in the centre of the front line geoffrey de chargny with the golden oriflamme upon his right and eustace de ribaumont with the royal lilies upon the left at his elbow was the duke of athens high constable of france and round him were the nobles of the court fiery and furious yelling their war cries as they waved their weapons over their heads six thousand gallant men of the bravest race in europe men whose very names are like blasts of a battle trumpet beaujeu and chatillon tancarville and ventadour pressed hard behind the silver lilies slowly they moved at first walking their horses that they might be fresher for the shock then they broke into a trot which was quickening into a gallop when the remains of the hedge in front of them was beaten in an instant to the ground and the broad line of the steel-clad chivalry of england swept grandly forth to the final shock with loose rein and busy spur the two lines of horsemen galloped at the top of their speed straight and hard for each other an instant later they met with a thunder crash which was heard by the burghers on the wall of poitiers seven good miles away under that frightful impact horses fell dead with broken necks and many a rider held in his saddle by the high pommel fractured his thighs with the shock here and there a pair met breast to breast the horses rearing straight upward and falling back upon their masters but for the most part the line had opened in the gallop and the cavaliers flying through the gaps buried themselves in the enemy's ranks then the flanks shredded out and the thick press in the centre loosened until there was space to swing a sword and to guide a steed for ten acres there was one wild, tumultuous swirl of tossing heads, of gleaming weapons which rose and fell, of upthrown hands, of tossing plumes, and of lifted shields, whilst the din of a thousand war-cries and the clash-clash of metal upon metal rose and swelled like the roar and beat of an ocean surge upon a rock-bound coast. Backward and forward swayed the mighty throng, now down the valley, now up, as each side in turn put forth its strength for a fresh rally locked in one long deadly grapple great england and gallant france with iron hearts and souls of fire strove and strove for mastery sir walter woodland riding hard upon his high black horse had plunged into the swelter and headed for the blue and silver banner of king john close at his heels in a solid wedge rode the prince chandos nigel lord reginald cobham audley with his four famous squires and a score of the flower of the english and gascon knighthood 
holding together and bearing down opposition by a shower of blows and by the weight of their powerful horses their progress was still very slow for ever fresh waves of french cavaliers surged up against them and broke in front only to close in again upon their rear sometimes they were swept backwards by the rush sometimes they gained a few paces sometimes they could but keep their foothold and yet from minute to minute that blue and silver flag which waved above the press grew ever a little closer a dozen furious hard-breathing french knights had broken into their ranks and clutched at sir walter woodland's banner but chandos and nigel guarded it on one side audley with his squires on the other so that no man laid his hand upon it and lived but now there was a distant crash and a roar of st george for england from behind the capital de buch had charged home st george for england yelled the main attack and ever the countercry came back from them from afar the ranks opened in front of them the french were giving way a small knight with a golden scrollwork upon his armour threw himself upon the prince and was struck dead by his mace it was the duke of athens constable of france but none had time to note it and the fight rolled on over his body looser still were the french ranks many were turning their horses for that ominous roar from the rear had shaken their resolution the little english wedge poured onward the prince chandos audley and nigel ever in the van a huge warrior in black bearing a golden banner appeared suddenly in a gap of the shredding ranks he tossed his precious burden to a squire who bore it away like a pack of hounds on the very haunch of a deer the english rushed yelling for the oriflamme but the black warrior flung himself across their path shani shani a la recousse he roared with a voice of thunder sir reginald cobham dropped before his battle-axe so did the gascon de clisson nigel was beaten down on the crupper of his horse by a sweeping blow but at the same instant chandos's quick blade passed through the frenchman's canaille and pierced his throat so died geoffrey de chani but the oriflamme was saved dazed with shock nigel still kept his saddle and pommers his yellow hide mottled with blood bore him onward with the others the french horsemen were now in full flight but one stern group of knights stood firm like a rock in a rushing torrent beating off all whether friend or foe who tried to break their ranks the oriflamme had gone and so had the blue and silver banner but here were desperate men ready to fight to the death in their ranks honour was to be reaped the prince and his following hurled themselves upon them while the rest of the english horsemen swept onward to secure the fugitives and to win their ransoms but the nobler spirits audley chandos and the others would have thought it shame to gain money whilst there was work to be done or honour to be won furious was the wild attack desperate the prolonged defence men fell from their saddles for very exhaustion nigel still at his place near chandos's elbow was hotly attacked by a short broad-shouldered warrior upon a stout white cob but pommers reared with pouring forefeet and dashed the smaller horse to the ground the falling rider clutched nigel's arm and tore him from the saddle so that the two rolled upon the grass under the stamping hoofs the english squire on the top and his shortened sword glimmering before the visor of the gasping breathless frenchman je me rends jacques Ron, he panted for a moment a vision of rich ransoms passed through nigel's brain that noble palfrey that gold-flecked armour meant fortune to the captor let others have it there was work still to be done how could he desert the prince and his noble master for the sake of a private gain could he lead a prisoner to the rear when honour beckoned him to the van he staggered to his feet seized pommers by the mane and swung himself into the saddle an instant later he was by chandos's side once more and they were bursting together through the last ranks of the gallant gallop who had fought so bravely to the end behind them was one long swathe of the dead and the wounded in front the whole wide plain was covered with the flying french and their pursuers the prince reined up his steed and opened his visor whilst his followers crowded round him with waving weapons and frenzied shouts of victory what now john cried the smiling prince wiping his streaming face with his ungauntleted hand how fares it then i am little hurt fair lord save for a crushed hand and a spear-prick in the shoulder but you sir i trust you have no scathe in truth john with you at one elbow and lord audley at the other i know not how i could come to harm but alas i fear that sir james is sorely stricken the gallant lord audley had dropped upon the ground and the blood oozed from every crevice of his battered armour his four brave squires 
Dutton of Dutton, Delves of Doddington, Fowlhurst of Crewe and Hawkstone of Wainhill, wounded and weary themselves, but with no thought save for their master, unlaced his helmet and bathed his pallid blood-stained face. He looked up at the prince with burning eyes. "'I thank you, sir, for deigning to consider so poor a knight as myself,' he said in a feeble voice. The prince dismounted and bent over him. "'I am bound to honour you very much, James,' said he, "'for by your valour this day you have won glory and renown above us all, "'and your prowess has proved you to be the bravest knight.' "'My lord,' murmured the wounded man, "'you have a right to say what you please, but I wish it were as you say.' "'James,' said the prince, "'from this time onward I shall make you a knight of my own household, "'and I settle upon you five hundred marks of yearly income "'from my own estates in England.' Sir, the knight answered, God make me worthy of the good fortune you bestow upon me. Your knight I will ever be, and the money I will divide with your leave amongst these four squires who have brought me whatever glory I have won this day. So saying, his head fell back, and he lay white and silent upon the grass. Bring water, said the prince. Let the royal leech see to him, for I had rather lose many men than the good Sir James. Ah, Chandos, what have we here? A knight lay across the path, with his helmet beaten down upon his shoulders. On his surcoat and shield were the arms of a red griffin. It is Robert de Duras, the spy, said Chandos. Well for him that he has met his end, said the angry prince. Put him on a shield, Hubert, and let four archers bear him to the monastery. Lay him at the feet of the cardinal, and say that by this sign I greet him. Place my flag on yonder high bush, Walter, and let my tent be raised there, that my friends may know where to seek me. The flight and pursuit had thundered far away, and the field was deserted, save for the numerous groups of weary horsemen who were making their way back, driving their prisoners before them. The archers were scattered over the whole plain, rifling the saddle-bags and gathering the armour of those who had fallen, or searching for their own scattered arrows. Suddenly, however, as the prince was turning toward the bush which he had chosen for his headquarters, there broke out from behind him an extraordinary uproar, and a group of knights and squires came pouring towards him, all arguing, swearing, and abusing each other in French and English at the tops of their voices. In the midst of them limped a stout little man in gold-spangled armour, who appeared to be the object of the contention, for one would drag him one way, and one another, as though they would pull him limb from limb. "'Nay, fair sirs, gently, gently, I pray you,' he pleaded. There is enough for all, and no need to treat me so rudely. But ever the hubbub broke out again, and swords gleamed as the angry disputants glared furiously at each other. The prince's eyes fell upon the small prisoner, and he staggered back with a gasp of astonishment. King John! he cried. A shout of joy rose from the warriors around him. The King of France! The King of France a prisoner! they cried in an ecstasy. Nay, nay, fair sirs, let him not hear that we rejoice. Let no word bring pain to his soul. Running forward, the prince clasped the French king by the two hands. Most welcome, sire, he cried. Indeed, it is good for us that so gallant a knight should stay with us for some short time since the chance of war has so ordered it. Bring wine there. Bring wine for the king. But John was flushed and angry. His helmet had been roughly torn off, and blood was smeared upon his cheek. His noisy captors stood around him in a circle, eyeing him hungrily like dogs who have been beaten from their quarry. There were Gascons and English, knights and squires and archers, all pushing and straining. "'I pray you, fair prince, to get rid of these rude fellows,' said King John. "'For indeed they have plagued me sorely. By Saint-Denis, my arm has been well-nigh pulled from its socket.' "'What wish you, then?' asked the prince, turning angrily upon the noisy swarm of his followers. "'We took him, fair lord. He is ours,' cried a score of voices. They closed in, all yelping together like a pack of wolves. "'It was I, fair lord. Nay, it was I. You lie, you rascal. It was I.' Again their fierce eyes glared, and their blood-stained hands sought the hilts of their weapons. "'Nay, this must be settled here and now,' said the prince. "'I crave your patience, fair and honoured sir, for a few brief minutes, since indeed much ill-will may spring from this, if it not be set at rest. Who is this tall knight who can scarce keep his hands from the king's shoulder?' It is Denis de Morbeck, my lord, a knight of St. Omer, who is in our service, being an outlaw from France. 
I call him to mind. How then, Sir Denis, what say you in this matter? He gave himself to me, fair lord. He had fallen in the press, and I came upon him and seized him. I told him that I was a knight from Artois, and he gave me his glove. See, here, I bear it in my hand. It is true, fair lord, it is true, cried a dozen French voices. Nay, sir, judge not too soon, shouted an English squire, pushing his way to the front. It was I who had him at my mercy, and he is my prisoner, for he spoke to this man only because he could tell by his tongue that he was his own countryman. I took him, and here are a score to prove it. It is true, fair lord, we saw it, and it was even so, cried a chorus of Englishmen. At all times there was growling and snapping betwixt the English and their allies of France. The prince saw how easily this might set alight to such a flame as could not readily be quenched. It must be stamped out now, ere it had time to mount. "'Fair and honoured lord,' he said to the king, "'again I pray you for a moment of patience. "'It is your word and only yours which can tell us what is just and right. "'To whom were you graciously pleased to commit your royal person?' "'The king looked up from the flagon which had been brought to him, "'and wiped his lips with the dawnings of a smile upon his ruddy face. "'It was not this Englishman,' he said, "'and a cheer burst from the Gascons. "'Nor was it this bastard Frenchman,' he added. To neither of them did I surrender. There was a hush of surprise. To whom, then, sir? asked the prince. The king looked slowly round. There was a devil of a yellow horse, said he. My poor palfrey went over like a skittlepin before the ball. Of the rider I saw nothing save that he bore red roses on a silver shield. Ah! by Saint Denis, there is the man himself, and there his thrice accursed horse his head swimming and moving as if in a dream, Nigel found himself the centre of the circle of armed and angry men. The prince laid his hand upon his shoulder. "'It is the little cock of Tilford Bridge,' said he. "'On my father's soul, I have ever said that you would win your way. Did you receive the king's surrender?' "'Nay, fair lord, I did not receive it.' "'Did you hear him give it?' "'I heard, sir, but I did not know that it was the king.' My master, Lord Chandos, had gone on, and I followed after. And left him lying. Then the surrender was not complete. And by the laws of war, the ransom goes to Denis de Morbeck, if his story be true. It is true, said the king. He was the second. Then the ransom is yours, Denis. But for my part, I swear by my father's soul that I had rather have the honour this squire has gathered than all the richest ransoms of France. At these words spoken before that circle of noble warriors, Nigel's heart gave one great throb, and he dropped upon his knee before the prince. "'Fair lord, how can I thank you?' he murmured. "'These words at least are more than any ransom.' "'Rise up,' said the smiling prince, and he smote with his sword upon his shoulder. "'England has lost a brave squire, and gained a gallant knight. Nay, linger not, I pray. Rise up, Sir Nigel.' End of chapter 26。chapter 27 of Sir Nigel。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。recording by Clive Catterall。Sir Nigel by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle Chapter 27 How the Third Messenger Came to Cosford Two months have passed, and the long slopes of Hindhead are russet with the faded ferns and the fuzzy brown pelt which wraps the chilling earth. With whoop and scream the wild November wind sweeps over the great rolling downs, tossing the branches of the Cosford beeches and rattling at the rude latticed windows. The stout old knight of Duplin, grown even a little stouter, with whiter beard to fringe an ever redder face, sits as of yore at the head of his own board. A well-heaped platter, flanked by a foaming tankard, stands before him. At his right sits the Lady Mary, her dark, plain, queenly face, marked deep with those years of weary waiting, but bearing the gentle grace and dignity which only sorrow and restraint can give. On his left is Matthew, the old priest. Long ago the golden-haired beauty had passed from Cosford to Fernhurst, where the young and beautiful Lady Edith Brockas is the belle of all Sussex, 
a sunbeam of smiles and merriment, save perhaps when her thoughts, for an instant, fly back to that dread night when she was plucked from under the very talons of the foul hawk of Shalford. The old knight looked up as a fresh gust of wind with a dash of rain beat against the window behind him. "'By St. Hubert, it is a wild night,' said he. "'I had hoped to-morrow to have a flight at a heron of the pool or a mallard at the brook. How fares it with little Catherine the peregrine, Mary?' "'I have joined the wing, father, and I have imped the feathers. But I fear it will be Christmas ere she can fly again.' "'This is a hard saying,' said Sir John, "'for indeed I have seen no bolder or better bird.' Uh, her wing was broken by a heron's beak last sabbath sennight holy father and mary has the mending of it i trust my son that you have heard mass ere you turned to worldly pleasure upon god's holy day father matthew answered tut tut said the old knight laughing shall i make confession at the head of my own table i can worship the good god amongst his own works the woods and the fields better than in yon pile of stone and wood but i call to mind a charm for a wounded hawk which was taught me by the fowler of Gaston de Foix. How did it run? Uh, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. Yes, those are the words to be said three times as he walked round the perch where the bird is mewed. The old priest shook his head. Nay, these charms are the tricks of the devil, said he. Holy Church leaves them no countenance, for they are neither good nor fair. But how is it now with your tapestry, Lady Mary? When last I was beneath this roof, you heard half done in five fair colours the story of Theseus and Ariadne. It is half done still, holy father. How is this, my daughter? Have you then so many calls? Nay, holy father, her thoughts are otherwhere, Sir John answered. She will sit an hour at a time, the needle in her hand, and her soul a hundred leagues from Cosford House. Ever since the prince's battle, good father, I beg you, nay, Mary, "'None can hear me save your own confessor, Father Matthew. "'Ever since the prince's battle, I say, "'when we heard that young Nigel had won such honour, "'she is brain-woed, and sits ever, well, even as you see her now.' "'An intent look had come into Mary's eyes. "'Her gaze was fixed upon the dark, rain-splashed window. "'It was a face carved from ivory, "'white-lipped and rigid, on which the old priest looked. "'What is it, my daughter? What do you see?' I see nothing, father. What is it, then, that disturbs you? I hear, father. What do you hear? There are horsemen on the road. The old knight laughed. So it goes on, father. What day is there that a hundred horsemen do not pass our gate, and yet every clink of hoofs sets her poor heart a-trembling? So strong and steadfast she has ever been, my Mary, and now no sound too slight to shake her to the soul. "'Nay, daughter, nay, I pray you!' She had half risen from her chair, her hands clenched, and her dark, startled eyes still fixed upon the window. "'I hear them, father. I hear them amid the wind and the rain. "'Yes, yes, they are turning. They have turned. My God, they are at our very door.' "'By St. Hubert, the girl is right!' cried old Sir John, beating his fist upon the board. "'Ho, oh, varlets! Out with you to the yard! Set the mulled wine on the blaze once more!' There are travellers at the gate, and it is no night to keep a dog waiting at our door. Hurry, Hannikin, hurry, I say, or I will haste you with my cudgel. Plainly to the ears of all men could be heard the stamping of the horses. Mary had stood up, quivering in every limb. An eager step at the threshold. The door was flung wide, and there, in the opening, stood Nigel, the rain gleaming upon his smiling face, his cheeks flushed with the beating of the wind, his blue eyes shining with tenderness and love. Something held her by the throat. The light of the torches danced up and down. But her strong spirit rose at the thought that others should see that inner holy of holies of her soul. There is a heroism of women to which no valour of man can attain. Her eyes only carried him her message as she held out her hand. "'Welcome, Nigel,' said she. He stooped and kissed it. "'St. Catherine has brought me home,' said he. A merry supper it was at Cosford Manor that night with Nigel at the head, betwixt the jovial old knight and the Lady Mary, whilst at the farther end, Sunkin Aylward, wedged between two servant maids, kept his neighbours in alternate laughter and terror as he told his tales of the French wars. Nigel had to turn his doe-skin heels and show his little golden spurs. As he spoke of what was past, Sir John clapped him on the shoulder, while Mary took his strong right hand in hers, 
and the good old priest, smiling, blessed them both. Nigel had drawn a little golden ring from his pocket, and it twinkled in the torchlight. "'Did you say that you must go on your way tomorrow, father?' he asked the priest. "'Indeed, fair son, the matter presses. "'But you may bide the morning. "'It will suffice if I start at noon. "'Much may be done in a morning.' "'He looked at Mary, who blushed and smiled. "'By St. Paul, I have waited long enough.' "'Good, good,' chuckled the old knight with wheezy laughter. "'Even so I wooed your mother, Mary. "'Wooers were brisk in the olden time. "'Tomorrow is Tuesday, and Tuesday is ever a lucky day. "'Alas, that the good dame Ermintrude is no longer with us to see it done. "'The old hound must run us down, Nigel, and I hear its bay upon my heels, "'but my heart will rejoice that before the end I may call you son. "'Give me your hand, Mary, and yours, Nigel. "'Now, take an old man's blessing. "'May God keep and guard you both, and give you your desert. "'For I believe, on my soul, that in all this broad land there dwells no nobler man, nor any woman more fitted to be his mate. There let us leave them, their hearts full of gentle joy, the golden future of hope and promise stretching out before their youthful eyes. Alas for those green spring dreamings! How often do they fade and wither until they fall and rot, a dreary sight by the wayside of life! But here, by God's blessing, it was not so, for they burgeoned and they grew, ever fairer and more noble, until the whole wide world might marvel at the beauty of it. It has been told elsewhere how, as the years passed, Nigel's name rose higher in honour, but still Mary's would keep pace with it, each helping and sustaining the other upon an ever higher path. In many lands did Nigel carve his fame, and ever as he returned, spent and weary from his work, he drank fresh strength and fire, and craving for honour from her who glorified his home. At Twynham Castle they dwelled for many years, beloved and honoured by all. Then, in the fullness of time, they came back to the Tilford Manor House, and spent their happy, healthy age amid those heather downs where Nigel had passed his first lusty youth, ere ever he turned his face to the walls. Thither also came Aylward, when he had left the Pied Merlin, where for many a year he sold ale to the men of the forest. But the years pass. The old wheel turns, and ever the thread runs out. The wise and the good, the noble and the brave, they come from darkness, and into darkness they go, whence, whither, and why, who may say. Here is the slope of Hindhead. The fern still grows russet in November. The heather still burns red in July. But where now is the manor of Cosford? Where is the old house of Tilford? Where? but for a few scattered grey stones is the mighty pile of Waverley. And yet even gnawing time has not eaten all things away. Walk with me towards Guildford, reader, upon the busy highway. Here, where the high green mound rises before us, mark yonder roofless shrine, which still stands four square to the winds. It is St. Catherine's, where Nigel and Mary plighted their faith. Below lies the winding river, and over yonder you still see the dark chantry woods, which mount up to the bare summit, on which, roofed and whole, stands that chapel of the martyr, where the comrades beat off the archers of the crooked lord of Shalford. Down yonder, on the flanks of the long chalk hills, one traces the road by which they made their journey to the wars. And now turn hither to the north, down this sunken winding path. It is all unchanged since Nigel's day. Here is the church of Compton. Pass under the aged and crumbling arch. Before the steps of that ancient altar, unrecorded and unbrassed, lies the dust of Nigel and of Mary. Near them is that of Maud, their daughter, and of Alan Edrickson, whose spouse she was. Their children and children's children are lying by their side. Here, too, near the old yew in the churchyard, is the little mound which marks where Samkin Aylward went back into that good soil from which he sprang. So lie the dead leaves, but they, and such as they, nourish forever that great old trunk of England, which still sheds forth another crop and another, each as strong and as fair as the last. The body may lie in mouldering chancel or in crumbling vault, but the rumour of noble lives, the record of valour and truth, can never die 
but lives on in the soul of the people. Our own work lies ready to our hands, and yet our strength may be the greater and our faith the firmer if we spare an hour from present toils to look back upon the women who were gentle and strong, or the men who loved honour more than life, on this green stage of England, where, for a few short years, we play our little part. End of chapter 27 End of Sir Nigel